My name is Jamie Arn, and I'm fortunate to be the chair of the Department of Psychological Sciences here at MU. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the University of Missouri Science of Addiction Symposium and to thank you all very much for participating. About a year ago, Ken Sher, Dennis McCarthy, uh, two professors in the psych department and I, started talking about the work we do in addictions, uh, the important efforts that are going on across the UM system, and then I think critically how much more we could do, we felt, if we could get a bunch of folks who do this stuff together in the same room sharing ideas. And so it is truly exciting to go from that idea uh, to the reality of today, a symposium that brings together such collective expertise, and we hope uh, offers an invitation for us to reach our collaborative potential. Uh, in terms of an overview of the program, uh, we will begin with remarks from Provost uh, Latha Ramchan and Vice Chancellor Mark McIntosh. Uh, we also feature keynote addresses by Dr. Sandra Brown from UCSD and Bob Messing from UT Austin. Uh, we have three primary sessions on drugs and society, basic translational research, and intervention and training. Sandwiched in between, we have a flash talk session, as well as opportunities for you to check out posters in the mezzanine uh, by undergraduate students and graduate students here at uh, MU. Um, so speaking of sandwiches, uh, let me touch on food and other pragmatics. We invite you uh, for lunch in the, in the McQuinn uh, atrium, just one floor above us. Elevators are located to your left as you <laughs> as you exit the auditorium. I feel like the, the flight attendant um, thing. Um, Restrooms are located to your left uh, in the lobby as well as in the upper floors of the building. And we ask that when you ask questions after the talks, we hope very much that you do, uh, that you raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. That way all, all, all can hear. And if you have any questions about continuing education credits, uh, please visit the registration table in the lobby. Um, I do want to very briefly note some appreciations, and there are a number of them, for the many folks and units that made this event possible. Uh, in particular, we'd like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences uh, for their initial and enduring support. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Bond Life Sciences Center, the School of Health Professions, the Office of Extension and Engagement, uh, the MU Office of Research, the MU Informatics Institute and College of Engineering, the Department of Psychiatry and the School of Medicine. Uh, special thanks as well to all of our speakers, um, Vice uh, Provost Ramchan, Vice Chancellors Mark McIntosh and Marshall Stewart, and, and also uh, a, a lot of appreciation for a fantastic ANS uh, Dean's Office staff. There's a number of people who have just been critical. Amanda Cook, Kim Duncan, Melody Galen, Hannah Lister, Thais Little, Tiffany Smith, Jordan Yunt, as well as the tremendous efforts of Jeffrey Reeves and Benji Bakhtin from the Life Sciences Center. And I'd also like to thank very briefly uh, the planning committee that helped put this together, uh, Dennis McCarthy, Kenny Scher, Matt Martins, and then the glue that sort of held this all together and kept the train moving along the tracks, uh, Jill Ferguson, if it wasn't for her efforts, we'd still be sort of that train idling at the station. So thank you, Jill, for all that you've done. Um, so now I'd like to introduce and welcome Dr. Latha Ramchan, MU Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, for a few remarks on addiction science throughout the University of Missouri system. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, and a hearty welcome to all of you. It's truly a pleasure to be here to welcome all of you, researchers, students, faculty, staff, our uh, keynote speakers who have come from out of state um, for this, what I consider a, a discussion on a very, very important topic. I mean, the numbers that Jamie sent me, and frankly, I wasn't aware of this, are staggering, are, are frankly um, not just compelling, they're mind-blowing, right? So if you look at the, just the impact in Missouri, one in 66 deaths related to opioid overdose. The economic losses, the economic cost that we bear as a state, 12.6 billion with a B dollars. I mean, that's, that is astounding. So just a few remarks on why I find it so compelling that we're having this discussion 
here today on this campus. So one, the, the economics of this is just mind blowing and it's a topic that is not just, uh, just confined to the mind of a researcher that no one else in the world cares about. And I say this because universities get a lot of a flack for doing things that no one else in the world understands, right? Um, the, the, the statistics are that an average publication is read by seven people uh, the researcher, the person who wrote it, his mother or her mother, and then you know a few others. And I'm not making this up. A few years ago, there was a news item that said, there's a university in the UK, we will not name them, that spent two million pounds on a research which concluded that ducks can swim. This is not such a problem, right? This is a problem that impacts all of us. So it is a problem that is not just uh, confined to ivory towers of research, but something that can create an impact. Why here? Why here on the campus of the University of Missouri? We have an amazing Department of Psychological Sciences, and I am I'm so honored that we have Professor Sher here with us, who has been building this cluster of research, as Matt explained to me this morning, that just happened because they're interested in this topic, and when good people get together, magic happens if provosts stay out of their way. So let's make more of this happen. And over a period of 10, 20 years, we've built, a, we've built a core here that can do amazing research in that area. Not just that, it's not just addiction. I look at it as this is a public health problem. And public health is something that we've embraced here at this university in a way that sometimes I think we don't even realize that. And I, coming, I still consider myself new on this campus, from the outside, it is just amazing to me to see we have plant science, animal science, vet med, school of nursing, health professions, health and environmental sciences, the school of medicine, and we have the social and behavioral sciences that can help us take the impact, the message, the behavior implications of this research, message it in a way that it sticks and share it very meaningfully, which is the third point why it makes sense to do it here, through our offices of extension, which are doing an amazing job, share that message in a way that sticks and actually makes an impact on human behavior in Missouri. And if we can get 1%, 0.1% of that $12.6 billion economic loss on the other side, we can make such a compelling case to the state for more rate dollars. So, Thank you all for being here, and I know you're going to have a, an amazingly productive day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to introduce Mark McIntosh, MU Vice Chancellor for Research, Graduate Studies, and Economic Development, and UN System Vice President for Research and Economic Development, to talk about our vision for the future of addiction science at the University of Missouri. Thank you, Jamie. So um, it's indeed very exciting to welcome you all here for this uh, very important symposium that highlights the critical work ahead of us. Uh, as a community and the state and the nation faces significant challenges with the current wave of alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, I want to thank Jamie and Jill and in fact your entire team for putting this uh, symposium together, this very important program that, hope, that we hope uh, will set the stage for how the University of Missouri uh, as a campus and as a system will contribute to the developing solutions to these challenges. So as I look through the program, uh, you will hear today um, uh, from leading experts uh, in the, at the university system and around the country um, about the persistent challenges across the state and nation, alcohol uh, addictions, um, meth methamphetamine addictions, and now the opioid and synthetic opioid crisis and as I understand, a new challenge is just right around the corner. IMU and the entire University of Missouri system can and must be a leader in helping us to provide solutions to the current addiction crisis and to mitigate the devastating health and societal effects of persistent addiction challenges and those to come. As the provost noted, this symposium is a very good first step, but it's not the only one. The University of Missouri needs to be in a position to offer the sustained research and patient care contributions that Missourians need. The chancellor had hoped 
to be here today too, but he's very fortunately uh, on his way to Stockholm to celebrate the University of Missouri's very first Nobel Prize winner, George Smith, uh, who won the prize in chemistry this year for his work back in the early 80s uh, on phage display. So we're excited that the chancellor is not here <laughs> for that particular reason. But let me say with the support of Chancellor Cartwright and Provost Ramchan, I'm pleased to announce that the University of Missouri is committed to supporting the College of Arts and Science, the School of Health Professions and Medicine, and all of your collaborators across the MU campus and the UM system, and in fact around the state and nation in the development of the Missouri Center for Addiction Research and Engagement, which we will here, here forward refer to as MoCare. So how do we envision MoCare? MoCare will establish the infrastructure and coordination networks that are cr crucial to our collaborative efforts among both researchers and providers that will make progress towards solving the grand challenges of addiction across the communities of this state. MoCare will address the growing needs of Missouri citizens affected by addictions by training treatment providers and enhancing remote access to care. And importantly, MoCare will increase the investment of state and federal funding to maximize exceptional interdisciplinary addiction research and training programs at MU and across the University of Missouri system. With MoCare, we look to foster partnerships among numerous MU colleges and units, including the College of Arts and Science, the School of Health Professions, the School of Social Work, the MU Informatics Institute, and the Department of Psychiatry in the School of Medicine, as well as MU Extension and Engagement. And if I didn't, if I didn't identify your department or college in that long list, come see Jamie and I, we're more than happy to get you involved. We see important potential to expand MoCare across the UM system, for example, by partnering with experts at the Missouri Institute of Mental Health at UMSL, and you'll hear from one of those investigators who's leading a statewide effort uh, in the uh, opioid crisis. Um, be collaborative to advance health science in the School of Pharmacy at UM Kansas City, and you will hear from uh, some uh, representatives of that potential partner as well. So as you heard from Provost Ramchan, this symposium is just the beginning for the university in focusing its interdisciplinary research capacity and creativity on providing solutions to this state and national challenge. Addiction scientists and practitioners across the, the University of Missouri have come together today in this forum to show you the foundations toward a common goal of advancing research, teaching, and engagement to address the causes and challenges of addiction and to promote health through prevention and treatment. So I thank you all for being here. I thank you all for contributing to this very important effort. Thank you, Mark. And now Dr. Kenneth Scher, Curator's Distinguished Professor of Psychological Sciences, will introduce our morning's first keynote speaker. And I want to uh, welcome everybody here as well. And uh, I can't tell you how delighted I am uh, that our symposium is uh, being led off by Professor uh, Sandra Brown, who has been a leader in the area of substance use research for uh, more than 30 years. Uh, and uh, it currently wears multiple hats. She is uh, a vice chancellor for research at UCSD, which is one of the largest public universities with uh, extensive STEM uh, curriculum and uh, medical school. And even though she came in with a lot of resources, the amount of infrastructure and innovation uh, that uh, have arisen under her leadership uh, is uh, truly impressive. And uh, it's just, uh, for me, as somebody who struggles to get his day job done, uh, in, uh, intimidating to see how somebody could be so effective as a researcher uh, and as an administrator. And I will also add, as a mentor, uh, if you look around the country at the leading uh, researchers in the area of adolescent brain development, uh, uh, neuropsychology of adolescent uh, drug-related injury, 
uh, it's uh, there was a team. In fact, uh, I pointed out at the, before the symposium today, one of her intellectual uh, granddaughters is in attendance uh, here because these folks go out, they take faculty positions at other places, and train the next generation of individuals. And it's hard to think of somebody uh, who's positioned themselves uh, better than Sandy at influencing not just the research going on today, but probably for at least a couple of generations. Uh, her research is very multifaceted, and I can't touch on any on all of them, uh, but I will highlight two major projects that are being uh, headed up uh, by Sandy. One is the uh, after the National Consortium on Alcohol and Neurodevelopment in Alcoholism, which most of us just refer to as ENCANDA. I actually have to look up what the acronym is sometime. And this is a multi-site study of alcohol use and adolescent brain development. When I say that, I think people just think, okay, they're studying the effects of alcohol on the brain. But it's all of these things are so central to many different kinds of behaviors and other kinds of environmental exposures it really sets the stage for studying adolescent development more broadly. And so often though the headline might be alcohol effects on the brain. They're really comprehensive studies of human development. And uh, she is also one of the co-leaders of uh, the ABCD project, which is the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study, uh, which is, my understanding, the largest NIH study funded of uh, adolescent development. And uh, uh, Sandy will talk more about this. Uh, it's an extraordinary undertaking with 21 sites across the country, uh, close to almost 12,000 people who are enrolled at baseline. I heard 11,800, I heard the final number. 74. In 74. Um, where, uh, uh, we're starting out looking at kids 9 to 10 years old, and again, I won't take away uh, any of the details, she will, and being following them, and we will know so much more, not just about the effect of alcohol and cannabis and other drugs on brain development, but just about adolescent development more generally in 10 years that we know now. And it's not just because of Sandy's own knowledge base, but her ability to scientifically lead groups of multidisciplinary investigators, and then motivate them and manage it so that this extraordinarily complex amount of work actually gets done. And I know when this project was being funded, there's a lot of cynicism about a project of this scale and saying this can't work. I said, well, who knows where it will wind up, but they could not have found a better group of people to shepherd this ambitious project. And uh, uh, I am highly confident personally about we will know a lot more. Uh, Sandy, uh, her undergraduate degree uh, is in uh, math and psychology. I didn't realize the math part until I looked over her via uh, at Hope College, which has actually a very strong tradition of undergraduate training in psychology. And she received her PhD at Wayne State University. And I first became aware of her work while well, I was on an internship, and it was a paper she published as a graduate student at Wayne State, which is really the seminal paper in the area of alcohol expectancies, in which uh, she and her advisor mapped out domains of how people thought about the effects of different drugs and its ideologic relevance to a variety of things. You know, uh, uh, I didn't count how many times this has been cited, but you can't really do work in this area. Uh, without citing it. And since then, uh, yeah, she took a position at uh, Northern Ill Illinois University as an assistant professor for a couple of years and moved out to San Diego where she's been in the psychiatry and the psychology uh, department, uh, worked in the VA uh, and developed clinical programs there. Uh, uh, and I did not realize not only just for substance abuse but for PTSD. <laughs> which I had not, so, you know, uh, clinical leadership, research leadership, uh, training, uh, and I'm not even touching on all of the her many contributions. And I've sometimes thought, like, you know, in professional sports, and particularly basketball, they'll sometimes talk about somebody who's a franchise player. And the franchise player is often the best person on the team, but more importantly, 
the person you could build programs around. And uh, there's only a couple of people in my discipline, which is clinical psychology, that I could think of as a franchise player. Uh, uh, Dr. Brown is one of them. And so without any further ado, uh, Professor Sandra Brown. Thank you, Tim. Those are such kind words. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure uh, to be here. And um, <clears throat> I want to thank, in particular, uh, Ken Scher, uh, Dennis McCarthy, uh, for the kind invitation. Because as you've heard from the administrative leadership at the university, there are very few areas of scientific study that could have more importance to our society than really understanding addiction. Now, I'm a, a developmentally focused clinical psychologist, worked in both clinical settings and on the basic science side. And it's really clear to me that uh, the kind of foundation that's being developed here and what we heard about MoCare uh, is going to be the bridge between basic science of, of addiction and actual clinical practice. Not just clinical practice after problems have developed, but by understanding the etiological processes and the kinds of things that are malleable uh, with regard to addiction, we can prevent, we can intervene in new and creative ways, and I think uh, there is a remarkable team here that uh, can help with that. Thank you. Uh, so with that, get my picture off the, uh, the screen. Um, uh, I uh, want to uh, thank uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the provost, uh, the vice chancellor uh, for vice president for research or I guess it's vice chancellor here and the chair for the uh, department as well uh, for those important comments about the value of this area. I, I work at this place. This is UC San Diego, University of California, San Diego. That's a picture of our iconic library. And I always thought that this was the right place for me, not necessarily because Dr. Seuss is sitting there with a the cat in the hat behind us, uh, standing behind him, but because of this developmental focus in understanding um, human behavior over time and uh, through maturity. And there is a, a whimsical a snake leading up to the library. And for about the past 20 years, this library is considered one of uh, either the first or the second most interesting archi architecture, architectural libraries in the world. And so I always feel it's uh, my good fortune to be at UC San Diego with a focus on development and appreciation for children and bringing knowledge to the world. Um, I'd like to begin just by uh, acknowledging the, the important contributions to the research I'm going to be uh, reporting here, mine and others, uh, that come from these primarily federal agencies and indicate that I have no conflict of interest in the material that I'm going to be presenting to you today. Now, um, uh, I have known Dr. Scheer for uh, quite a long period of time. In fact, I think uh, we were near our infancy, or I guess perhaps we were toddlers at the time uh, in our scientific careers when uh, we began in, in this area. And I have grown to have a great appreciation for the quality of science uh, that comes from the University of Missouri uh, in the addiction area in particular, but in general, and very importantly, the methodological rigor. Because if you're going to build a science, you have to be sure that you understand the detailed foundations that are necessary so that we can have confidence, we can uh, have replicability in the findings that come from the work that's done. And uh, as Dr. Scher mentioned, I've mentored a few. Uh, and uh, I feel I've had the good fortune also uh, to, uh, at a slightly later stage, maybe in our adolescence of uh, science, uh, uh, developed uh, a good relationship with Dennis McCarthy. 
And I think this uh, motorcycle scene was taken from when he was doing a postdoc with me out in California uh, and reflects his um, uh, generous spirit. Now, with that said, I'm going to talk today a little bit about adolescent development and addiction, provide a brief uh, historical perspective, some discussion about what are the characteristic changes that unfold uh, during adolescence and uh, what is the normal uh, brain development during that period of time and how alcohol and drugs may impact uh, that and how brain development influences alcohol and drug perspective or engagement. And then finally, where uh, addiction science is going from here. Um, I'll save some time for questions at the end uh, and uh, hope that you, in fact, have many because I know this will be a relatively brief um, overview. So uh, adolescence as a distinctive developmental period is really new in our history. Uh, and in the pre-industrial era, era, there really was no such thing as adolescence. You were a child. And then there was uh, some type of formal transition uh, that you moved directly into adult responsibilities. The work that you did, developing a family, that type of thing. Uh, and uh, so before uh, the industrial era, we didn't really talk about adolescence. And we didn't think about adolescence, either from a developmental perspective, certainly from a brain developmental perspective. But with the emergence of uh, the industrialization of the late 19th century, um, we lost some of those adult initiation rights. Uh, there was an a, attention to the importance of extension in schooling. And there became a blend between child responsibilities or child behaviors and adult uh, responsibilities. And I think today that we have an extension even of this. In the social media era uh, and this digital uh, technology era, we were just talking about tweeting before this, you know, uh, uh, that uh, across industrialized uh, countries, we now see an extension of adolescence uh, into what we consider emerging adulthood. Uh, the, it, Arnett, who pioneered that, that notion of emerging adulthood, really helps us think now about this transition, later adolescent transition phase, um, uh, after which we would expect full adult responsibilities and roles to extend at least out to age 25. The interesting thing for me is that that period demarcates a remarkable reduction in, a, in an array of behaviors that we think about as adolescent-specific behaviors, and also brain maturation. So uh, what really is adolescence? It is the one period in life that's demarcated by a biological onset, that is puberty, but a behavioral offset. And so you can see why I'm saying that it is the full adoption of adult responsibilities that help us know when adolescence is at an end. And if we look across species, what we see is a remarkable increase uh, post-puberty of uh, risk-taking behaviors, exploratory behaviors, increased social drives, affiliative needs, and advances in uh, cognitive maturity. And in humans, at least, we also see uh, more salience in affect and greater lability. So we see this all across species. And it has a, it has a real functional component to it. If we didn't have those exploratory behaviors, my children would still be living at home, and they wouldn't be having partners living on their own independently. So these, these have very functional um, uh, components to them. So it's interesting to me that part of uh, the uh, risk-taking and exploratory behavior um, is mani it manifests in a variety of different ways, uh, one of which is substance engagement. And we know that alcohol is the preferred uh, drug for youth. And I'll be honest with you, that's been a focus of mine in particular because it's legal. And twice as many uh, youth use alcohol as any other substance. But if we look at um, uh, the patterns of onset of substance engagement, for example, 
you'll see that when you look at ages 12 to 13, it's a very small proportion that have used uh, uh, substances in the past month. But by the time they're 18 or 20, and then this 21 to 25, you see that those are the highest periods of uh, uh, prevalence for substance engagement. Now, youth don't use substances, in particular alcohol, in the same way that people post-25 do. In fact, if we look at alcohol, we'll see that um, youth use, on average, those, those who are uh, drinkers, uh, they use, on average, uh, four or five times per month, uh, compared to eight to nine times per month for adults, once or, once or twice a week for adults in the United States, on average. So youth use half as often. But when they drink, they drink not the average two and a half drinks of adults. They drink close to five drinks. They drink twice as much as adults do every time they drink. And so the topography of consumption is different. And it may be that the impact of the higher doses uh, is different. So uh, we know, we heard uh, some of the statistics, that we have nearly 11 million uh, drinkers that are where alcohol is not yet even legal uh, for their age group, that is 12 to 20 in the United States. Uh, 7.2 uh, million of them uh, are bingers, that is, uh, have heavy episodic episodes, uh, drink five or more drinks per occasion, and uh, about 2.5 million. Uh, do that multiple times per month. Well, does it really matter? Uh, one way it might matter is if uh, there are other important things going on during this period of time that uh, where the high dose of consumption or use of multiple substances simultaneously could adversely impact development. And we know from work uh, that uh, comes now uh, uh, 10 to 15 years ago um, by Jay Geed and others at NIH that the structure and functioning of the brain changes with age and they demonstrated out to the uh, mid-20s where uh, the maturation uh, sequence is such that um, the structures that underlie coordination and affect are the ones that develop first. I kind of think of that as the, the gas if I'm driving a car. And it's the planning, uh, long-range evaluation of consequences, the executive functionings that develop more slowly, including inhibition. That's, that's the breaks. And so we, over the course of adolescence, have them putting on the gas before we uh, put up, uh, know how to use the breaks. And there are a variety of different things that unfold that we now know based on new medical technologies of imaging that help us understand what are some of the changes that are occurring over the course of adolescence. Some expansion of the cerebral cortex in particular, maturation of subcortical structures, particularly those that have higher densities of uh, sex steroid receptors. There's a reduction in gray matter with age and an increase of white matter volume. And um, most of those projects have, have been demonstrated, just cross-sectional studies of age. And what Ken was referring to is that in our Encanda Center, um, we've now demonstrated that within individuals, each of these is an, is an individual, it shows uh, the changes for those individuals uh, uh, over three points in time. The blue are, are the boys and the red are the girls. And you can see there's a reduction in frontal gray matter the part of the brain that's sort of the last to develop, and an increase in uh, white matter structures in the brain and actually coherence of that, that white matter structure. So those are the, the pathways, the neural pathways, that link different regions of the brain and result in better and more efficient processing. Additionally, uh, uh, we know that we lose an awful lot of neural connections that, as parents, we work on developing with our children, helping them learn how to structure things, how to, how to organize things for themselves. By some estimates, almost 50% of the neural connections are lost um, early on. 
or uh, over the course of adolescence, and it's related to dendritic pruning and some re regional response changes where we move from global processing to regional processing, and it's important to have those neural tracks to, to make more efficient the connections between these regions. And we do that, uh, or uh, developmentally that happens uh, through myelination, which speeds that, uh, the linkages down the neural axon. <clears throat> so those are things that, that we know happen just when we look at uh, age, uh, samples of ages. And, uh, but we can't really know for sure what's going on in the brain, or at least we couldn't uh, previously, without animal studies. And these experimental studies, and particularly studies that then also include post-mortem evaluations, have shown us some very important differences, and I think an important take-home mes message here. And that is that compared to adult consumption, alcohol, and this is true for a number of other substances as well, the adolescent brain is more vulnerable and more impacted by exposure to alcohol. Compared to adults, youth are less sensitive to the sedative effects of alcohol across species. They're more sensitive to the disruption of memory, impairment in neurotransmission, particularly in the hippocampus where new memories form, and more sensitive to social facilitation. Um, we also know that high doses, what we would consider binges, produce long-lasting memory effects, actual damage, tissue damage to the frontal and anterior cortical regions, and slows or retards neuronal repair. Very important. Slows or retards neuronal impair, uh, uh, repair. And then finally, that prolonged exposure um, enhances withdrawal and produces some long-term, what look like, at least in animals, permanent changes. So we don't do post-mortems on adolescents, although I've known a few adolescents in which I wouldn't mind uh, doing that. Uh, uh, this work uh, comes uh, from Linda Spear at SUNY uh, Buffalo, George Koob, who's currently the director at NIAAA and was uh, formerly just up the street from me at the Scripps Research Institute, and Fulton Cruz, who has a a large center that is focused on translational research, trying to create animal models of what were uh, some of the concerns that we have with humans. Um, uh, so although we haven't done that, new technology, uh, we can't do postmortems. new technologies help us look at how alcohol and other drugs might affect teen brains. Uh, this slide shows that uh, for drinkers, those are people who are in the red, Compared to controls, non-drinking adolescents, and these folks are in their mid-teens, that we see a, a greater uh, reduction in uh, certain regions of the brain uh, over time uh, for the drinkers than the non-drinkers. That is, more gray matter reduction if you look for each individual. And then... Um, we also see less acceleration in areas that we would like to see in white matter development. So what we knew cross-sectionally, now we've been able to demonstrate within the individual, exposure to alcohol, heavy exposure to alcohol uh, can uh, alter the way the brain develops. Hence, the importance of the call for focus on research in this area to help us not just understand how it affects development, but to improve the quality of life of citizens in the United States. And I will just mention as an aside, uh, alcohol is involved for adolescents in the top three causes of death. Accidents, number one for adolescents. Remember I said that risk-taking behavior? But suicide and homicide are the other, are the other two top three causes for death for adolescents, and alcohol is involved in, in um, a, a substantial proportion of these. A long time ago, we looked at, at youth who had long histories of alcohol engagement and uh, drug involvement as well, and we found that even after three or four weeks of abstinence, that while uh, uh, youth who were alcohol, had a history of alcohol dependence, could learn as much in the short run both in verbal kinds of things, like the types of things that, that teens learn in school in a, um, 
language arts class, in a writing class, in a um, foreign language class, social studies, anything like that. Or uh, in nonverbal uh, information, uh, visual spatial kinds of information, like in math or in physics or in other areas of science, that while they could learn as much at, uh, uh, as non-drinking <coughs> teens, uh, even after three, uh, at three, month, three or four weeks of abstinence, when we tested them just 20 minutes later, they were called 10% less. And these are folks who are matched by gender, age, grade, socioeconomic status, family history of alcohol and drug problems drawn from exactly the same communities, had the same grades at the beginning. So what does that mean if they're in the classroom and they're, uh, the teacher is working with them, even if they're clean and sober? That 20 minutes later, if you give them a pop quiz, they're going to do a grade lower, on average. They're not going to get an A, they're going to get a B, or they're not going to get a B, they're going to get a C, or they're going to fail. And so you can see how this can influence youth's perceptions of their own abilities in just a short period of time, even when they're clean and sober. We followed youth over long periods of time, these uh, community youth and youth who had a history of uh, alcohol and drug problems severe enough to get into treatment. And, and uh, whoop, let me go back here. How did I get there? And uh, just point out that if they stay clean and sober, in the end, they end up looking like uh, non-drinkers or non-problematic youth. Um, if they, they use heavily, even though their, their uh, cognitive scores or memory scores are about the same at the beginning, they quickly deteriorate. And those who have intermittent courses with other drug involvement show uh, diminished performance over this 10-year period of time. But what I want to highlight here is this solid, heavy black line right here. That line is bad as the, those who are out drug users uh, and below those who are abstainers. These are teens who resolve into drinking. Drinking alone. What's the take-home message? That drinking alone can have long-term neurocognitive impacts. In this case, this is uh, a measure of free recall uh, on the CVLT. It's, it's a memory uh, test. Now, that was with folks who had long histories of uh, alcohol and drug problems. We've looked at teens who uh, are in school, are functional, don't meet criteria for alcohol and drug problems, but who, whoop, sorry, uh, but who have uh, multiple binges in the prior month. And what we see with them is that compared to non-users uh, who are again matched and we follow over the same period of time, that it takes about three weeks for them to, to uh, return to their um, uh, learning and memory skills, comparable learning and memory skills, in about the same period of time for visual spatial problem solving. So verbal and nonverbal skills are practically impacted. These are kids who are in school. Binging alone is associated with this. Now, if they, if they weren't comparable at these periods of time, we would say, well, you know, they're just not as good. They don't have the same intellectual abilities, cognitive abilities. But we see that that's not the case that even binging alone can produce these differences. So um, with new technologies uh, and by integrating across disciplines, we're now able, uh, uh, in part through the uh, National Brain Initiative, to link basic biological measure measurements with behavioral systems and ultimately clinical services. And it was part of this brain initiative that uh, frankly led to the development of the National Consortium on Alcohol and Neurodevelopment in Adolescents. And I, I want to uh, highlight this little circled guy here, who I think was talking at the time. Um, Ken is the um, uh, chair for our Scientific Advisory Board, critical to the development of uh, and progression of NCANDA, as we refer to it. Uh, while we coordinated in, in San Diego, uh, along with my colleague and former student, uh, Susan Tapert, 
uh, the data analytics core occurs up at Stanford and the um, SRI. And we have sites around the country and advisors uh, around the country for this project. This project was important for several reasons. Uh, it demonstrated for the first time that agencies could work together to fund something important, kind of like you're talking about here uh, going forward in um, Missouri. And the focus really was on adolescent neurodevelopment. You know, looking at it from an individual perspective, uh, we have an accelerated longitudinal design that helps us piece together information from youth who are 12 to 21 at the beginning, goes all the way up. We're going to be following them for 10 years. Um, and we're not just looking at what, what's the impact of alcohol, but what are all the other factors in development that are associated with either greater impact or lesser impact, and how does development influence use? Also, mental health problems, other risk and protective factors, with a real focus on what are the implications for education? What are the implications for prevention? And what are the implications for intervention? We've been able to successfully follow this uh, sample that's a school-based and community sample from around the United States. And we look at a whole variety of different things, um, health and mental health problems, a lot about community characteristics, because we think that relates to availability, access, and influence and development of those expectancies that we heard about before. But we're also looking at important developmental things like um, how, how these youth are doing with the emerging roles of adulthood. Uh, how does alcohol influence sleep? What about trauma and stress? We know there's a lot of comorbidity there. Uh, and importantly, neurocognitive recovery. That's really critical, I think. Uh, we cover a lot of the standard neurocognitive domains. We're also doing some other things that I think are particularly cool. We're just through getting saliva samples. We're able to look at some genetic and epigenetic uh, data. Uh, we're getting pubertal horm hormones as well to help us uh, understand the use of alcohol in relationship to those neurohormones. And uh, studying in detail with, with smaller groups but at multiple sites, things like sleep, um, uh, what the re neurocognitive recovery processes are like. And through handheld devices, uh, getting actual measurements uh, of teens in their natural environment, their self-reports within like 30 to, to 90 seconds of how much they've been using, who they're with, what they're doing. And we uh, get some um, inobtrusive measures through Fitbit, uh, heart rate, uh, sleep, uh, wake activity and their and regular activities, and we're developing some alcohol sensors that are uh, bio nano engineered patches where you can just measure how much alcohol they have in their system. We don't even have to ask them. That's my that's my long term goal here. So uh, that's just a sample of the um, uh, uh, app that we have. Now remember, I said that we've got a reduction in gray matter and uh, an increase in white matter over the course of adolescence. And what we've been able to show now through these kinds of studies is that there are greater gray matter reductions and, uh, um, uh, excuse me, slower gray matter reductions um, and um, uh, uh, less development in uh, white matter if you're a heavy drinker, again on an individual basis showing that there are structural brain changes that result from direct alcohol exposure. So uh, as I mentioned, not all teens drink like us adults. Uh, and uh, we've also looked at things uh, like extreme drinking, uh, whether you have a history of alcohol problems or not. These are just youth who are in school. And so despite the fact that youth may look the same when they're 12 or 13 years old, when we follow them over extended periods of time and look at those who are high-dose drinkers, meaning 10 or more drinks per occasion, that sounds like a lot to me, but in this study we had about 11% 11, uh, 11 of the youth who reported drinking like that. They performed worse than moderate drinkers on visual, uh, verbal learning and recall measures and um, that it uh, uh, produces, uh, again, significant learning and memory impacts that, are, that have a dose response 
relationship. So the more you drink per occasion, not necessarily how many occasions, but the more you drink per occasion, the more it may impact your uh, thinking abilities. Um, also, uh, uh, this group, uh, Susan Tapert and uh, uh, Lindsay Squiglia, have looked use, uh, using some other models um, at what are uh, optimal predictors from ages 12 to 14 up to age 18 of those who are going to be heavy drinkers. Now, there are things that we always know. Boys drink more than girls in adolescence. We know externalizing behaviors and alcohol expectancies are good predictors of people who uh, move into drinking and may have accelerated courses. But poor neuropsych uh, scores, lower cortical thickness, and lower fMRI activation, particularly on working memory, at ages 12 to 14, also predict the risk for heavy drinking in these youth. So there are different types. By doing these longitudinal studies, there are different types of risks that we may be able to identify to help us help children um, move through adolescence in a healthier fashion. And then CANDA, where we know that uh, there is a lot of comorbidity with heavy alcohol use and trauma. And um, uh, one of our sites, the Duke site in particular, with uh, Michael DeBellis and Kate Nooner, uh, they're interested in the relationship between uh, trauma, the experiences themselves, uh, PTSD uh, symptoms, and family history of alcohol density as they may relate to these different types of uh, aspects of brain functioning and structure. And I was shocked when I found out that over 60% of the youth in this uh, school-based sample, a normal sample, um, reported traumas, one or more trauma, that would meet that initial criterion for PTSD. You know, you have to have a substantial trauma uh, to then see whether there are any PTSD-specific symptoms. Over 60% of our sample reported something that would be at that level. That's a pretty high level of exposure to trauma. Uh, and I think we normally don't think about our youth as having that much exposure. Now, of course, not all of them go on to, to have PTSD. It's a smaller portion. So understanding what are the risks of progressing uh, facing that trauma, what are the protective factors that we can do, and how alcohol and drugs may influence the progression to um, uh, PTSD is going to be very important. So how harmful is alcohol to youth? Well, let me say that we know that it influences uh, gray matter and white matter. We know that it influences uh, emotional functioning, particularly fu executive development. And we know that uh, it influences learning and memory. And for boys in particular, more uh, issues related to attention and for girls, more visual spatial functioning. Now, of course, alcohol isn't the only drug that does this. Uh, we heard about opioids. Uh, but the second most common uh, substance consumed now, illicit substance consumed, is cannabis. And I'm not going to go over uh, uh, the specific details of this, but I just want to say that we see many of the same patterns for learning, for memory, reduction in attention, the cognition and, and mood improve with abstinence, just as they do with alcohol. And generally, it appears to me that the risks outweigh any possible de benefit um, of uh, cannabis use during normal adolescent development. Now, that's not to say that uh, cannabis uh, or subcomponents of cannabis don't have medicinal purposes, absolutely, particularly with regard to protracted pain. But we really need to have large-scale studies for us to understand who's going to be most adversely affected by this, how do, how do children, adolescents, and young adults work their way out of this. And that is, in no small part, what uh, the ABCD, the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Project, uh, is all about. Uh, as Ken said, I, I co-direct this uh, with Terry Jernigan, a uh, noted uh, uh, neurodevelopmental uh, psychologist. 
uh, at UCSD, and we have the good fortune of having Anders Dale lead the data side of this. I want to say, uh, not in a braggadocio way, but I think from the NIH's perspective, this is a transformative study. It's the Framingham study for youth because it's really focused on development for youth. Not just alcohol and drugs, but really understanding what is normal brain development. We don't have norms for it. We'll be able to develop those with ABCD. We don't know in what ways do communities impact and environmental toxins impact uh, and media exposure impact development and brain development, that's part of it. But ABCD is going to be a resource for the scientific community to answer some of these questions. And we are studying 11,874 youth and their families. Uh, we acquired that many from 21 uh, different sites across the country in just a two-year period. Each child has a six to seven hour assessment battery of which uh, Ken has been uh, very instrumental in helping to design. Uh, and the parents have a three or four hour battery as well. Uh, they uh, complete neuroimaging and uh, many of the things that uh, we're investigating um, will, I think, help us help youth in the future. We'll have the, create the opportunity to improve the quality of clinical care and public health in the United States. We're interested in brain development trajectories, academic achievement, social and emotional functioning, and physical well-being of American youth. Um, this uh, uh, sample is drawn in a way that matches at the 97.5% level the census characteristics of youth in the United States. And with these 21 sites, we had close to access to close to 30% of youth in that age range in the, in the United States. But it only comes from uh, universities and strong scientific leaders uh, like those in your midst, midst here today working together to produce something like this. Now, uh, this just lists the objectives that I, that I, uh, I mentioned. And the important thing to understand about this study is that it takes experts in epidemiology. It takes experts in genetics. It takes experts in neuroscience. And there is no single person or even single department that typically has all this kind of expertise. This is really population neuroscience. Large scale samples so we can look at how individuals and subgroups develop and grow over time. And we aren't looking at genetic versus environmental risk. We really think of this as how uh, it's not an or situation, it's how do these things work together to uh, help us understand how known risks influence development and to identify new types of risks that maybe we have never thought about before. We want to, uh, over the course of the 10 years of the study, um, be able to incorporate new types of understandings of development, uh, in particular new technologies and uh, new findings from neuroscience to help us uh, best articulate what's going on with adolescents and understand how they move to adulthood. And the, uh, the final thing I want to say about the, the study is that this is, it's a pretty uh, progressive approach. It's a different way of thinking about scientists, science um, uh, because the data that we are collecting at all of the 21 sites is not held just for those 21 sites. We are bringing this data set forward for global use and in a very rapid fashion. It's not after five years of study. Every year, we're releasing all the new data that we have after it's been quality controlled, quality checked. But the idea here is that um, this will, this information will be available to everyone, all the graduate students, all the postdocs, all the faculty here uh, in, in uh, this room will have as much access as, as I will have to these data. 
and in a, in a short period of time. Very different way of thinking about things. Um, I think I've already said that. So what is it that we're, we're doing? We're looking at uh, all these different uh, kinds of things, neurocognition, what their culture and environment is like. We're taking biospecimens. It's not always easy to get nine and 10-year-olds to spit into a little tube, I'll tell you. You really have to coax them. Uh, we do structural and functional MRI uh, uh, with these folks. We do uh, health and mental health assessments, substance use assessments, for example, and we're uh, launching Fitbits with nine and 10-year-olds. Year, 10 they think it's very cool. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Hopefully, they don't wreck too many of, of these things. But we're also gathering information passively, like school records, and we're geocoding their residential history. So we can have, have a sense of how um, environmental toxins that they might be exposed to, or the density of certain kinds of problems in their environment. And ultimately, we'll have teachers fill out, fill out forms as well. So from a variety of different uh, realms, we're trying to get a real picture in, in each of these areas. I think about it like a different instrument in a, uh, as a child is beginning to play. You want to have enough detail about how that instrument is played to then ultimately be able to put it together as uh, understanding the symphony of um, um, development. And rather than talk more about it now, I want to just show you a little video. This is an advantage of uh, having large-scale projects that can benefit each and every site around the nation that uh, are, are involved. And so if I do this correctly, which we're not trusting me to do this, you notice. As parents, we all worry about our kids' well-being, but what about their brains? The federal government has launched the biggest study ever of teenagers' brains, looking at how everything from homework to screen time to even how we parent impacts their cognitive health. They're regular kids taking part in something extraordinary. Nine-year-old Nick and 10-year-old Gemma are being followed by researchers for the next decade, part of a revolutionary new study to find out what helps and hurts the teenage brain. What kind of brain do you think you have? A very big one. <laughs> My brain is really cool and it's like the most important part of our body. It's called ABCD, the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study. Launched by NIH, it will track over 11,000 kids through adolescence, studying how dozens of factors impact their brains. Drugs and alcohol, diet and exercise, screen time, academic and social stress, sleep patterns, sibling relationships, even how they're parented. Susan Bookheimer is one of the study's lead investigators. We can look at boys versus girls. Um, we can look at different um, socioeconomic status. We can look at different exposures. We can look at kids who are in high-stress schools versus low-stress schools. In the 10-year study conducted at medical centers across the country, kids get regular physical exams, cognitive tests, and MRI scans. They and their parents also fill out detailed, confidential questionnaires about their habits and lifestyles. When we see brain changes, we need to know what is the cause of them, when do they start. Can you see when a kid comes in who's nine, do you already see brain changes? Can you already see anxiety? Can you already see depression? Today we can't tell, and that's really the purpose of this study. So you gotta do like one more. Nick's mom worries about how stress in school is affecting his brain. Outside home, there's a lot of things that can influence them. Um, and their brain and how they're thinking. It could be their teachers, it could be their friends, it could be anybody. When you're dealing with your friends or you're watching a movie or listening to music, are you aware of your brain responding in those situations? Oh yeah, like when I'm on my tablet, I'm, if I'm on it too long, I'm like, is this gonna do something to my brain or is this bad for it? To me, it's a little frightening that we have all of these children today who are spending 10 hours a day in front of a screen for their socialization and we don't know what's going to happen to their brains or how that's going to affect their relationships when they get older. The study also looks at the brain effects of extracurriculars. Gemma's dad encourages her to do activities like singing and dancing. I'd like some backup to know that they really do contribute to, to good brain development. 
you would like to be able to say, look, at, it's not just me or dad telling you to do this. Science shows us that this, in fact, will make you happier, more resilient, stronger. Exactly. For participating, kids and parents are both paid several hundred dollars per visit. The study's first results are due out in the next year. Do you think this study will change the way we educate our kids, the way we parent, the way society looks at the teenager? I think so. We hope that at the end we'll be able to say children who do these kinds of activities actually end up doing a lot better than children who don't. In an online poll, we ask viewers to tell us what you are worried most about <laughs> impacting your kid's brain. And the number one answer across the board, screen time. Screen wow. time, screen time, yeah. A big difference even just when my kids were little, we said, you know, no phone, no screen time until yeah. middle school, and now kids are on screens at two, three. Yeah. But is it possible in 10 years when they look back at that study, they'll say, hey, that much screen time didn't really do any harm? They could say that. I don't know. <laughs> 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 okay. So you can see how by measuring all of these different things, we may be able to put that information in a way to understand the symphony of adolescent development. Um, I uh, want to uh, close by saying we have these data available to you, uh, both from NCANDA and from ABCD uh, on our websites. Uh, how you get that, uh, get to that data, it's pretty easy, it's pretty direct, and again, it's available uh, uh, internationally, and as we release the data, uh, all of those data will b become available to everyone. So there are a lot of good master's theses, there are a lot of good dissertations in here, uh, and we want you to take uh, advantage of it. Uh, so I want to thank you today for uh, beginning this uh, impressive symposium with uh, just a little review of some of the work that we've been doing and what I hope you see as an exciting opportunity in the future. Thank you. I think we have time for just a few questions. I know I, I went a little longer than anticipated, but Ken's introduction was a little longer than, than I expected. But any, any questions? Uh, those of you who know Ken uh, know that that's, that's not unusual. So most of your research has been on alcohol, um, and um, ironically enough, today, um, de December the 6th, um, in Missouri, uh, uh, cannabis has now been legalized for uh, medical use. And I'm wondering what differences um, you, if any, you expect to see in the research um, that needs to be done uh, in, in that area. From, in the cannabis area? Yeah. you know. Distinctions between what you expect to find in um, with cannabis use and alcohol use. So it, it is interesting. I, I, I want to highlight one thing with regard to cannabis, and that is that uh, uh, the cannabis that used to be available in the United States uh, several decades ago uh, was of a potency that that is anywhere from three to ten times less than what's available today. So all the studies that we've done in the past on the impact of uh, cannabis on functioning, on development, really, we, we can't apply that today because that's the, not the type, that's not the intensity of exposure that youth are uh, experienced today. So I just want to want to highlight that, and that's, that's an important thing for us to understand that we can't take those old uh, scientific findings and apply them directly today. I will, just as an aside, say it's very difficult to do cannabis research. It's, it's a long and grueling process. Cannabis is only available at certain sites uh, around the country for federally funded projects. It's extremely difficult, and I know uh, uh, Dennis McCarthy is one of the people who is uh, pursuing this and will be very helpful information in the future. What we do know just based on the information that we have so far, is that we see some of the same types of detrimental impacts on neurocognition, on thinking abilities from cannabis that we see with alcohol. And again, it depends on exposure, intensity, duration, et cetera. There are a, a, number, of different, uh, a number of differences. What we don't know yet are is it sort of the same whether you use alcohol or cannabis? 
uh, are these additive effects? Are they more severe? Are there synergistic effects? And we're hoping that we'll be able to get some of this information uh, in ABCD and in Encanda. The, I'll, I'll mention that the um, nanobioengineered patches that were, were in the process of developing can measure alcohol, can measure cannabis, can measure glucose, the kind of things that are sort of the modern uses of, of the, those things. So we don't know yet, really, what cannabis use today, is, how it's going to impact development. But there's nothing that would suggest to us that the, uh, the potency of the cannabis that's being used today um, would have uh, deleterious effects any less than what alcohol use has. And in California, we, we uh, um, uh, have legalized mar marijuana use as well. Makes no sense. I'll just, just mention as an aside in New Zealand in a long-term 10-year uh, study that they did with adults, they found a 10-point IQ reduction for people who were regular uh, cannabis users, very regular cannabis users, you know, over a 10-year period. I don't know about you, but... As I age, I'm going to lose enough IQ points. <laughs> I don't need a, a booster in that direction. I, I think that uh, shares my opinion. Good. Well, again, thank you. Oh, we have one more question. Yes. Hi. It's kind of maybe more of a comment. My name's Heather Harlan, and I work as a counselor and prevention specialist here in Columbia. And I think it's just information I want this group to know. 95% of addictions begin before the age of 21. Right now, to my knowledge, Missouri raises absolute zero towards primary prevention. I think we would be outraged if we treated cancer that way. We have money coming in from the federal government, from our county government, and from our city. But Missouri raises, to my knowledge, and this, there's somebody that knows something, but that I've explored absolute zero, and yet we know more about primary prevention research base than we do treatment. So my encouragement is for us to begin talking to our funders to be able to explore that. And there are probably many people in this room, if you said, how would you prevent an addiction, would not have an answer to that question. They could tell you about heart disease or cancer. And if we had 95% of cancers beginning before the age of 21, I bet we would be funneling some funding that way. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent point. Uh, I do want to just, uh, uh, we always throw out this, this ratio of uh, seven-fold return on investment for prevention in the uh, addiction arena relative uh, to the cost to society uh, over time. So um, I would encourage that activity. Thank you. Okay, and again, thank you all. I appreciate it. Hello? Okay. Hi, um, I'm Dennis McCarthy, and I'm a professor in psychological sciences here at MU. Uh, I'm a little biased because training with Sandy was so important to my professional development, but I always enjoy hearing her talk. Um, and I came directly from Sandy's lab here to Columbia. I've developed a little bit and changed locations, so I, don't, I had to trade in the motorcycle, and now I have um, one of those bird scooters, right? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, but so I'm introducing briefly our first session. So a couple of quick things. We're going to have a series of sessions. After this first session, we will have a break. Um, each of the sessions, we ask you to save your questions till the end. We'll have three speakers, 20 minutes each for each session. And the first session is drugs and society. It's kind of an overview. We'll hear a little bit about the etiology of substance use from Kenny Shear. We'll hear a little bit about some cutting edge methods in ambulatory assessment data collection that Sandy referred to. And then we'll hear a little bit about some things that are going on in the state with regard to the opiate epidemic. So I'll introduce our first speaker, distinguished curator professor, Kenny Shear. Uh, thank you, Dennis. And uh, I'm going to, as Dennis said, give a brief overview of some of the work on etiology and course of substance use disorders, but focusing on uh, uh, alcohol, uh, but uh, bringing in some other relevant data as well. Just... 
Ah. And I'm going to start out by uh, showing a slide from a book I wrote about 25 years ago where I was asked to summarize everything we knew about children of alcoholics. And it was a daunting task, and, but I tried to, as best I can, sift through the extant literature uh, at the time. And uh, what we might call the, whoops, I went to my, what we might call the exogenous variable, the variable I was trying to explain the effects of its family history of alcoholism. And it generated people looking at basically the correlates of why do people who are children of alcoholics tend to become alcoholic themselves. And one of the things, so the first thing I did was I just tried to map out, at least as best I could, what the various kinds of connections were. And uh, a very large proportion of the work focused on inherited characteristics associated with uh, personality and with cognitive function. But to my way of thinking, the interesting thing is, well, how does that translate? That's just giving us a static correlation. And uh, we proposed at that time, and much of the work uh, both uh, that I've done and my colleagues have done have really tried to focus on specific mechanisms implied at, by this and related to these uh, basic dispositional differences. One focused on negative emotionality. Uh, many of you are familiar with the idea of self-medication or tension reduction. Uh, another focused on the idea of deviant socialization. That is, individuals who may be uh, more impulsive, uh, hang out with uh, kids who are substance abusing or rule violating in some way. And the other is basic individual differences in alcohol effects uh, that could go either of two ways. Either some people get much more reinforcement out of alcohol, therefore it's a better drug for them in certain ways. Or alternatively, some people are less sensitive. And so in order to get desired effects, they expose themselves to uh, more harmful levels. And in fact, uh, in the Department of Psychological Sciences here at MU, we have people who focus really on all three of these kinds of mechanisms. I'm gonna shift a little bit and talk about the diagnosis of a substance use disorder. Uh, and the criteria for a drug use disorder and alcohol use disorder are the same. There are these 11 criteria. I'm not gonna go through all of them. The point I'd like to make is, what it's a hodgepodge. Uh, there is no theoretical framework that's really uh, been used to develop a rational diagnostic system. And uh, related to that, there's no conceptual core. It's not to say it doesn't work or it's not meaningful, but within the current DSM-5, the current classification, uh, two of 11 of these symptoms are required. Uh, just want you to think this through a little bit. It means that uh, with the current diagnostic system, there's over 2,000 ways to diagnose. And uh, even uh, with people who have, uh, there's like 55 possible configurations of people who have uh, two symptoms and two, simple, uh, two symptoms only, if you just do the combinatorics, and uh, work with my uh, former postdoc, Sean Lane, we've shown that even with people with the same symptom count, depending upon the symptoms, we see different kinds of correlates. When we look, and this really builds on uh, Sandy's work, at what the prevalence of AUD is, of course, the lifespan, you see this, basically the third decade of life, you know, people in late teens, early uh, to mid 20s, uh, the highest prevalence throughout the lifespan. Uh, many people think, well, maybe those are false positives. It doesn't make sense. You know, clinicians say, that's not what I see coming through my clinic necessarily. And I think this recent paper uh, from NIAAA uh, makes us take it a little bit more seriously. Uh, I would have said a priori that a lot of those people who are diagnosing very early, they're all just mild. They're basically just barely super threshold. That's not the case, I mean, as these data suggest. 
And so it means that this group of individuals, even though they might not have all the hallmarks we typically think of addiction or chronic alcoholism in terms of compulsive use, they're still experiencing a large number of problems. Uh, uh, this is work we did in our uh, lab using the same data, uh, similar data sources uh, that Alvaro Verges worked on and said, well, if we take a look at these individuals who diagnosed at a given time, uh, can we identify those people who are recent onsets, uh, people who are chronic, and people who are more episodic in their course? And what we see over the course of time is, first of all, a mix at every observation period, um, but also that a large part of the decrease we see over the lifespan is due to decreases in new onset and recurrences as opposed to uh, changes in the chronicity of the problem. Uh, in Alvaro uh, and uh, our lab, we also extended this to drug use disorder, uh, where we see something similar, except that the new onsets tend to represent a larger proportion of cases at each time. So I think the question comes is like, why this huge decrease? If there's you know, nothing from a talk like I give is, what did you learn today? It's, wow, this developmental age gradient in substance use disorders is huge. Um, and so people have tried to explain it and say, well, why might it be decreasing? One might be differential mortality, that those people who are using uh, tend to die off and not be part of your population base. Uh, and even though there is, as Sandy noted, uh, high mortality associated with uh, substance use, or I should say it's a risk for uh, mortality, that really can't explain more than a tiny percent of that. And another one is, well, what about formal treatment or self-help? Uh, and actually, if we look at the proportion of people who diagnose, who actually seek help, uh, that can't really explain it either. Uh, it's not to say it doesn't explain some of it, but it's a very small proportion. And the reason, the explanation that's usually given is role incompatibility. And these are data from uh, older data, but they actually still look the same from the Monitoring the Future project on binge drinking. I'm gonna just show the men in the interest of time. The women data are virtually the same. And so this is whether or not they had a binge occasion basically in the last two weeks. And if you look at those people who are single at both a baseline and a two-year follow-up, you see pretty high rates. And if you look at people who are married at both times, uh, you see pretty low rates. And if you look at people who are divorced, you know, formally married at both times, they look like the single people. But the interesting cases are the ones where there's a change in status. And what happens when someone gets married, it decreases, their binge drinking decreases quite a bit. And what happens when somebody gets divorced? It goes up. And so we need to think about substance use in you know, this part of the environment of intimate or close relationships and how important that is. And we could look at other variables related to adult role occupancies, like being a member or, uh, of the workforce and other things that basically kind of constrain your opportunities for use. But we became interested, is that all there is? Is it that simple that people still want to party but they really don't have time anymore because they have responsibilities being a parent or being a worker? I know last night I didn't have a drink at dinner. I did have a drink before dinner, but not because I knew I had to be here before 7.30. You know, so uh, is it just those kinds of uh, environmental constraints? And one of the things we looked at was personality. And these are data from a meta-analysis by Brent Roberts. And what you see is over the course of development, uh, and this is good news, people become more mature. They become more emotionally stable. They become more conscientious. And uh, we know those are two traits that are strongly related to whether or not somebody uses substances, particularly the conscientiousness and the emotional stability, a higher risk for uh, substance use disorders. And we thought, 
that when we were looking at how steep that curve was, it's also particularly steep during the third decade of life. We thought, could this possibly be associated with this other phenomenon, so-called maturing out? And when we looked at our own data, this was a cohort we started studying in 1987, we see the same kinds of findings that came out of the meta-analysis of Brent Roberts is, yeah, our subjects are becoming less neurotic and less impulsive, or in the words of Big Five, uh, uh, more emotionally stable and more conscientious. And when we looked at the alcohol problems in the sample, we saw those were decreasing as well. So we thought, okay, well, let's see, is there a correlation? Is it just happening at the same time, or are these seem to be coupled processes? And I'll just try and explain this a little. We could think of this as a cross-sectional baseline correlation. And these slopes, this is how much your impulsivity is changing uh, over the 17-year period, and how much your uh, alcohol involvement is changing over this period, and we could look at the correlations between changes in one and changes in the other. The first thing I want to highlight is this thing, which is like a rolling compatibility effect. It's not like we don't find it. It's there. But the thing we find most noticeable is changes in impulsivity are strongly associated with changes in alcohol use. And if we do this with neuroticism as well, uh, we see very similar finding, that the correlation in, between change in personality and change in uh, substance involvement is just as strong as it is between the baseline levels. Of it. And again, we see this effect, the rolling compatibility effect. But we also see this other nice effect, too. And that is actually becoming involved in a committed relationship is good for your emotional stability. And um, it's sometimes called the maturity principle, that these engagement in adult roles have very widespread effects uh, on psychosocial maturation. So uh, again, I could only focus on a few topics here today, but uh, obviously relationships are one thing we looked at, but what about other environments? And we are here on a university campus. Uh, and I don't put this, I just, I give talks at a number of universities on college student drinking. And before I go, I just Google the campus, alcohol, Greek. There's always some kind of lurid headline. And the University of Missouri is not exempt. And so by putting it up, I don't mean to cast us in a bad light. Is to just say this is a national problem. And in fact, the whole question of should we be, you know, allow fraternities to exist has become part of uh, the national debate and the leading national publications like Time and uh, the New York Times. So we were interested in saying, well, what can we learn about the Greek system? And we've done a number of studies in that area. And uh, this was work with a uh, former student, Asun Park. And one of the things, so we, we actually got a hold of MU, incoming MU students before they matriculated, during summer welcome. And we were able to get data from them in high school, and then we followed them for the next four years. And one of the things is you want to know who are the people who are going to drink a lot as first semester freshmen, it's the people who are drinking a lot in high school. You know, half of the variance in how much somebody is uh, of binge drinking as a first semester uh, freshman could be explained by what they were doing before they got to college. It also explained who goes into the Greek system in part, and we call that environmental selection. That is, people seek out niches that are consistent with their desires and uh, predispositions and predilections. But once somebody is in the Greek system, it predicts how much they're drinking in the first semester itself, above and beyond their pre-college drinking, but also how much they drink over the next three years. And then we think, well, what happens when we bring these dispositional traits like personality into the picture? And 
In this study, we looked at impulsivity, extroversion, and neuroticism. So even though the parameters change a little bit there because we're uh, including other variables, they're very similar. But one of the things that we find interesting is even though we do see this correlation with pre-college heavy drinking we exist, is we see a pretty modest association with extroversion. But if we look at personality traits and who goes into the Greek system, we see a really strong association with extroversion, which makes us realize and think that environmental uh, uh, constructs like Greek houses are actually much more complex than we would think. There's multiple facets. Some people might like it for just the affiliation. Some people might like it for the service. Uh, components. Some people might like it for the easy access uh, to alcohol and other drugs. Uh, some people might like it because they think they'll be able to uh, date easier if they're in a high prestige Greek system. But the interesting thing is this is people select into a high risk environment, not necessarily to be able to use a substance, but then they're in a social trap in a sense in their, they've selected in on one characteristic and then are exposed to this other one. So uh, some basic take homes from this are AUDs are very highly prevalent. And in fact, they typically show up in most psychiatric surveys as the most prevalent psychological disorder in the US population. Uh, they are largely, but by no means exclusively, uh, disorders of late adolescence and young adulthood. We might have to change that. Some of the, the epidemiologic surveys over the last 10 years have shown that actually the biggest increase, say, from like 2008 to 2018, there's a recent meta-analysis published, are in people about my age. And so there is some de you know, new demographic trends, but it doesn't really change that. It's still this big bulge uh, in earlier adulthood. Uh, remission often comes about through normal development. Uh, both because of adult role occupancies and psychological maturation. And there are multiple etiological pathways. There is no single way that lead people to develop a compulsive drinking lifestyle or uh, another form of an alcohol use disorder. So uh, some of the things we're working on in uh, my lab and with some of my colleagues here is uh, what do we want to do going forward? And one of the things that has uh, captured my imagination is how do we make diagnosis better? Uh, and I'll describe that a little bit, uh, but attending to issues of like which symptoms are core or fundamental versus other ones that are kind of epiphenomenal. They show up and they might be helpful clinically in that they help you diagnose but they're not a target of treatment necessarily, or maybe it would be a waste to make them a target of treatment because they're not influencing other ones. Uh, another one is when does a predisposition that might exist prior to substance exposure change to the point where it's actually a symptom of a disorder because very often uh, the traits that lead one to use uh, become more exaggerated after use. Uh, another question is how much does somebody have to experience a symptom before we say it's clinically important and should figure into a diagnosis? And whether or not we want to think of symptoms as actors in their own right that influence other symptoms or adopt the more traditional psychopathology perspective is there's disease entities uh, underlying most of these syndromes we're interested in and symptoms are simply manifestations of an underlying process. Uh, a recent paper, I guess it's still in press, uh, that I did with, uh, came out of a round table uh, I hosted at Research Society on Alcoholism uh, a couple of years ago, uh, where I brought together basic preclinical uh, animal modeler and uh, somebody who's a behavioral economist working in humans and tried to map out, okay, here's formal diagnostic criteria according to different diagnostic symptoms. But people in the uh, clinicians uh, might focus on core constructs like compulsive use, whether or not there's neuroadaptation, craving, uh, or uh, uh, whether or not there's a given preference for a specific drug 
Um, and here, really to the exclusion of other natural reinforcers. And then how did that line up with basic theories of addiction? And the main take home message from this is there's not a lot of correspondence, I shouldn't say that, there's moderate correspondence between what different uh, theories seek to explain and how we go about the diagnostic process. Uh, this is something that we've been interested in. We actually don't feel the state of the art is there yet, but that is how can we determine whether or not certain symptoms are more central or peripheral. A lot of people are interested in network modeling of symptoms. Uh, and uh, conceptually, it makes a lot of sense, but empirically, working with my colleague uh, Doug Steinle and graduate students uh, of Doug's, uh, we've kind of concluded it's a problematic state of the art, even in, uh, but we still feel it's conceptually useful. Uh, this other piece of when do we decide a symptom is a symptom of disorder versus a predisposition is highlighted both by kind of rude and obnoxious behavior when drunk and people still drink, but a lot of times those people are rude and obnoxious when they're not drinking. Uh, and then alcohol sensitivity, there are several people in my department who are very interested in looking at low sensitivity as a risk factor, but we also, that's how we define tolerance. And this is just to highlight, do we, well, how do we want to think about differences in overall sensitivity as a function of what might be inherited and what might be acquired? Uh, another issue is where do we decide that somebody has a symptom? And uh, uh, Sean uh, Lane, the postdoc I mentioned, I did a meta-analysis where we looked at the IRT thresholds of different diagnostic criteria and saw huge differences across different diagnostic interviews. And if we actually drill down and say, what might be going on here, you'll see some studies say, uh, and it'll be close to the wording in the DSM, uh, craving as a very strong desire or urge. Where other ones is, it was so, I had desire so strong, I couldn't think of anything else. And those, depending upon the sample, could have a five to tenfold difference. And yet, they're access, assessing presumably the exact same symptom. And one of the things we've been working on with uh, one of the students in my lab is can we grade all symptoms and move away, like in clinical medicine and APGAR scores or coma scores or other places where we really think of each of these as dimensional and not categorical. And so I'm just going to uh, leave uh, with this notion that we could do a lot better in terms of how we conceptualize and diagnose substance use disorders. And I think in doing so, it not only makes the research better in terms of having cleaner phenotypes, uh, but I also think it might suggest what are the most fruitful targets for intervention. And just wanted to thank a number of the people. I can't thank everyone, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, uh, we have had great, first of all, great collaborators, uh, faculty in the department, and also uh, trainees, uh, graduate students, postdocs, and undergraduates. So thank you. Thanks, Kenny. So um, for our next talk, we have Dr. Tim Truel, Curator's Distinguished Professor and Byler Distinguished Professor of Psych Science, and he will be talking about addiction-relevant approaches to ambulatory assessment methods. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think I can. All right. Thanks, Dennis. And thank you for inviting me uh, to do this talk. Uh, also, I want to point out that my research collaborator, Dr. Shang, is here, and uh, I'd like to hold this out because it's an example of, I think, cross-disciplinary collaboration. He's in the Department of Engineering and also an expert in computer science, which comes greatly into play when you start talking about uh, mobile assessment. Um, what I want to talk about today is really uh, more methods-based, and the idea is that uh, traditionally when we assess people for substance use disorder, diagnoses and so forth, it's a cross-sectional assessment. We ask people to retrospect about what their life has been like over a certain period of time. The promise of this method we call ambulatory assessment is that actually we can assess people as they're going about their daily lives uh, and also we can kind of limit 
the amount of retrospection necessary. So we ask people, for example, what their mood has been like in the last 15 minutes or what happened. And, and essentially, we're collecting data almost in real time. And it has some great advantages over people having to retrospect because it turns out not just patients, but all of us are terrible historians. We, we're, if I asked you what you did of this last week and to kind of nail it down, most of you would make errors in that. But with this sort of methodology, we can actually see what's happening as people go about their daily lives. Um, so first, I want to tell you a little bit about ambulatory assessment, kind of what it involves. Unlike many of the other techniques that we use in psychology and other social sciences, this is more ideographic in focus. And what I mean by this is that we're really studying individual processes because we're getting multiple assessments of the same person over time. So essentially, every person is his or her own control. And we can kind of map out, as I'll show you, sort of what's going on in their daily life over time. Um, so it's characterized, as I mentioned, by these real world uh, environments. There's another huge advantage here. So we're not asking people what they're like when they're going about their daily lives. We're actually collecting data from them while they're going about their daily life. Uh, we focus on current or very recent uh, states or behavior so that we kind of limit that retrospection. Also, these assessments, you can kind of play around with different kinds of sampling. So you can do event-based assessments where you have people uh, initiate a survey on a smartphone when X happens, like after the first alcoholic drink or after they have an urge for opioids, whatever it may be, you define it. But we also can do uh, random prompts as well throughout the day to get a sense of kind of like, in general, what's sort of representative of their mood state over the day. And in, also, as I'll point out, those random prompts often capture or catch people's lack of initiating a prompt when there's something of interest. So we, for example, in, in many studies that my colleague Tom Piasecki and others have done, we might catch maybe up to 50% of drinking occasions from random prompts as, as opposed to event-based prompts. And then finally, as I'll show you, we're getting multiple assessments over time, sometimes hundreds of assessments on the same individual. So the advantages here, again, are that we can characterize sort of dynamic processes. Uh, I'm a big, you know, especially after using this research, everything changes. I mean, we, we like to think everybody is this and they're always like this, but in reality, whether it's our mood state, whatever, things are changing, and that makes some sense because we're facing different contexts throughout the day. Um, this real-time assessment is going to minimize bias, and what is really lacking in all of psychopathology research, substance use disorder research, anything, is this temporal dimension to assessment. Because again, we do a, a one-time assessment and ask about what's happened over the last year, here we could theoretically see exactly what happened over a year's time by taking these uh, regular assessments. And there's really no substitute for the external validity because you're not in a control laboratory setting. Rather, we don't tell you what to do and you just go about living your daily life so we can capture kind of what people typically do, how they expose themselves to certain environments, to certain people and so forth and all of these things seem to have some impact upon whether or not people choose to use substances and whether or not they have problems with substances. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but there's a long history of this. You may know some of these other names. Before we had electronics, you know, they, this was called experience sampling, and people filled this out on papers, and they would be told to do it. There's some problems with it. People would backfill. They wouldn't do it on time, and so you didn't know whether to trust it. Uh, most of you, if you're familiar, would have heard of ecological momentary assessment. And ambulatory assessment is a larger umbrella that, in, that encapsulates EMA, but also we can start uh, measuring physiology as well with external sensors, which I'll show you. Uh, and also there's some ways through either sensors and smartphones or other things that we can sort of passively capture things in the environment that people can't self-report. Okay, so as you might guess, the, um, the smartphone is really the game changer here. Uh, before we did paper and pencil, then you had 
Some of you that are older know personal digital assistants, PDAs. The, our first studies, we did those. Most people don't even know what those are anymore. But they were like, you could use those as electronic diaries. But now we have smartphones. And the beauty of the smartphone is not only are people familiar with it, but it has Bluetooth capabilities. Uh, so it can really be used as an electronic diary. We have sensors, whether it's GPS or other things that we can uh, tap into with the phone. And uh, as I'll briefly mention, this can be like a hub for a wireless body network. So if you're wearing external sensors, they can Bluetooth the information to the smartphone. So you have an overlay of the physiology while you have the self-reports as well. OK, so in case you didn't know, that's what a smartphone looks like. Uh, here's the Apple uh, and the Android. We, with our software, we can uh, use both platforms. Everyone, or it seems like a lot of people, have Apple Watches, but you can have other just standalone devices that collect things like heart rate, heart rate variability, uh, electrodermal activity. And then if you really want to go crazy, which we do in my lab, is you find a Canadian company that makes a smart shirt for Canadian astronauts. Who knew <laughs> that they had them? But we've used this in several studies. And here we can get respiration. We can get heart rate variability, heart rate, and some other things that uh, are kind of harder to do from a risk-based assessment. OK, so let's switch gears and let's just let's focus on substance use. How do we use this to assess substance use and maybe ad addiction sorts of processes? Uh, I like to kind of break it down into for self-report. So these would be surveys that are randomly prompted, or somebody says, I just had a drink or something. You might be asked about urges or craving. Makes sense the actual use, and so it's important, like how much have you had to drink, how often, how long. Uh, the major point here is that you need to capture that full episode, and I'll tell you a little bit about a, a strategy for trying to do a better job of that. Another important thing is motivations for use. So um, what we find is that if we ask this in the moment, Sometimes those motivations for use differ significantly from what somebody told us on a questionnaire, what their motivations are for drug use or substance use. So capturing it in the moment, moment is more proximal to the actual use of the substance and seems to have more validity. And then finally, the effects of the substance. Uh, that's super important as well. Are you getting sort of an arousal uh, disinhibitory effect? Is it sedating you? Things of that nature. And as several have mentioned, there are individual differences in how, how sensitive people are to certain substances, which seem to play a very important role in whether or not people use substances too much and ultimately become addicted to certain substances. Um, OK, so some overarching issues. I keep harping on sampling. But uh, again, you can have an event base. So whether it's alcohol use, uh, we've, done, uh, we've also done studies with cannabis use and opioid use. Um, so you can instruct the person that's in the study, whenever you use, you know, hit this button on the smartphone, and then you fill out surveys to tell us about how much and so forth. Uh, again. What we find is that it's also important to ask about use in these random assessments because people tend to not remember to hit the button for when they actually use, and we can catch it in that random assessment and then ask them the same questions we would have otherwise. Um, and then super important are follow-ups. So it would be sometimes too much of a burden for some things, maybe, to, to ask them to hit a button every time they drank. But if you have regular follow-ups, you can then capture the episode. So for example, with uh, alcohol use disorder, you might, after they, they uh, hit the button to say that they've had a drink, 30 minutes later say, have you had another drink since then? 60 minutes later, 90 minutes later, 120. If they say no there, then you've captured that episode. They had one drink. If they say at 60 minutes, yes, I had two more drinks, the clock starts over again. And so in this way, you get a much better sense of like how many drinks and what's happening throughout that episode of substance use. Um, 
this shouldn't be surprising, but just uh, this is kind of the wording, and I'll show you some screenshots. But uh, this would be, for example, if um, maybe a random assessment, you'd ask this, and you just ask how many drinks. And this is a great uh, shot uh, my colleague Tom Piasecki has for a new study that he's used, uh, they're using our software. But one question always is, what is a drink? And fortunately, in the case of cigarettes and alcohol, it's a little easier to make sense out of that because here you can actually show people, and now we're taking into account the, you know, I'm an IPA drinker, so yeah, that beer is not a beer anymore, as it turns out. Uh, but you can kind of break it down, and people can use these standardized estimates of drinks. Uh, why is that important? Well, you get a better sense of how many drinks. And then there are other things you can do, though. You can, if you weigh people, um, measure their height, their gender, you can actually estimate where they stand on the blood alcohol curve if you have this time stamped and tell over time how many drinks they've had. So there's something else you can do with this as well. The, the challenge, though, are on illicit substances, uh, because like cannabis, at least in this state, and uh, opioids, things like that, because there's not always standardization, especially things like heroin. You don't know, all you know is that you're shooting heroin, but you don't know where you got it from, whatever. Uh, likewise, with cannabis, you know, it can range from uh, what I call nitapod is 12% THC, but in reality, what we see on the streets, and I just, we just recently did a study here in Columbia, most people are like 18 to 20% THC in the, the cannabis that they smoke. So uh, you just don't know with some of these illicit substances without testing the substance what people are putting into their body. But for alcohol, we can get a, come up with a pretty decent estimate. So, well, this is touchy. So this is kind of colorful, but basically this is one subject that was followed for, I think, three to four weeks. And this just to get you, give you an idea of if you look at one person, kind of what you can see from this. Uh, up here are green stars or cannabis use. Uh, these triangles are alcoholic drinks, and the numbers are how many drinks they had at the time. Uh, we also have stuff uh, like they got into a fight with their partner. They, this person had some binge. Uh, eating problems as well, and these dots are kind of their mood state. And I haven't connected the dots, but this is just to show you how rich the data is for any one single individual. Of course, we have statistical techniques where we can throw this all together and come up with some, not only within the individual, some trends, but also across individuals. Okay. Another thing, uh, taking advantage of the smartphone and the Bluetooth, would be to actually start collecting data on biomarkers. So beyond um, just asking people how much they're drinking, if you can maybe collect some data passively, semi-passively in some cases, uh, you can bet, get a better sense of how intoxicated they are. Um, with Dennis McCarthy's study right now, we're using a breathalyzer, so we instruct people the phone says, okay, go ahead and blow in it, and then we can get a sense at different time points, like what their BAC level is. Um, this scram device is used a lot. Uh, some people don't like wearing it because it looks like you just got out of jail. Uh, and um, here's the newest sensor, which unfortunately we are not really using that much because it doesn't seem to be that good. But the idea is that uh, through your sweat, you can get a sense of how much, and same thing with the scram, but here this would be risk-based, but there's some issues with this. Okay, so what have we learned from AA studies here? Individuals are different, who knew? Uh, you know, you go into psychology because you think, oh, it's people are so interesting, right? And yet sometimes through our research, we act like everybody's the same and we wanna just kind of lump everybody together. Through this methodology, you can really see these individual differences, and this would have ultimately intervention or treatment uh, implications. You may be wondering, do people actually do this? Yes, we get uh, about 85 to 90% compliance. And there was a recent meta-analysis that's in press, and they looked at compliance by different substances. There are no differences <laughs> depending on the substance. 
and there don't seem to be great differences in the length of the assessment period. Now, these people are getting reimbursed to do this, but in general, the important point is they seem to be you know, filling this out reliably. Um, what do we know about comparing it to retrospective report? The old timeline follow-back where you'd ask, ask someone, uh, sorry about that, to retrospect like over 30 days, like how many people, or how many people, how many drinks they've had. If you compare that, even over the period where they're self-monitoring using it, what we find is people underreport how many drinks they've had when they retrospect as opposed to what's picked up by these electronic diaries. Uh, and not to mention the fact that people often are off days as to when they had their binge uh, drinking episode. Um, this, again, provides a much clearer picture of the dynamics of use and the, the associated mood changes, impulsivity changes, and so forth. Um, and as I mentioned, some of our questionnaire-based assessments of important constructs like motivations and so forth, they don't seem to map on very well with what we see happens in daily life. That is, people may say they primarily drink to deal with negative affect, but if you look at the diary data, it's not like their affect negative, built up before drinking and then went down after drinking. So we believe that by doing this in a more proximal way, we get better data about what's actually happening. Um, and this is a big one, context matters. We sometimes, when we do just our traditional cross-sectional assessments, don't really talk about context that much or talk about it in very broad terms, but we have shown there's big differences like what time of the day or weekend versus weekday, where you are and whom you're with. Those things all impact whether or not you use and how much you use. Uh, very quickly, I will tell you about um, this system that we've developed along with Dr. Shang here at MU. It's called TigerWare and we built it out of necessity because I got tired of paying for a software developer to do an app for every time I did a study. So we made, a base, basically it's a platform that can make apps for us. And uh, without getting into the details, you can see you have the interface with you know, a lot of external sensors. We're also playing around with a, a Google Home thing that can actually administer surveys. So people that are homebound or for whatever reason can't take a phone out. And you can actually administer surveys through Google Home as well. Uh, There's just some more detail about that. I'm happy to talk to you outside of this. Um, and one thing we do like, this research kit that was developed by Apple that's used in TigerWare, they have behavioral tasks that are administered over the phone. And so some of these are very relevant to intoxication. So for example, this gate task in we tried this out at a party recently, uh, as it turns out. It was for science, uh, but just put it in your pocket and you walk and has very sen sensitive sensors that are then collecting data and you can do it at, in a sober state in the lab, intoxicated in the lab, and then sober and intoxicated out in the real world. So you can actually do stuff in the lab and compare it to real world as well. Okay, uh, this is just about Dennis's study. Dr. McCarthy, also Drs. Bartholo and Piasecki uh, are studying um, sort of the sensitivity to alcohol effects and so forth, and they're also using this software as well. So just to conclude, sorry to speed through it, we can study these things uh, in daily life. Uh, we get good compliance. We've gotten very interesting findings, sometimes findings that challenge some of the prevailing theories about substance use initiation. Um, this is much better than retrospective assessment and there are ways of kind of looking at impairment or combining the data that we get in real life with laboratory data to get a better picture of what may influence people to use a substance too much or to have problems with the substance. And again, I can't emphasize enough how important this last thing is because by studying people in their daily life, you're letting them choose their context. You're not setting, there's not an artificial context of the lab, but this is really how they're living their daily life. And you might be thinking the, the next kind of step, which is true, 
is that we can actually perhaps intervene in daily life. So for certain people, there's certain contexts that are going to be more problematic. You can remind them about skills use, other things like that, and that is kind of the, the next uh, phase here. Okay, so thank you to my lab. This is by the getting Thai food on the river. Um, Dr. Shang's lab as well, and uh, also the funding support for over several years. I've been, probably about 15 years, I've been working in this area. That's it. Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, and now I'm happy to introduce our, our last speaker for this morning's session is Dr. Rachel Winograd. She's an assistant professor of psychological sciences at Fantastic. the University of... Uh, hmm? Fantastic now. Oh, nice. Um, of Psychological Sciences at the University of Missouri St. Louis and at the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. And she'll be talking a little bit about current efforts to deal with the opiate crisis in Missouri. Thank you, Dennis. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, I just want to start by saying it's, uh, I'm incredibly honored to be here and share the stage with the faculty who've presented already. I trained here at Mizzou under Kenny. Uh, I often say that Kenny taught me for better or worse, how to think uh, about the world and about science and addiction, as well as the rest of the faculty in this department. So I uh, can't overstate how honored I am to be here with you today. Now, is this the clicker that I should be using? OK. So before uh, I get going and, and talk more about what we're dealing with in Missouri, I'm going to talk mostly about treatment. Uh, I have a whole host of other things to say about prevention, recovery, harm reduction. Uh, I'd be remiss not to include discussion of naloxone in any talk. It's really easy. Uh, it's simple. It's low-hanging fruit. You should all go to your pharmacies and ask for it. This is what it looks like. This can save a life for someone who is in the midst of an opiate overdose. And there's no reason that everyone shouldn't have access to it. So I'm not going to talk about it further today, but it's a, a life-saving tool, and uh, it's the last, it's the, it's the least that we can do uh, to help address our current crisis. So working backwards from there, uh, we'll discuss more of our efforts that we're working with in Missouri. To ground us in why we are referring to this as a crisis, it is not necessarily because of rates of addiction, which are always there. People have always used drugs. People will always use drugs. What makes this a crisis is how many people are dying. So you've seen versions of this, these graphs. This is the most recent one. It cuts through nearly half of 2018. This data is updated uh, semi-regularly federally. And what you see clearly, this purple line here, you may say, what is that? That is fentanyl. That is a synthetic opioid. And that's what we're dealing with at this time. We are no longer in the midst of a prescription opioid crisis or even a heroin crisis. We are dealing with a fentanyl crisis. This is fentanyl here in the middle. What you're seeing here are pictures of comparable lethal doses of these illicit opioids. So this is heroin here on the left. It only takes a, a few specks of fentanyl, like a little bit of sweet and low, to kill you. And then there's carfentanyl, which thankfully isn't really here in Missouri, at least not yet. Uh, but uh, this is what we are dealing with on the streets, uh, and it's infiltrating our heroin supply, often unbeknownst to the people who use it. It's for that reason uh, that we look at a death report. So this is just a snapshot of what I look through uh, in the St. Louis region. This is one page of opiate overdose uh, fatality reports. You see I've circled fentanyl in terms of every individual who died uh, with fentanyl in their system. Over 95% of opiate overdose in the St. Louis region involve fentanyl now. What's heartbreaking is that these people are dying alone in their homes. If you look at the location of death, I mean, it gives you chills when you look through these reports. Every single line here is a life. It's a life lost that could have been prevented. Uh, and it's, it's really devastating. Because of that, I, I don't like the term opioid crisis. When we think of orange pill bottles. We're way past that. This is an overdose crisis, or more aptly, we are in the midst of a poisoning crisis. If we use that term, 
our public health approaches follow more readily, and that's really the state of emergency that we are in. So what is Missouri doing to address this poisoning crisis? Uh, I've been lucky enough to be leading this effort with the Department of Mental Health for the last year and a half or so. Our primary goal is to transform the system of care across prevention, treatment, recovery support. Despite our best intentions, we know that what we've been doing for decades is not working. We cannot apply old models to the current uh, drugs and use patterns that we are facing. We are doing this throughout prevention, treatment, and recovery support. We can think of this in terms of systems of care, cascades of care, opportunities to touch people who are at risk of developing or relapsing back to opiate use disorder. How are we delivering this type of transformation? We're doing it at the provider level, the organizational level, and the system level with training, consultation, direct service funding, and utilization of uh, what we've developed called a medication first model, which I'll explain in a minute. Again, our primary goal here is to save lives. We can work backwards from that. We wanna promote meaning and fulfillment and thriving. But our target, our eye, has to be on the prize of saving lives. So our prior approach to the treatment of opiate use disorder, we relied on things like detox, residential and group therapy, overutilization of those services despite their lack of empirical support. We view addiction and opiate use disorder within an acute care lens rather than a chronic care lens, which it is. We need to deal with this long term. And we use effective medications like buprenorphine or methadone, rarely, if at all. We may use them as the last resort, as a carrot, so to speak, only if people try and fail multiple other approaches. We can't afford to do this anymore. Out with the old, in with the new. So how can we transform a system that is used to relying on these types of modalities? Perhaps we can borrow from another realm of public health that has tried to tackle a, a similarly, similarly vexing and a life altering challenge, and that is chronic homelessness. So any given night in the US, over half a million people define themselves as chronically homeless. That means they're living on the streets and haven't had a stable place to live for a while. The housing first approach to chronic homelessness addresses this by solving the homeless crisis with housing. You know, what an idea. The priorities of housing first are rapid rehousing, getting people connected to housing quickly, and permanent housing security, meaning you don't have to jump through a lot of hoops to obtain or retain this housing. So keep this in mind. Now, we do have parallel tools to address the opiate crisis that can be uh, borrowed from what we do with housing for homelessness. And those are medications for addiction treatment, also known as MAT. I don't love the phrase medication assisted treatment, which is where MAT comes from, because really if you look at all the evidence, it's not the medication that's doing the assisting, it's, it's everything else. So briefly, uh, the main medications that we talk about when we talk about MAT are methadone, which is the gold standard, been around since early 1970s. It's a full opioid agonist. You could think of it as like a bright light bulb in a light bulb socket. And uh, people have to go to opiate treatment programs to access it. So even though it's incredibly effective at reducing illicit drug use and retaining people in care and reducing mortality, it's hard to get. There are only a handful of OTPs in Missouri. They're largely in urban centers. Most of them are private pay. It's just not a realistic option for many people. So in comes buprenorphine. A partial opioid agonist came around in 2002. Sometimes I describe it as methadone light. Because it is safer and you can't really get high on it, people are more receptive to it. And the feds are a little looser with regulations. Still, it's super tightly controlled, but we can be more flexible in its prescribing. We can do it out of primary care and family medicine, addiction clinics in the community, hospital settings, wherever. Almost as effective as methadone uh, and more widely, uh, we're able to diffuse treatment more widely. Then there is naltrexone, it works differently. It's an antagonist, so it sits on top of those receptors and it doesn't let other things in. You might have heard of oral naltrexone, which is the pill form, basically no better than placebo. People don't take it. 
Then there's extended release naltrexone, which is Vivitrol, can be effective for a subset of the patients that we serve. Uh, it comes with its own quirks and it's difficult to get on and it requires a lot of uh, motivation to come back for uh, monthly shots. But again, for a subset of folks, it can be useful. So it's helpful to look at these, the role of medications in the treatment of OUD, like we look at the role of housing in the treatment of chronic homelessness. How do we get people access to these medications more efficiently and effectively? So what we did uh, through the state targeted response grant, which I'll highlight for one second, uh, this is a, a big bucket of money coming from SAMHSA, it's over $20 million coming to the state of Missouri through the Department of Mental Health in Jefferson City. Uh, and they work with myself at UMSL and my team to help administer, implement, and evaluate the STR grant. Uh, we have recently also been funded by the state opioid response grant, same idea, different acronym, that's $36 million. Uh, this, these are designed to close the treatment gap and get best practices out uh, to the people who need effective treatment. So we didn't want to just give out a bunch of money with no guidance or training or monitoring or accountability or framework. And that's what we really needed. It, it was a framework because DMH has been telling treatment programs to do MAT for a long time now, and we just haven't seen a real uptick. So we needed to sort of ground what we're talking about in some core principles. So what we really did was borrow from the housing first model to take what they're saying about homelessness to OUD. So we define the medication first model based on four key principles. One, people should get connected to medication as quickly as possible. Minimize the hoops. We do not need lengthy three-hour assessments or treatment planning sessions on day one when someone is sitting in our office in debilitating withdrawals, in chills, and sweats, and vomiting. That is not good data anyway. Let's get them to a doctor and get them medically stabilized. Okay, not too complicated. This one's been pretty well received. Second principle, maintenance pharmacotherapy should be delivered without arbitrary tapering or time limits. Basically, People should get medication for as long as it's working for them. For some people, this may be indefinitely. This was a sticky spot because in Missouri, like many other states, we saw many programs might be willing to use a medication like buprenorphine, but only for 10 days, or only for a month, or only for six months, or whatever. Those are arbitrary decisions, and we see them uh, held by top medical directors as well, and that that culture permeates an institution. So we really need to flip that on its head uh, and say you can stay on it for as long as it's working for you. Third, and, and this is a tough one, uh, individual psychosocial services should be offered but not required. Now this is a, a sticky one because this is not how our addiction treatment system was designed. We are designed to provide wraparound supports, heavy amounts of counseling, therapy, case management, you name it. Uh, but what we end up seeing is that those services are overutilized. We, we sort of deliver them through cookie cutter models, but in reality, they're not necessary oftentimes, at least not in the volume that they're prescribed. But what is necessary is continued access to medication. So if someone is not ready, willing, or able to engage in our therapy, we cannot hold the medication hostage. And that's what principle three is about. Principle four, do not discontinue medical treatment unless it is clearly worsening the patient's condition. Now this again seems like common sense, but it really manifests in rules that we hear about in programs all the time, like a three strikes and you're out for urine drug testing when people continue to use illicit substances. Again, we cannot ignore stimulants during this day, meth and other stimulants are on the rise, and Missouri is no exception. We see a ton of co-use of methamphetamine with heroin and fentanyl. But what is more dangerous than using methamphetamine with buprenorphine? Using methamphetamine with fentanyl. And that's really what we're setting people up to do if we kick them out of our clinics. So principle four uh, is about giving people second, third, fourth chances and working with them to retain them in care rather than kicking them to the curb. Which I will say, it's not like treatment programs are taking those decisions lightly. But uh, it, it, you know, they're incredibly clinically nuanced and they have to be. Um, and these need to be team decisions and it's 
it's really hard on the ground. I, I, I did one year in an opiate treatment program right after I left Mizzou, and that's what got me really interested in this field. Um, and uh, seeing how it plays out on a daily basis is uh, mind and heart wrenching. Our broad goals to accomplish our aims of saving lives and diffusing med first treatment protocols is first and foremost getting more buprenorphine waiver prescribers. Physicians have to go through a course. I won't get into the details here. Physicians assistants, nurses, same thing. Missouri is last in the nation in terms of our ratio of buprenorphine wavered providers to overdose deaths. We need more people stepping up, not just psychiatrists and addiction clinics. We need primary care to start doing this, hospitals, ob peds. If anyone wants to be a part of the solution, getting your buprenorphine waiver is the least you can do, in addition to giving naloxone. <laughs> Opiate use disorder should indeed be treated across care settings. As I alluded to, we cannot rely solely on our publicly funded addiction treatment programs who have been doing this before it was in the news and given lots of money and getting lots of attention. We need everybody to get on board and treat, quote, those people. Because guess what? Those people are already in your offices. These are the same people. Look at one hospital ED. Look at one primary care waiting room. People are there, and you can treat them there. But we do indeed need to change the standard of care with SUD treatment programs. That first slide I said with the bullets of detox, residential, et cetera, some of these things we need to remove from our vocabulary and we need to you know, do life-saving treatment with more intention and more uh, data-driven decision-making. So from the first nine months of STR treatment implementation, uh, we were able to treat nearly 1,400 people. You'll see in the next slides. Uh, Today, I just checked, we've treated, I think, over 5,500 people through STR. So uh, things are happening as we are talking here. This is a demographic breakdown. It's important to look at all of these columns, uh, specifically if you look at race. We need to talk about race when we talk about drug crises and how we handle them in this country. Though the uh, black population in Missouri is less than 12%, they are very much overrepresented in our overdose death population. Missouri is one of seven states where the rate of death among black individuals is much higher than the rate of death among white individuals for opiate overdose. This is not the national narrative that we often hear about, so we must pay attention. And luckily, the SDR treatment that we've been delivering, if you look at the demographic breakdown, it more closely aligns with the breakdown of people who are dying rather than just the general population of Missouri. It's important to talk about this because uh, need I remind us of our sordid history with how we've approached drug crises in the past, specifically the crack epidemic in the 80s and 90s. We responded with criminalization and mass incarceration, and we lost a generation of black males. And now here we are uh, where the, the face of the opiate crisis is largely white and we're responding with public health and compassion, and that's good, it's overdue, it's about time, but we need to make sure all populations have access to this evidence-based care that we're delivering. So where are we seeing this in Missouri? Again, the crisis is focused in the eastern region. St. Louis is absolutely the epicenter, and if you look at a heat map of where we've seen treatment admissions through STR, it closely aligns with that geographic uh, distribution. Then here, just some basic findings, uh, looking at medication utilization. Remember, this is one of our big goals, just increased use of medications for addiction treatment. Prior to STR, only 35% of people with opiate use disorder received medications in our publicly funded addiction treatment system. Through the STR program specifically, that number jumped to 85%. We want to see the orange bar get smaller and the gray bar get bigger. And indeed, that's what we're seeing. Specifically, if you break up that gray bar, it's driven by increased utilization of buprenorphine. We've really focused on that. Uh, and to this end, people are getting connected to medications faster. This was another thing. Remember, this is principle one. So on average, prior to STR, it took people six days from the day that they first enrolled in care to get connected with medication. How many people did we lose during those six days? We don't even want to think about it. Through SDR, on average, people are getting connected to medication same day. Also, let's look at utilization of psychosocial support services. 
people are getting less, fewer, rather, in the first 30 days, uh, largely because they are not required uh, of, through, for participation. If you look at uh, the relationship of psychosocial support services in the first 30 days, uh, these, are, these are exploratory analyses and effect sizes are small, but you do see that prior to STR, interestingly, there's a negative association with the volume of psychosocial support that people get in the first 30 days with their likelihood of being engaged in care at one month, three months, and six months. So breaking that down, what that means is sometimes the more we throw at people, especially during that vulnerable time of medical stabilization, the less likely they are to stick with us. So there was one exception to that, and we pulled out uh, peer support services specifically. So this is utilization of peer support recovery coaches, people with their own lived experience. Their work is incredibly valuable, especially in those first 30 days. And utilization of peer supports actually had a positive association with retention, underscoring the idea that not all psychosocial support services should be created equal. What do we see in terms of retention? We see improvement through STR at one month, three months, and six months into treatment. Remember, medication only works if you take it. Treatment only works if people stay engaged. Every piece of evidence that we have suggests the long people, longer people stay engaged in treatment, the better the outcomes. So we look at treatment retention essentially as a proxy for, for clinical outcomes. Clearly, keeping 36% of people at six months is not ideal. We have significant room for improvement, but it's over twice, as, uh, twice the retention rate as it was prior to STR. So take home findings here. Through STR, people are more likely to receive life-saving medication, more likely to get connected to that medication sooner, less likely to receive a ton of psychosocial support, and yet more likely to be retained in care at one, three, and six months. So what does that mean, practically speaking? Who cares about some bar graphs if it doesn't manifest on the ground? National data from, uh, from the CDC tells us that it, these efforts are working uh, in our state, not only the medication first model rollout, but uh, community saturation with naloxone, which is a couple, uh, uh, the focus of a couple other projects that I work on. So here, I'll help you uh, know where to look. If you look at the city and county of St. Louis, which account for nearly seven, 60 to 70% of our overdose deaths, you see if we focus there, we really can make a dent in our statewide numbers. The, the take home here is that between 2015 and 2016, death rates increased at a crazy amount, and that was largely due to the influx of fentanyl, which is still coming in uh, heavily on a daily basis. We decreased the number of deaths from 2016 to 2017 when all these efforts were ramping up. And you'll see that uh, that impact on the St. Louis region made an impact on the state overall. So from 2015 to 2016, Missouri was way above average, not in a good way. In terms of our increase in number of deaths, from 2016 to 2017, we were well below average. Again, any increase in deaths is unacceptable. We cannot rest, we must keep working, but hopefully we're maybe starting to see things plateau. And again, if you look uh, at what likely drove these numbers, it was targeted efforts into St. Louis City, uh, which has re really, really high rates of death. Uh, but we decreased death rate, uh, numbers of death by 10% from 2016 to 2017. So where does that leave us? We know that we can manage this opioid crisis, this poisoning crisis, but we need to do things differently than we have been. We need to rely on the evidence base, with, which tells us that saving lives comes from community saturation with naloxone and increased access to buprenorphine and methadone treatment. We know that we need to do it in ways that benefit everyone who lives with addiction, not just one population or people who use one type of drug. And we know that we need to use methods that keep people alive first and foremost. We all want people to thrive and have meaning and achieve full recovery, but we also know that people cannot achieve that recovery if they are dead. So that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Ah, these are all my extra slides. Go away.
Okay, okay. thank you. So uh, I'd like to invite the speakers, Kenny and Tim and Rachel, to come up to the stage, and then we'll have a brief period for questions before our break. And if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone over to you. Uh, this um, question is for our last uh, speaker, um, and um, you know you show some pretty good evidence of the effectiveness of butra, uh, buprenorphine, and, and methadone with regard to opioids. Um, you know we heard earlier uh, uh, this morning about other uh, types of problems, alcohol, uh, cannabis, uh, et cetera, and I'm just wondering if if, th if, there, if those drugs are also effective with those other problems or whether you're really looking at, at different drugs at that point? Not really is the answer. So uh, opiate use disorder is unique in that way. Um, it's an incredibly powerful addiction, but we have medications that are very effective. Uh, there has been some application of buprenorphine to uh, other drug use disorders. The evidence is not nearly as robust, um, but people are exploring it and uh, for methamphetamine and alcohol and other drugs. Sally, did you have Right, so, so there are other drugs that are used in uh, other drug use disorders, but buprenorphine and methadone specifically are mostly for opioids. Hello, my name is Sarah Graff. I'm the district director for U.S. Senator Roy Blunt. Um, we've seen a huge influx of dollars from the federal government um, for this crisis. Uh, what do you see is the next step um, as a federal response, and what um, are, is Missouri using another state as an example, or are there um, other states that are doing similar or yeah. more? Dennis, how much time do I have? <laughs> okay. So great question. Uh, there's a lot of conversation going on about this right now. I'm frantically sending off emails here in the front row. So actually, the UM system is going for another large grant opportunity to get at this exact question. We know what works. How come people aren't doing it? Or if we're doing it, how come it's not working like it's supposed to work? So there's a joint effort between NIH and SAMHSA to put out a whole bunch more money, but specifically to focus on implementation science research to diffuse communities with these treatments and best practices and figure out exactly what we can do to mobilize our provider workforce and our communities to tackle this. So that's the HEAL initiative through NIH, helping end addiction long term. Uh, many of us in this room are, are working on going for that. And Senator Blunt provided us with a gracious letter of support, actually. So I think that's that's one thing that we are, are looking at is this implementation science and community engagement focus. But you know, broader than that, um, you know, as the um, woman in the back mentioned this morning, discussion of prevention, I think this is uh, a really interesting, tough conversation when we talk about prevention. I'm not a prevention expert, uh, but we, we need to look at why people get addicted to drugs in the first place. It may not just be uh, solved by school education, right? But it is some systemic issues that we face in this society, uh, whether it's poverty or homelessness or inherited trauma or adverse childhood events. And I think we need to expand our focus from opioids and look from birth to death and look at other drugs of misuse as well. Other questions? Uh, my name is Nathan. I live in Joplin, uh, clinical supervisor for New Directions. Uh, a lot of my uh, clients are asking a question that I don't have an answer for. And the answer is, is that what happens to them if and when the finances stop? A lot of them are in that and they're depending upon that financial support and they're scared about what might happen. So what would be the best answer for that? Huh, okay, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, I lose sleep over this as well. Um, so what this gentleman's referring to is that he works at an STR treatment funded program and these are grant dollars and what happens when the grant dollars run out. This is why we need to focus on transforming our system of care. It cannot be limited to service dollars for one grant. We need to figure out how to make this sustainable at a state level. So we're working closely with DMH to change the reimbursement structure perhaps to an outcomes-based model, a capitated bundled rate where we incentivize clinical outcomes rather than the fee-for-service model that we currently utilize. 
Uh, unfortunately, finances drive a lot of this. Um, agencies are businesses, and they have to keep their lights on and pay their staff. So how it's one thing to incentivize best practice through grant dollars. It's another to write it into state regulation. Um, I know that's, that's not the answer that you want to give them. So what you can also tell them is that these publicly funded addiction treatment programs aren't going anywhere. They are the safety net addiction treatment provider to serve the Medicaid populations and the uninsured. They can keep going in new directions, uh, but there may be a day when your allocation uh, goes back down to what it was. Hopefully that won't happen until we've made enough of a dent in this crisis. I do not expect that the feds will stop sending funding our way while we're still seeing the death numbers that we're seeing. Other questions? Just as a reminder, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the day as well. OK, if there are no questions, we'll take a brief break um, and be back. Actually, it looks like if you come back at quarter chill, that will give us about a 10-minute break. Welcome back. I'm uh, excited to see you all uh, back in the room. Uh, now we're going to have uh, five-minute flash talks from five addiction researchers from a broad range of disciplines. And we'll start out uh, by introducing here Dr. Jeanette Porter, Assistant Professor of Strategic Communication in the Missouri School of Journalism at MU. Thank you so much, Dr. Arndt. Um, oh, good. We're half empty, which means no matter how badly I flub this, the, the, the reception, the, 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 the disaster can't be that big. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, the topic of this talk, or I should say the title of this talk, is actually not about what I'm doing right now, but it's about what I want to do next. So I don't have slides to show you about... Uh, percentages or molecules or modalities or any of that good stuff. This talk is actually about the world that you are all living in when you get up in the morning, but before you put on your white coat or your lanyard or your uh, access credentials. Um, it's about the conversation, sort of like a 50,000 feet view of the conversation that America has about addiction. It's the world that you live in. And the reason why it's important is because it's the world that Senator Blunt lives in. So when Dr. Winograd just had her extremely valuable conversation with Senator Blunt's aide, um, this, my talk is about um, what Senator Blunt has to deal with uh, when he goes to his colleagues in various <clears throat> groups and says, we really, I talked to this very dynamic doctor at UMSL and this is what we need. This dark diction is taken from a Kanye West song called Crack Music. And the, line, the last line of which is, this dark diction has become America's addiction. Those who ain't even black use it. Um, America's had successive waves of panics about substance use and abuse. Um, we've had varying ways in which we deal with it in terms of science and not science. Uh, but um, despite my youthful appearance, I am just old enough to remember the last heroin epidemic, which wasn't even really, in my memory at any rate, it was uh, not a disease of everybody. It was a disease of some people. It was a disease of those people. And I apologize for this very long quote, which I will actually read to you, but there's no recording for this. This is John Ehrlichman, who was Nixon's policy advisor, being interviewed by author Dan Baum in 1994. And he said, you want to know what this was really all about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily I repeat that, criminalizing both heavily. We could disrupt those communities, we could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. 
So you guys are all living in a world that is the residue of a war, a criminal uh, approach to a biomedical problem. And some of you in here who are a little younger maybe will remember this, right? Along with just say no, right, which um, all of you who do the science understand that this is completely not helpful. Along with just say no, this was the addiction conversation of the 80s and the 90s. If you use psychoactive substances, you were a bad person. Alcohol, well, you know, that was a tragedy, but uh, we managed. Some families broke up, but, you know, we managed. And uh, nicotine, of course, the, the uh, industry was busy telling us that nicotine wasn't addictive, so it wasn't a problem. And uh, some people couldn't handle these problems, true, but they were rare and they were not to be talked about. So today, um, I would like to, I'm sorry, I'd like to ask you, what does a junkie look like? What does a junkie look like? This is what a junkie looks like to a lot of people. These are not our people. These are not important people. We don't talk about these people. This gentleman is sitting on a sidewalk in front of a shopping cart. But I am actually suggesting that the mere presence of this conference means that maybe we are reaching a turning point similar to the one we reached for breast cancer in 1974. In the early 1970s, we didn't talk about breast cancer either, or cancer at all. It was just the C word, or it was mouth. It was just a sad shake of the head. Betty Ford shocked the nation with her openness, and in 1991, we had the pink logo, and about maybe 25 years later, the pink logo, everybody knows what it means. We talk about cancer openly, and we fight it openly, and we fund it heavily. When a junkie, which is that person that was on the sidewalk, becomes an addict, the addict looks like this. Today, the addict is your boss's son, or your aunt, or it's you. We are important, we exist, we talk about ourselves and our problems, and we're calling for solutions. When addiction stops being a character flaw or a moral marker and starts being a medical problem, we can start focusing on the mechanics of the problem and the solutions to the problem, which is what I sense all of you in this room are doing. I am so grateful for your work, and I hope that the answer to this question is yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and next up, we have Dr. Uh, Amber Hensley from Missouri S&T in Rolla, Associate Professor of Psychological Sciences. Hi, uh, so I'm Amber from s and I'm enjoying this symposium, as I think probably all of us are. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about campus traditions and event-specific substance use. Uh, so first off, what do we know? We know that college students are vulnerable uh, for problematic uh, drinking behaviors at specific events, things like spring break, 21st birthdays, well, what do we want to know? We want to know about potentially problematic substance use behaviors associated with campus-specific events, and does it differ between campuses? Well, why do we care? They're college kids. They party. We care because they are the emerging adults that Sandy talked about earlier and the consequences with regard to their development we care because 40% report blacking out and blackouts report ER visits. Females reported nearly a threefold increase in binge drinking, cannabis use, and riding with an impaired driver during spring break compared to the 30 days before. And there are other events besides just spring break or 21st birthdays that are potentially problematic and have negative consequences like tailgating, but not every campus tailgates. At s and we have a very long 
and unique tradition of celebrating St. Pat's. We begin six months prior. Yes, we take two days off from classes. In uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana State, they also have a very unique tradition when it comes to Mardi Gras, uh, extended celebration, two days off of classes. And so in a series of the first known studies, we compared two campuses with these very different traditions to determine if we could see between uh, campus differences in substance use and related problems. So first, uh, intent to drink, controlling for baseline differences in gender and heavy drinking. s and students said that they intend to drink more at St. Pat's than Mardi Gras. LSU said they intend to drink more at Mardi Gras than St. Pat's. What about expectation of your peers? s and students think that their peers are gonna drink more at St. Pat's than Mardi Gras. And again, the converse for LSU. They expect their peers to drink more at Mardi Gras. And what about afterwards? Indeed, we drank more than they did at St. Pat's than Mardi Gras. And they drank more at Mardi Gras than St. Pat's. But as a comparison event, we also assessed the intent and their expectations and their consumption at spring break. And there were no significant differences between the two campuses on any spring break variable. Looking at cannabis use, LSU used more cannabis during, during Mardi Gras. And contrary to our expectation, also St. Pat's. But of those s and students that use cannabis during St. Pat's, they experienced more cannabis-related problems than the LSU students, even though they were using less. Now, we know that there are other individual risk factors that can predict uh, drinking as well, not depicted on this slide, but in another study, we assessed intent expectation and consumption. But we also assessed impulsivity and sensation seeking. Again, controlling for baseline differences, the s and students reported the greater intent and expectation and consumption for St. Pat's than spring break. However, their impulsivity and sensation seeking did not predict drinking for either St. Pat's or spring break, suggesting that those students may have decided a priori or more intentionally about uh, their drinking for those specific events rather than impulsively or irrationally. And so if event-specific behaviors are not as impulsive or as rational as this party animal stereotype that we have, then campus officials and uh, student organizations can join and collaborate together to develop campus-specific, tradition-specific preventative efforts that gradually roll out and ramp up as the event approaches aim to help reduce potentially problematic substance use behaviors among our college students. I'd like to thank my collaborators at other institutions, and I'd like to point out that we have the potential for wonderful collaborations. We have four different campuses in a very unique system. And finally, thank you to my wonderful s and undergrad research assistants. Thank you so much. Next up, Dr. Bruce Barth. Hello, Frederick A. Middlebush, uh, Middlebush Professor of Psychological Sciences at MU. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, I normally don't read my slides, but given the time uh, today, uh, that's kind of what's going to happen. Uh, so my presentation today is going to focus on what we can learn about addiction risk from measures of brain responses to drug-related cues, uh, especially alcohol-related cues. Um, as uh, was mentioned earlier today, one of the first questions we have to ask about addiction is why do people use drugs? Um, well, one of the first reasons that people use drugs, in addition to lots of societal and, so and social level factors, is that they produce feelings that people like. Um, but over time, as drug use intensifies, uh, 
Motivation to pursue and use drugs is driven less by liking the feelings that they produce and more by wanting the drug. In this context, when I say wanting, uh, it's defined in terms of what someone goes after, how much they're willing to kind of work for it, and how much they crave it. And although liking and wanting might seem like one and the same, they often, and they often do go together, in fact, liking and wanting are distinct phenomena associated with distinct neural circuits. Uh, for a long time, addiction scientists also thought that liking a drug's effects and wanting to use the drug were basically the same thing. Uh, both liking and wanting are mediated by dopamine circuits in the brain. But starting about 25 years ago, scientists studying rodents began to discover that, in fact, levels of brain dopamine were unrelated to how much the rodents appeared to like the drugs, but nevertheless still predicted their pursuit and consumption of those drugs. So based on findings like this, a scientist called Terry Robinson and his colleague Kent Barrage at the University of Michigan developed incentive sensitization theory, which attempts to explain why drugs can be wanted or craved despite their often negative consequences. One of the most fascinating uh, ideas to me related to incentive sensitization theory is that cues that are present in the environment when drugs are consumed can take on the reward value of the drugs themselves. So when those cues are later encountered, they can trigger wanting for the drug, often experienced as a feeling of craving, which can then lead to pursuit and consumption of that drug. Um, we know from a lot of research across uh, many of the different uh, substances of abuse that people with addiction display much stronger responses to the presence of drug-related cues than do people who are not addicted. This finding generally is assumed to reflect differences in drug exposure. So that is, addicts have higher rates of exposure, and therefore they have developed stronger QE activity responses. But it's also possible that some of the difference is due to factors that predate addiction and that increase risk for developing addiction in the first place. So in my lab, we are interested in the possibility that differences in QE activity responses might reveal pre-existing differences in susceptibility to incentive sensitization. So in other words, we think people differ in terms of their vulnerability to attributing incentive salience to drug-related cues. Um, in the animal literature, this difference is referred to as uh, uh, goal tracking versus sign tracking. A goal tracking uh, animal, once a, an association is learned between a cue, so the presence of this lever, and a reward, some sucrose delivered in this dish, just goes after the, the reward once the cue is delivered. In contrast, a sign tracker, when the cue is delivered, actually goes after the cue and engages with it as though it was the food itself, as though it has its own rewarding value. So we're trying to determine if there's a similar kind of pre-existing vulnerability in people. Uh, one of the candidate phenotypes that we're looking at is, uh, as has been mentioned before, low sensitivity or differential sensitivity to alcohol's effects. So these are folks who need to use more in order to feel the kinds of effects that they're after. Um, we know that this is a, a potent risk factor for developing alcohol use disorder, but we really don't know much about the mechanisms uh, that, that link low sensitivity with AUD. Um, so in my lab, we're studying this phenotype by exposing people to pictures that are either alcohol-related or not, and measuring their brain responses using event-related potentials. You can see here, this is from one of our previous studies, low-sensitivity folks have a much stronger brain response to alcohol-related cues uh, than do higher-sensitivity people. Uh, one of the problems with all of the kind of previous work on this topic is that images of alcohol have pre-existing associations, and so we might just be capturing some kind of difference in exposure when we do these kinds of studies. So we wanted to know if we could basically condition incentive value for novel cues in the lab in humans. Uh, so we did that using a task uh, in which we presented people with very neutral colored squares, paired those with odors using a, a device called an olfactometer, and then we wanted to uh, basically measure the brain response to these colored squares once the association has been learned. Um, as you can see here, what we found is, in fact, that among the low sensitivity subjects, uh, their brain response to these color squares that have been paired with alcohol increases over exposures, whereas their higher sensitivity counterparts show a decreased brain response uh, to alcohol-related color squares. And contrast to that, the high sensitivity people show more of an incentive response to the sweets, uh, the sweet-paired 
color squares. So just wrapping up, low sensitivity seems like a promising trait marker for incentive salient sensitization in people. Uh, ERPs, especially the P3, seem to be a good tool for examining this question. And I'll just briefly mention some ongoing work with my colleague Tom Piasecki, where we're looking to track changes in markers of an incentive salience over time as a function of alcohol involvement. And uh, finally, just want to acknowledge the uh, uh, other colleagues who have been involved in this work, as well as my funding from the NIAAA. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mahesh Thakur uh, for the professor of, uh, professor of Neurology, the School of Medicine, MU. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dennis, Jill, and Kim for helping me and inviting me. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about alcohol. We, you know, alcoholism is difficult to prevent. So how do we treat alcoholism? And one of the ways to treat alcoholism is to develop uh, you know, efficacious therapies to treat symptoms. And one of the most important symptoms of alcoholism is um, insomnia. When you, if you're an alcoholic, you can't sleep. It's very difficult for you to fall asleep. Also, it's very difficult to maintain your sleep. So imagine this now, alcoholic is not sleeping. So what he's going to do? He's going to go back and drink alcohol. Now, sleep insomnia is a DSM-5 criterion for the diagnosis of alcoholic. It's also a predictor of relapse. So it is very important that we understand how alcohol affects sleep and find out methods or you know, mechanisms so that we can treat alcohol, is, alcohol uh, sleep asso disruptions associated with uh, alcohol. So we, our lab has been doing research for about 10 years now. And we have found that if alcohol dependent rodents have insomnia-like symptoms, and they also have a reduction in um, acetyl histones, which are a marker of epigenetic changes occurring in the brain. Very specific areas in the brain which are important for sleep regulation. So then we ask that, can we treat this sleep disruptions which occur in alcoholics, mice, by using this HDAC inhib inhibitor, which is tricostatin A. Now this is a drug which has been recently approved by FDA to treat cancer. So, with that in mind, we started some experiments, and we used uh, the you know the C57 BL6 mice, and we exposed them to alcohol, chronic alcohol, and really make them alcoholic by exposing them to chronic alcohol for 21 days. And we looked at their sleep-wake pattern during while they were drinking alcohol, and also we looked at during withdrawal for seven days. And so we performed two experiments. In the first experiment, we we wanted to see whether they do develop in insomnia and what was the stage of the insomnia. The second experiment we did was we looked at the, you know, whether we can give this drug TSA and see whether we can cure insomnia or treat insomnia. So here are some results. You know, the first slide there shows you, the, um, it shows you the time to fall asleep. And you can see here, during active drinking period, the animals, and as you drink more and more, it takes longer and longer for them to fall asleep. And then if you look at the, you know, the amount of time they are awake, at days five, days 10, days 15, days 20, all the days they are, they are awake. Um, so showing that they have severe insomnia during drinking period. Now, what happens during withdrawal? Again, the same thing. They take very long time to go to so sleep, and they are con constantly awake, especially, you know, during this time. By, Day five and day seven, which is almost half the period of insomnia, where we don't get alcohol, they try to recover from alcoholism. Now, can we treat this with TSA? So what we did was we gave them TSA systemic 2.2 milligrams per kilogram, and, and look at the difference, the time to follow. So this is the guy who got vehicle treatment instead of TSA, and this is the, this is the guy who got the drugs. So this group got you know, the vehicle, this group got the drug, and look at the difference they fall asleep very rapidly. So this tells us that if you give TSA, you can at least treat, you know, time to fall asleep is reduced. Now what about time to awake? Again, you can see that it almost normalizes. The time, you know, amount of time spent in wakefulness normalizes after you give the drug. And um, this is during drinking period on day uh, 15 and day 20. And 
The same thing happens with withdrawal. You can completely cure his symptoms of insomnia during withdrawal, both time to fall asleep and time to stay asleep. So based on this evidence, we suggest that mice exposed to chronic alcohol consumption display severe and protected insomnia, uh, both, during severe, both during active drinking and during withdrawal. And if you give them, or if you treat them with, with TSA, they disnormalize their sleep wakefulness. So the next step is what? Is next step is, can we take this to the clinic? And can we treat insomnia? If we treat insomnia, at least it will be preventing relapse occurring in alcoholics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is uh, Shivendra Shakla, the Margaret Proctor Mulligan Endowed Professor in Medical Research, School of Medicine, MU. Thank you. Good almost noon, everybody. And I would also like to thank um, Dr. Ken Sher and the entire organizing committee for inviting me and for putting up this very exciting show. So I'm going to talk about binge alcohol drinking in next few minutes. Um, and this binge drinking is really is a menace to liver and beyond. As you know, alcohol is the best known liver toxic chemical to human beings. And to give you in this few minutes of flash talk, I thought I should put up a flash bomb image. <laughs> Alcohol action is like a cluster bomb. And being a pharmacologist who is more molecular in research, what you can see is alcohol is metabolized by the cell and organs in, into various entities. And all of these can really influence this injury part. So one has to really handle all these complexities when dealing with the alcohol um, induced uh, changes or injuries. And there's also a dark side of alcohol. Overall, it is the worst drug. Alcohol is more harmful to health and the society as a whole than many illegal drugs, including cannabis, LSD, and STC. And this is really a report which was published in uh, Lancet. The other dark side of alcohol is the staggering economic burden to the nation. Alcohol abuse costs to the nation ab about $250 billion per year. And you can see the B have highlighted. And then binge alcohol alone costs $191 billion. So this is really a, an economic problem as well. And this is widespread. Every state has this problem. And let's, let's look at the show me state, which is here. It's about 20% of the population binge drink. So if I translate that to the numbers, we have 1.4 million, about 1.4 million Missourians who binge drink. So this is really a problem. And this is a problem which is on the rise, as you can see here from 98 onwards till as they show this, there is a tendency, there's a trend for increase in binge drinking. So you may be wondering what is binge drinking. We have heard this term quite a bit. It's a rapid, heavy consumption or episodic heavy drinking. And according to NIAAA, which is the Alcohol Institute of NIH, it is defined as five drinks for men and four for women in two to three hours. That increases blood alcohol to 0.08% or higher. And 0 0.08 is the common legal limit. And modes of alcohol consumption, so besides binge drinking, we also have chronic alcohol consumption and chronic followed by binge alcohol, which is the most injurious because chronic alcoholics, when they binge, then the, everything is compounded and amplified in terms of injury. And to what we have been doing in our lab is investigating the molecular pharmacology of alcohol actions in liver and how binge influences it. To give a glimpse of the changes, and there are so many parameters we have monitored, 
I've shown here a slide of liver histopathology of rat livers. And these are rats which were treated chronically with ethanol or by binge or by chronic followed by binge. And this is the normal control, which is a smooth appearance of uh, liver tissue. If you see in chronic ethanol, you have these lipid droplets, fatty droplets, which increase. So does binge uh, treated rats. Here you can again see these lipid droplets. Look at the last one, which is the chronic ethanol followed by binge. Huge, large macrostatis, which is the large lipid droplets which are formed. And this is about 10 to 15 times higher compared to control. So you can see that binge itself is a very dangerous thing, especially in uh, chronic alcoholics. So there is a domino effect of this. This is the initiation of the process. And as you know, <clears throat> liver is the metabolic powerhouse of the body. Alcohol consumption alters many chemicals generated by liver. And then these chemicals get into circulation and affect the function of heart, kidney, and brain. And that is what I've shown here is schematically to make this story simple, is that there is a cross-organ tract where ethanol metabolic or epigenetic alterations in intestine can change permeability in liver, steatosis, which is a fatty liver, and lead, can lead to the cancer. And these liver, damaged liver, can change the mediator generation, which can go into systemic affecting brain, heart, and kidney, which can be reflected in addiction, hypertension, and vascular disease. So when we talk about addiction, it's not only brain effect, rather many organs are also immediately affected by that addiction process. Finally, I would like to, if uh, you need to have additional information <clears throat> on binge drinking, there is a, a special issue of the NI General Alcohol Research, current reviews, which I co-edited recently, and it is entirely focused on to binge drinking predictors, patterns, and consequences, and this may be a good starting point. Thank you. So now we'd like to invite our Flash Talk speakers back up to the stage for, to take any questions that you all may have. So I re realized that, was a, that we covered a lot of ground in that short amount of time, but uh, we, we do have a few minutes for questions. But if we're too hungry and too blown away by what we just heard, we can certainly pause here and, oh, we did, I'm sorry. I, I have a sleep-related question. And I wonder if um, you've uh, demonstrated or evaluated uh, whether uh, change in uh, or improvements in sleep in the animals have altered subsequent uh, uh, ad lib drinking? Uh, no, we have not done that yet. But, you know, we are in the process of finishing this and doing that. Because that's the main important thing. Can we in improve their sleep and then do they reduce drinking? We don't know that yet. Yeah, I guess this is uh, for Amber. Uh, is on any of those campuses these events uh, have uh, prevention uh, activities planned around them. And uh, what are they, and if there's any evaluation of them, how effective are they? We do have simultaneous at s and um, alcohol-free events that occur during the 10-day period prior to uh, St. Pat's, which is when it really, really ramps up the follies. Uh, they are not, um, there's not as many of them, uh, is my understanding. Um, and they um, have historically not been as well, um, uh, kind of like word of mouth known about. And I am not aware of any sort of assessment 
uh, of those. Uh, but there are some, and our Prevention Coalition on campus is trying to increase the awareness and get the word out for those students who want to attend alcohol-free St. Pat's celebrations. Ms. Uh, both of you, Dr. Sukla and Dr. Thakkar, so uh, you guys saw the impact of alcohol on the society. But there is substantial literature, really, and a lot of talk going on, have been going on that one glass of wine is good for the health, really. So what is your take on that, especially with the alcohol problem, what is going on in the country? Well, that's a good question because uh, it can be debated whether that one, uh, one uh, glass of wine, if you continue to drink later, it can become many glass of wine. So that has been the issue. And uh, there is some cardio protection studies are some anti-cancer effects, especially in breast cancer, maybe in some in diabetes, but those are very controversial the way I view. And overall, alcohol is bad and is injurious. So I cannot say that uh, alcohol is good in any way, except maybe when it is used topically or it is used for other reasons. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just want to add to that, that you know, if you have a glass of wine, I'm pretty sure that you'll have a very good night's sleep. The problem is what this is short lasting, because first half of the night you'll have very nice sleep, but then you'll be awake. Because you'll have to go to the bathroom, you know. So, and then it's, the ball starts, you know. That, that's where you start going down. Thank you all very much. Um, please join us for lunch upstairs. Uh, there's a lunch buffet. And we'll look forward to seeing you back at 1245 for Dr. Robert Messing, who will give the afternoon keynote. On your way to lunch, please stop by the mezzanine area to check out posters featuring the research by MU students. And if you have any questions about uh, continuing education credits, uh, please see the staff at the registration table. Thank you. Welcome everybody back from lunch, and uh, we're really excited, uh, not just about how uh, well uh, the morning session went with such diverse uh, uh, presentations, but we're equally excited about uh, the afternoon. And we're going to start with uh, who is currently the director of the Wagoner Center for Alcohol and Addiction Research senior advisor to the Dean on Research Strategy at the Dell Medical School, and a professor of neuroscience, neurology, and pharmacology and toxicology uh, at the University of Texas. And you know, one thing I wanted to highlight, it's not very often that uh, a new medical school opens uh, in the United States, and particularly at a major uh, public university. And when the administrators who were looking to find out who would be a good person to kind of bring in from the outside to really help, because there really was nobody, I guess, on the inside, to, to shepherd this uh, critically important uh, mission, uh, they went to Bob. And I think one of the, or I should say, a, a few of the reasons uh, they went to Bob is the diversity of his interests, both as a basic neuroscientist, uh, as well as somebody who could uh, uh, appreciate uh, the clinical world that a med school is based upon, and multidisciplinary work that pulls together uh, people with diverse backgrounds. Uh, before coming to Texas, uh, he was a professor of neurology at UCSF, a senior investigator and then director of the Ernest Gallo uh, Clinic and Research Center. And he was the founding director of NIAAA's funded Alcohol Center for Translational Genetics uh, at UCSF uh, until he was recruited away as vice provost for biomedical sciences 
to help develop uh, the medical school. Uh, I was interested to learn that his uh, BA was in history. So he's going to be talking about very molecular things today, but uh, obviously comes from a diverse intellectual uh, background. And uh, this is at Stanford, and then he stayed on there where he received his uh, medical degree and got specialized training in internal medicine at University of Virginia and neurology at UCSF where he stayed on uh, for the faculty, uh, to join the faculty. Uh, the goal of his research is to identify potential drug targets for treating substance use disorders and chronic pain through the uh, study of signal transduction and circuit mechanisms that underlie these disorders. Um, you know, his uh, cutting edge research, uh, at least, uh, what he'll be talking about, is how to identify important targets uh, for alcohol treatment and, or in other drug treatments, I assume. Um, and uh, you know, he brings with him an extraordinarily broad understanding of the landscape of research, not just in uh, alcohol and addictions, uh, but of the life sciences more generally. Uh, one thing that really impressed me is a number of years ago, I was invited to give a talk uh, at the Gallo Center. Uh, there was, uh, I guess, a trainee there who was interested in some of the work I was doing. And uh, I was really, really nervous. I mean, I'm always nervous uh, you know, before giving a talk because I looked through the list of all the investigators there and none of them studied humans. Uh, you know, there were people who did in vitro work, there were some rodent models, there were people who did their work with nematodes and fruit flies. And uh, I was studying college students, you know, and uh, so uh, I had a fair amount of apprehension, would these people really care at all about what I do? And it was so refreshing to meet with this group of basic biomedical scientists who were actually engaged and interested and tried to find points of contact for the kinds of work that uh, I was doing. And I really attributed that open intellectual environment a lot to uh, Bob's scientific uh, leadership. So if for, for these reasons, it's a total pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Bob Messing to open up the afternoon session. Am I on? Oh, you, are you hooked up? No. Oh. Is that on? Oh, you're okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So, Ken, thanks a lot for inviting me, and I'm very, very pleased to be here. And I've really enjoyed the morning. Uh, your talk, Sandy, was great, and, and the other ones that followed as well. Uh, and I think this is a, a very important meeting. I know it's an important meeting for you, you all in Missouri. I'm practicing my Texan. Um, and uh, what really impresses me is, is the human research here, which uh, at University of Texas, I'm trying to foster connections between a very robust uh, preclinical research group in the Wagner Center uh, for Alcohol and Addiction Research with a very robust research in the social sciences in the, uh, the School of Social Work and also in the psychology department. And you know, it's a big university, 53,000 students, lots of faculty, and it's amazing how people don't talk to each other. So I'm trying to build this center as a more inclusive ecosystem for use of a business term, which I don't like, but I used it. Uh, I guess I've been in administration too long. All right, so I'm going to talk to you today about drugs for alcohol use disorder. And it's, a, it's an interest of mine that's gone on for many years. So I, I, I show this slide just to start off to tell you that alcohol use disorder is the most prevalent use disorder and still remains the most prevalent use disorder even with the opioid toxic crisis that we have. And will probably remain so into the future worldwide. Um, that being the case, it's, uh, it, it also is the most expensive single use disorder uh, next to smoking. And, um, and drug abuse as a whole is, uh, is, thir is sort of uh, secondary to it. When you break it out into individual drugs, they're all dwarfed by these two. What's interesting is that the funding models don't necessarily follow these numbers. So NIDA, which encompasses all of these, gets about twice the uh, amount of dollars in its budget. 
compared with the NIAAA, even though this is a much bigger problem. And unfortunately, smoking doesn't really have a home. It's sort of scattered amongst multiple institutes, a lot of it being uh, cancer-based research funded by NCI. So we don't necessarily, you know, in an economic and social sense, deal with our problems equitably where we put our monies. So that's my plug for the NIAAA. Um, so one thing I want to mention is that alcohol and other substance use disorders have about a 40 to 50 percent risk, uh, genetic risk. So this is a setup for the next speaker. Um, and uh, you know that most of the data for alcohol is actually in males, but it's about a 50 percent of the variance is a genetic risk. And here's a, a family tree over here where this is the uh, paternal side of the family and there's no history of alcohol use disorder. The maternal side, not a lot of history about what was going on in the parent, in the grandparents, but uh, the grandmother was known to be kind of a difficult human being. Um, there were uh, three siblings who had alcohol use disorder. One died during training in World War II. Another one wound up on the streets and was never heard of. And the third one became a mother to uh, three siblings, one of whom uh, the mother and the daughter suffered terribly from depression. And the, uh, the brother, the older brother here, um, was uh, uh, quite aware that he could drink anybody under the table. So he was a very low responder to alcohol. And the other person over here would fall asleep just like the father and many of the siblings with one drink. Uh, so this is my family tree. <laughs> and I'm sure several of you have family members or know of a close friend with multiple family members who have suffered from the problem because it's common. Uh, how do genes influence risk of alcohol use disorder? Well, they can uh, change the, uh, the psychopharmacology. So, like I told you, my brother knows he can drink anybody under the table and made a conscious decision just not to drink. But he has an innate tolerance or a, a, you know, a, a enhanced uh, insensitivity, I guess, to alcohol. Um, and that, that seems to be an inherited trait. What hasn't been really uh, investigated as much is the opposite, which I actually inherited from my father. I'm, my father was known as One Drink Willie. He'd go to somebody's house and he'd start snoring after one drink. Um, there are personality types, which has been mentioned, you know, risky behavior, sensation seeking, uh, extroverts, uh, you know, the frat boys, that sort of thing, uh, people who are impulsive and will be uh, subject to peer pressure and dares to, to drink and chug beers, et cetera. There's psychopathology associated with high risk, in particular depression and bipolar disorder as a prime example, but also antisocial uh, personality and externalizing personality disorders. And then finally, there, there's a physiologic uh, uh, genetics that actually, for the most part, prevent people from developing alcohol use disorder. And the most uh, robust genetic variant that does this are in these two Enzymes, alcohol dehydrogenase and acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. High activity ADH leads to an increased production of acetaldehyde, as does uh, a nearly inactive or null version of this uh, ALDH2 enzyme. And this compound, when it builds up, causes uh, flushing, uh, fast heart rate, nausea, headache. A at very low doses, it's, it's thought to be quite rewarding, actually, if you, if you you know, do questionnaires on people. They say they just drink a little bit and it does them really well. They drink a little too much, they feel sick. And this is a negative, very, very much a negative risk factor for alcohol use disorder. The other genetics, though, is not. I mean, most of the other gene variants, they have very small effect sizes and they're kind of hard to track through populations. Um, not only are humans uh, carriers of variants that confer risk or lack of risk, Mice and other rodents do as well. And you can look at inbred mouse strains and put them in a two-bottle choice drinking uh, uh, procedure where they can drink either water or an alcohol-containing solution and measure how much they drink. One person has already mentioned C57 black 6J mice, which are lushes. They drink like crazy. And down here, people have used as, a, as an extreme uh, different uh, strain, DBA2J mice, which don't like to drink at all. And people have done crosses of these inbred lines and tried to track genes through the uh, interbred uh, recombinant lines, inbred lines. <clears throat> now, in addition to there being a genetics for risk, 
there also is the fact that drugs change the brain. And alcohol, like other drugs of abuse with repeated use, cause the nervous system to actually try to adapt to the presence of the drug. And in those adaptations, which I would call maladaptations, there's some sort of a feed-forward mechanism that occurs which promotes further drug use. So this has been um, sort of graphically illustrated in two ways. One is a linear model um, where, uh, and this was talked about already in one of the short talks, where liking and the intoxication phase of the drug with repeated use goes to actually wanting the drug. It's kind of an ab aberrant memory response. You also develop tolerance to the uh, pleasurable effects of the drug, so you have to use more of it to get, to get the pleasure. And then eventually you get dependence, and there's a shift to being uh, unhappy when you don't have the drug. So you actually you go from liking to wanting to needing the drug just to feel normal. And that occurs particularly with alcohol and with opiates. Um, it, it's been put in a cycle here by George Kube and others. Uh, it's called the uh, addiction cycle, where you have a binge intoxication phase that gives way to, as the people become dependent, to a reward deficit and stress surfeit uh, condition known as this uh, negative affect withdrawal phase where you need the drug to even feel normal. And eventually, alcohol damages the brain and you lose executive function, you get deficits of judgment. And these have been mapped to different circuits and different brain regions and some different neuropeptides and neurotransmitters. So uh, drugs change the brain. And there is, there is some risk and individual differences as to how dramatically they do change the brain. And there also is a variation on which one of these kind of behavioral phenotypes drives the uh, desire to drink amongst different people. So there are some people who will tell you that they just love to drink because they love the feeling of being intoxicated. Uh, there was a Bill Moyers television series many years ago, maybe 20 years ago, on addiction. And I remember him interviewing one guy who was a, uh, a sober alcoholic who said that just a drink will just make him feel fantastic. Those people tend to get excited by alcohol. They, they tend to uh, have a pretty high tolerance innately. And they just go for this binge intoxication phase. And college kids who are relatively resistant to the sedative effects will do this. They're known as reward drinkers. And at the other extreme, people who uh, don't feel good at all without the drink, those are relief drinkers. Generally, these are younger people. Generally, these are older people. And there's a spectrum in between. And it's worthwhile remembering just this behavioral phenotype categorization, because I'll get to it with, with personalizing medication therapy. So the mainstay of therapy, because the drugs aren't great, and I'll get into that in a minute, the mainstay has been behavioral therapy. So this is very different than opioid addiction, where you know, the drugs actually can replace the, uh, the addiction pretty well, and you can maintain people on very specific opioid agonists or partial agonists. So for alcohol use disorder, behavioral therapy is the mainstay. And probably the most successful are cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing. And we have somebody at UT Austin, uh, Mary Velasquez, who has been a big proponent of this and has published on this. Um, there is medication-assisted therapy for alcohol use disorder, and it truly is assisted therapy here rather than primary. And the traditional routes to discovering these drugs have either been just by accident or some knowledge and some deductive reasoning about the pharma known pharmacology of alcohol and a drug that might mimic that, or by accident discovering that people on psychotropic drugs actually are a little bit better in their drinking, and so they're tried in, in, in other alcoholic, uh, other patients with alcohol use disorder who don't necessarily have that psychiatric disorder. So there are three FDA-approved drugs, disulfuran, naltrexone, and encamprosate, and then a few effective off, but off-label drugs, and then some drugs that have been talked about a lot more recently, but it's uncertain as to whether they're effective. And I'm just going to go through these. Uh, I realize the talk says new therapies, but I think I need to review the old. So disulfuran was found in the, uh, in the early 40s quite by accident amongst workers making uh, synthetic rubber that when they went to the bar after, after work in, in Denmark, they, uh, they found that they were, got sick if they drank. And uh, Danish chemists then uh, 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 isolated the active compound, and it was this disulfuram. Uh, and 
what it does is if you take it and you drink, you feel sick. And so what the, the mechanism of action is it reduces uh, drinking by fear of punishment if you do drink. And what it does is it inhibits alcohol, aldehyde dehydrogenase, which I had shown you in a previous slide, with the, negative, with the green uh, frowny face. Um, it, uh, it has been reviewed uh, recently in a, in a paper in JAMA, and I would recommend this paper. This is a very good meta-analysis of multiple drugs uh, for alcohol use disorder. And it actually, uh, when looked across two trials with almost 500 people, it really didn't have a significant difference in outcome uh, for return to any drinking. And I think the problem is it doesn't target any of the core phenomena of the addiction cycle that I had shown you earlier. Uh, also, it has a problem in that if people drink a lot while they're on it, it can be fatal. So what happens is if they want to drink, they stop taking the drug, wait a day, and then they start drinking and uh, it may cause liver toxicity in some people. So it's not a great drug, probably would never get approved in this day and age by the FDA. Uh, now, Trexone is, is uh, probably the most widely used drug in the United States. It's an opioid receptor antagonist, and there is logic to using this for, uh, for blunting the rewarding effects of alcohol. There is good imaging evidence for endorphin release in the brain with alcohol, with, with either drinking or having an alcohol injection in humans. Um, it is therefore most effective in people who are actively drinking because it blunts the rewarding response to alcohol. And it seems to be uh, more effective in people with, uh, who are ham family history positive uh, if they have strong craving, in other words, the reward drinkers. And um, that led to some studies looking at, whoops, looking at its, uh, its use, particularly in genetic variants, and I'll talk about that later because of the family history positive uh, finding. Um, it, it does have some limitations in that it actually has a small effect size. So there have been many, many studies. And again, in this JAMA uh, review, the end value here is you know, almost 3,000 people. Uh, the risk difference was you know, almost 10%. So in other words, compared with the placebo, 10% more people uh, had uh, a, re, uh, a lower return to heavy drinking, and uh, the percent of uh, drinking days was 5% uh, less. So, I mean, five days less. So it has a modest effect over a population study. Um, the problem is that it has a very limited duration of action. It only has a one to two hour half-life. So some people actually take it if they're feeling craving, and they'll take it before they go out in a social situation. Maybe that's its most effective use, but that's not what it's sanctioned for. Um, and it has some adverse effects. It has some hepatotoxicity and makes people feel kind of dysphoric and, and nausea and fatigued. So some people stop taking it because of that. The other major drug is a camprosate, which most of, the, most of its use is, is, I mean, it is used in the United States, but it's more popular in Europe. More of the trials that were originally done on it were positive in Europe. It's not known exactly how it works. Uh, most of the evidence favors that it interferes with signaling in the neurotransmitter glutamate through three or four different mechanisms. Uh, there is an increase in glutamate signaling in, in various brain regions in, during alcohol dependence. And so it's thought to blunt that. It's been approved to, to sustain abstinence in people who are abstinent already at the initiation of therapy. And it's a pretty safe drug. It's well tolerated, doesn't interact with a lot of other drugs that are used uh, for uh, uh, behavioral modification. Uh, it does have the side effect of diarrhea because you, you have to take a lot of it. The dose is uh, basically six tablets a day, each uh, 333 milligrams. So it's quite an osmotic, osmotic load on your gut. But again, like naltrexone, it has a small effect size. Um, and uh, a, a very similar risk difference and a very similar number needed to treat to see an effect. And uh, the only contraindication is if you have severe renal impairment. But it's a pretty safe drug, just not terribly effective. So people have gone to look for additional medications just because of these kind of crummy effect sizes. And the three that have uh, gotten the most attention are, are nal nalmethine, varenicline, and topiramate. Nalmethine is another opioid antagonist, but it, it has a little bit different mechanism in that it's a partial agonist at one of the opioid receptors, the kappa opioid receptor, which is thought to mediate some of the aversive properties of opiates. And so it may shift the valence of alcohol drinking uh, 
uh, a little bit towards an aversive state is the theory of that. Uh, it appears more effective than naltrexone in reducing drinking in rats that are dependent. Um, and, but it's, uh, it, its effect size is really no, not much better than naltrexone. In the few studies that have been done, it uh, does have a lo longer half-life than naltrexone. So if you wind up with side effects, there's a little bit more of a problem in that the drug's not going to go away as fast. The company that makes this uh, makes a tablet for use in Europe, but it, they're not going to go in front of the FDA. They have no plans to make, make it available in the U.S. It is available in an injectable form for opioid overdose, but not for, uh, not for alcohol use disorder. But, you know, you might see people in Europe coming with those tablets. People do take this when they feel craving before they go out in a social situation. Varenicline is a very interesting drug. It's a uh, partial agonist at several nicotinic receptors and is the most effective smoking cessation drug on the market right now. Uh, it was thought to maybe be effective for alcohol use disorder because the, there's a very high co-occurrence of both addictions. And, uh, and there are several candidate genes, uh, risk genes, that are touted to be risk genes for both addictions. It reduces ethanol consumption uh, in, in rodents, and so it's been tried in humans in a lot of small clinical trials which showed an, a, a modest effect. There have been two larger uh, randomized clinical trials. One uh, sanctioned by the NIAAA had 200 smokers and non-smokers, so it was both groups with AUD, and it reduced the percentage of heavy drinking days with a, with a fairly decent effect size. Um, and then there's a more recent randomized trial run out of Yale. Stephanie O'Malley was the lead author. And it only reduced uh, the percentage of heavy drinking days in men. Not in women, but there were only 39 women in that study. So I would not venture to say it's ineffective in women, but, uh, but it seems to be effective, in, maybe more effective in men. There are more studies ongoing. It does have some side effects in some people, but they're generally mild. And I think this is a promising drug uh, for, for uh, trying on patients, particularly if they're smokers. Uh, the, last, uh, the last one that's been touted a lot, um, particularly by the group at uh, Pencil University of Pennsylvania, is topiramate, or Topamax. And it's an anticonvulsant that has uh, several mechanisms of action, but two of them are is it enhances GABA-A receptor function and it inhibits glutamate receptor function. And that's very reminiscent of what alcohol acutely does as well. So it's, if you will, it's kind of an alcohol mimetic. It's like replacement therapy for alcohol use disorder. And it has a moderately decent effect size in several studies. Uh, again, this is the JAMA uh, meta-analysis. Uh, and it, the problem with it is it has some limiting side effects. It causes paresthesia, taste abnormalities. Uh, it's a great weight loss drug. Uh, it makes you somewhat anorexic. So if you have obese patients who have alcohol use disorder, they might like this. But people get dizzy and they get tired. You know, it's like an anticonvulsant. It makes you a little bit dopey. But this is a promising drug, and there are variants on this that are being tested now clinically. Uh, and you may see more in this, in this realm. There are two drugs that have become popular, but it's not clear that they work. So one is baclofen, and there was a, a famous book by a French cardiologist that, where he had terrible alcohol use disorder. He started taking this drug uh, initially for alcohol withdrawal seizures and claimed it cured his alcoholism. And, um, and really went on a, on a, a very popular uh, uh, crusade, if you will, to try and get this approved as a drug for alcohol use disorder, and actually wound up being approved in France. But if you look at the clinical experience and all the clinical trials that have been done on it, uh, overall, you know, the Cochrane database had, just had a recent review of this. There was no difference in, from placebo in any of the measures. And actually, there was an evidence for increased number of drinks per drinking day. So I'm not so sure that this is a great drug. I've given this as a neurologist to patients for spasticity, which is what it's approved for in the US, and it almost invariably causes somnolence and vertigo. So people don't like it too much unless they really have to take it. Um, the other drug is uh, gabapentin. And uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure why this was even tried, because there initially wasn't really any animal model data to push for this. Um, but uh, it. It does re reduce neurotransmitter release by inhibition of certain types of calcium channels. That's thought to be how, how it acts. It's a drug that was initially developed as an anticonvulsant, as a GABA mimetic, but it doesn't act at GABA receptors. And it was found to maybe 
inhibit pain transmission, so it's used for neuropathic pain. Um, and uh, there have been some randomized clinical trials and recent animal data. The recent animal data out of uh, a lab at UNC showed that it actually increased alcohol intake in rats, which isn't a very good sign. There was one study from Barbara Mason's group at Scripps in, in California that uh, used, uh, that looked at non-treatment seeking alcohol dependent persons and uh, it found that uh, compared with placebo, it improved abstinence and also sleep. But a recent randomized clinical trial that was much longer and used an extended release form um, with a larger number of patients uh, run by the NIAAA, of which Barbara Mason was one of the investigators, didn't show any effect. So I don't know if it's the formulation, the patient population differences or whatever, but it, I think the, the you know, I'm not so sure that this is going to be that effective. And again, this also makes people sleepy. So um, I would say that I would give the green light to naltrexone and acamprosate. I'd give a, probably a, potentially a bigger green light to varenicline and to pyramate, and somewhat to nalmethine, but you can't get it in this country. I would be reluctant to give patients disulfiram. You'd have to monitor them very carefully. They'd have to be very motivated. And I leave gabapentin and baclofen in the gray zone. So there clearly is a need for new drugs. And uh, you know, serendipity is not the greatest way to go about things. Can one go about things logically? So traditionally in the drug development uh, world, people have identified drug targets. And they've gone after these drug targets uh, by understanding some of the biology and biochemistry of a disease state. And then they've developed very selective drugs against the target and then tried them in, in animal models and then go to humans. And people have been trying to do that. And I will show you one study that I'm involved in where I have done that approach. The other is to identify gene and gene networks um, that might be important. And that makes sense in a complex disease which has uh, multiple genetic risk factors, but they all cause a very small, uh, you know, amount, they contribute a very small amount to the total variance of the genetic risk. And also to a drug that causes very large changes in gene expression in the brain. So what are those genes? What families do they form into? What kind of networks? And can those networks be used to predict drugs? So that's what I'm going to talk about at the end of the talk. So individual drug targets. So I've spent the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years? How old am I? I don't know. We, we went through this last night. Kenny and I are born the same year. So um, candidate drug targets from I, I did a lot of studies in cell culture, looking how cells adapt to the continued presence of ethanol. There was a group at the Gallo Center that studied flies, another group that studied uh, C. elegans uh, nematodes. Uh, people were doing RNA sequencing uh, to look at different genes that were expressed, and some of it was done in humans. And I would you know, mine all these data and come up with potential drug targets and knock them out in, in mice, look at the knockout mice, for behavioral changes and then try to map circuits and cell signaling. And so my lab you know, went through a good 12, maybe a couple more on this list of genes that we knocked down in animals and studied. And the one that really, there were two that kind of hit gold. Uh, one is the alpha-4 subunit of the nicotinic receptor, which I'm not going to talk to you about today. But this is a target for varenicline. And the other one is protein kinase C epsilon. So protein kinase C epsilon is a Kinase, which is an enzyme that puts phosphorylation uh, moieties on proteins that are its substrates. It's a very charged part of the molecule. It changes the structure and can change the function of the substrate. So it's a signaling uh, kinase, and it's a uh, member of a large family. There's a subfamily of related uh, genes. There, there are nine of them. They form three groups. The, this group uh, has a lot of structural similarities and is activated by both calcium and a lipid that comes out of a lipid signaling called diacylglycerol. This group, the novel PKCs, uh, are only activated by the lipid. And this other group, which is related structurally but has different means of activation, the typical PKCs are, are quite different. And we've studied representatives from each of these three classes and found uh, that the epsilon PKC gene really had a ma major effect on alcohol-related behaviors. Um, we found that uh, these animals avoid alcohol. I mean, they, they really have conditioned place aversion to alcohol. They drink very little of it, and they have less so of a response, but a similar response to nicotine. Uh, they also have reduced anxiety-like behavior. 
and they show reduced hyperalgesia to either inflammatory or neuropathic pain insults. And so these are three very clinically useful phenotypes, and so we decided to go after this. I'm just showing you here the early, so here's a study from 1999. That's, this is one of the first uh, issues of Nature Neuroscience that had just come out. And uh, Clyde Hodge was in the Gallo Center at the time as an assistant professor. He did the behavioral work. You can see in red here, these knockout mice do not like to drink alcohol. This is a two-bottle choice test where you raise the concentration of alcohol in the water every four days. And the wild-type mice drink quite nicely uh, up to, you know, by the end here, up to six grams per kilogram per day. But the knockout mice, very little, and they don't get past much, much past about 11% preference for alcohol versus water. So this was probably at the time the most dramatic uh, alcohol aversion phenotype anybody had seen in a knockout mouse. So because of all the potential clinical utility of this drug target, we went after it to try and make compounds against it. So this is a compound that's sold by uh, Sigma, uh, and it was developed against a different kinase called ROC1, and a company in Belgium had actually modified it by adding this, these structures over here and changing this ring to a benzene ring, and tested it and said it was fairly selective against PKC epsilon. But they never did anything with it. It was an agri agricultural uh, pharmaceutical company, and they were getting into the medical business, but then they canceled that. So it's in the patent database, but they haven't done anything in humans. So what we did is we, we looked at this, and it, this is Mike Pleiss, who's a medicinal chemist, and Dan Wong, who is a a very talented scientist in my lab at UCSF, and we modified the structure replacing this ring here with a hexane ring, so it's basically the same compound. But this allowed us to get patent uh, protection around it, and we made a whole slew of compounds. These are two, this is a variant of this, and we tested it, and we found when we did, looked at representatives of the three families of PKCs, that really only the novel PKCs were very sensitive to inhibition. And then when we looked within the novel PKC family, we found that epsilon PKC in black here was the most sensitive enzyme. So it's a, it's a relatively selective inhibitor of PKC epsilon. We've also scanned the entire kinome against this with a commercial uh, uh, source that will do this kind of screening. And this only appears to hit 11 kinases out of 400 in the kinome. So it's a fairly selective compound. Um, we've tested this in mice. These are C57 black 6 mice, which you can get to drink a heck of a lot of alcohol. And this is 16 to 18 grams per kilogram per day if you give it to them every other day. So they're kind of binge drinking. And you can get blood alcohol levels four hours after you hang the bottles that are up in the you know, legal intoxication range. So we don't let our mice drive after this. Um, and then if we give them uh, the compounds, uh, they actually drop their drinking by about 50% at a 40 milligram per kilogram dose. It only occurs in the wild type mice. If we use the mice that lack the gene for PKC epsilon, we don't see an effect. So it's selective against the drug target. So we're now taking these compounds and I'm working with a chemist at UT San Antonio who's modifying them. These, unfortunately, still inhibit the original kinase ROC1 that I had mentioned that the, the initial uh, you know, Y compound was against. You inhibit ROC1, you can cause hypotension. This will never become a drug. Um, and we think we can change the structure and eliminate the ROC1 inhibition. So that's what we're working on. That's a, a, a grants funded by the Harrington Discovery Institute and also by uh, the DOD. And our hope is to make not only an alcohol a drug against alcohol use disorder, but also a chronic pain drug. That's not a non-opioid chronic pain drug. But that's a very difficult task. I mean, maybe one out of 50 compounds that come out of an academic lab that look promising in preclinical studies make it all the way through this valley of death to actually being used at the bedside after all of the clinical trials. It's a very expensive proposition, and it's been a hard sell. You know? So there's more and more interest in it and if we eliminate the ROC1 inhibition, I think there'll be a lot more interest in it, but it's a very high-risk proposition. <clears throat> so what are, are there some other ways one can go about this? Well, what about using genetics and genomics as a tool to look at all the drugs that are out there and see if you can bring them into alcohol use disorder uh, using what's known about genes? So alcohol use disorder 
is a complex disease. And by that, I mean it's a disease that has multiple risk genes associated with it, plus a very large environmental influence on it. Uh, and that's as opposed to a monogenic disease like Huntington's disease or phenylketonuria, which all babies are tested for, that is due to a single genetic defect. There's some environmental influence. You can treat PKU deficient children with diet, and they'll develop normally. So you can environmentally manipulate the system, but it's heavily genetically based. Alcohol use disorder is not. It's more like this. And if you go after individual genes as drug targets, you're probably going to have very small effect sizes unless you can select those people. So what about trying to go after multiple genes? So one way to do that is to try and get an idea of what genes are being expressed in the brain in control subjects or subjects who are at risk for alcohol, high alcohol drinking, or independent subjects. Because the genes that are being expressed are different in those three groups. And how can you do that? Well, you can look at the output of gene expression, which is ribonucleic acid. And so you can, there are ways now to actually extract RNA from cells, all the RNAs that are being produced by a cell, and sequence them all. Uh, we have the technologies now to do that. That used to be a very cumbersome process. And then you can look at them at two different states, let's say, and look at relative changes in gene expression. So these are four cell lines lined up vertically in these columns, the four again. But on the left, you have cells that are treated with a control solution. And on the right are cells treated with a steroid to induce changes in gene expression. And these are all, these are, you know, 20 genes or so. And you can see that they fall into two groups. The steroid treatment causes these guys to go up in red here and causes these guys to go down. So you can do these heat maps to look at relative changes in gene expression. So we've done a lot of this RNA analysis and sequencing. And um, this is work, a lot, a lot of this was done by Adrian Harris's lab and Dane Mayfield's lab at the, at the Wagner Center. And what kept popping up when, when we first looked at human samples, this was from a brain bank in Australia. These are frozen brains of alcoholics and matched controls were genes that, that were overrepresented uh, in the immune and stress response. And at first, the first paper was around 2001, we thought that this might have been an artifact of contamination, blood contamination. But it kept popping up, and here's a paper in 2006, where you can see, you know, there, there are 11 genes that went up and 13 that went down. So this is very interesting because there are a lot of drugs being developed to modulate the immune response. <clears throat> and uh, you can even see this in animals. This is in mouse models of predisposition to high alcohol use. Uh, and this was a paper, this Mulligan paper in PNAS is sort of the landmark paper for this. These are animals that are alcohol naive but are known to drink a lot, inbred lines and, and selected lines. And so if you look at all these immune response uh, and stress response genes, that makes you think, well, gee, what, couldn't we just take a, off the shelf a bunch of molecules that are already known to manipulate these pathways and try them out? So that's what Yuri Blednov at the Wagner Center has done. And some of this is already published. But the interesting, most interesting ones he found is if he manipulates NF-kappa B signaling or phosphodiesterase 4 or uh, the, peroxidon, the PPAR uh, uh, agonist, so this is a transcription factor, all of these are anti-inflammatory drugs, and they decrease drinking in two-bottle choice models. Um, we've, we've chased some of these, and some of these drugs have side effects that make them never to be used in alcoholics, like they cause liver toxicity, or they've been pulled off the market for other reasons. This one, though, is very interesting. This is a premolast, which was recently approved to treat psoriasis. It's a, it, and it has uh, less side effects than other PDE4 inhibitors, which tend to cause nausea. This one's a little more selective uh, to the subtypes of PDE4 that are not involved in causing nausea. And so it's better tolerated. And uh, it does decrease drinking in mice pretty substantially. We've just published those papers uh, recently. And so there's a clinical trial going on through Barbara Mason's group at Scripps uh, La Jolla, where, again, these are non-treatment-seeking alcoholics, uh, heavy drinkers, who are <clears throat> testing this. And the, the data are not out yet, but people are tolerating the study, and she hasn't had a lot of dropout yet. Uh, that could be a very useful drug. Now, um, 
in addition to categorizing all the genes that are differentially expressed by what's known about their function, you know, they've been annotated in, in databases, um, one can also categorize or correlate genes based on the degree to which they are co-expressed. Okay? So not every gene is known to do something. We don't know the function of all genes. But we can measure the amount of RNA that's produced at any amount of time and at least correlate the relative expression of the RNAs. And so we can capture more of the genome. And so uh, Dane's group uh, and Sean Ferris at the Wagner Center actually compared uh, levels of raw gene expression uh, versus uh, the connectivity in terms of co-expression networks between genes. So what you can do is you can develop a, a, a connectivity score for every single gene and cluster these genes into modules so you know that you, you have a score for this gene that it's connected to many, many other genes. So it has a high connectivity value. So if you take just raw gene expression and compare uh, control subjects and, and all the genes in, in alcoholic subjects, they pretty much line up on a, on, a, on a line and they correlate pretty well. But there is some scatter. You can see some genes scattered here in the basal lateral amygdala, the central nucleus of the amygdala, less so in the cortex and some in the nucleus accumbens. So there is some scatter and that allowed us to, to draw some conclusions, let's say, about immune response genes. But if you look at the, their connectivity with each other, if you compare these two uh, conditions, the, the alcoholic patients uh, have really disrupted connectivity uh, amongst genes. So even though their relative abundance hasn't changed, their co-expression factors have changed a lot. So there's something, and the idea is that genes that are expressed at similar amounts are probably functionally related. Because you know, if you're gonna build a car, you need you know, all the parts that are needed for just that car. You don't need the parts for a motorcycle. And so all of the, the, those RNAs that are expressed at a relatively similar level are probably somewhat related. And actually, if you look at within these modules and you go back and look at the functional annotations that are in databases, you actually see that that's true. So that, that the connectivity does, does somewhat overlap with what's known about function. But this is a, a, a more unbiased approach and it's terribly disrupted in alcohol dependence. And so that begs the question, can we actually look at an alcohol uh, dependence disrupted co-expression network and try and normalize it with a drug? And um, that's led us to use genomic data for drug repurposing. So that's the final part of the talk I want to get into because I think this is really interesting. This is what I call systems pharmacology and it's a newish approach uh, that is catching on. So, it, you know, it, it, People have talked about Moore's Law, where the number of transistors on a, on, a, on a CPU have increased, have doubled every few years, right? And it keeps on getting bigger, faster, smarter, and cheaper. Well, there's something known as Aram's Law, where the number of drugs approved by the FDA have actually been falling as the cost has been going up every year. So we have the inverse situation. And this is really not sustainable to having any sort of drugs uh, coming out in the future. And it's extremely expensive to go all the way through from at drug discovery to FDA approval. So expensive that a lot, there are a lot of compounds that have gone through preclinical and phase one safety testing that get hung up here and are sitting on the shelf of a variety of pharmaceutical companies. Some of these have been donated to the NIH and they're available for people to, to take and test in preclinical models. Um, so there have been a, there's been a real interest in trying to figure out methods to actually take these drugs and reposition them into other indications uh, that are not the ones they failed their clinical trials. And one way to do that is to use genomics. So this, uh, this is a paper that came out in Science in 2006. This is Eric Lander's group at the Broad Institute. And they proposed taking a biological state and get, getting a transcriptome signature, so a signature of the gene network in a disease state, and then comparing that with a database of drugs that have perturbed the, a similar network. And the way that's done is the Broad has taken a bunch of cell lines and treated them with a few thousand different drugs and categorized the transcriptional signatures on all those. And so you can query that database with your, if you can get a disease signature and look for the drug signature that is most opposite to this and try those drugs out. 
And so in a more simplified version, you have an addiction signature, you have a drug therapy, uh, you know, postulated drug therapy signature that's opposite. Hopefully this will correct that and you'll have less craving and more control. And so this is the Lynx data set. They actually use a thousand um, genes that are representative of the whole set of genes that they've categorized. They have almost 20,000 small molecules. Many of them are FDA approved drugs. And so uh, what we did is we developed a disease model in mice. We queried the database, prioritized some hits, tried them on mice to see if they worked. And this work was done by um, Igor Panomarev, who used a model that had been developed at Oregon Health Sciences University by John Crabb's lab. This is a uh, selected line of mice that have been selected over many drink generations to drink a lot of alcohol in a binge drinking protocol. And so after uh, about 30 selections, these mice drink a lot of alcohol in a very short period of time and have you know, more than 80 milligrams percent blood levels. And these mice are actually, you can get them, they're very resistant to naltrexone and other drugs. So what would be effective in treating them? So what they did is they, they uh, took uh, different brain regions, developed, trans, uh, uh, you know, measured the transcriptomes, came up with a transcriptome master signature for this HDID mouse, and these were naive mice by the time they did this. And then Laura Ferguson, who's now in my lab, did the Lynx analysis against the Lynx database. And what they pulled out was this compound called tereic acid, which uh, nobody has ever really studied um, much. It's, uh, it's a product of, of a fungus, has a fairly simple structure. It inhibits this kinase, brutin tyrosine kinase, which has been involved in immune signaling and in cancer. And it would not have been picked up by deductive reasoning through what we already know. So this is an unbiased approach that led to this compound. So, uh, John and uh, Angela Osborne at OHSU tested this in the HDID mice, and indeed the drug dose-dependently decreases drinking. When you get to the higher concentrations here, it also decreases water intake. But at other concentrations where it doesn't do that, it's effective. So this is a proof of concept that we we're able to predict a compound out of this database, and it actually works. Now this is not going to be a drug in humans, but it shows that, that the, the possibility exists. How am I doing on time? How much? Ten. I'm good. Okay. I wasn't sure because I, I didn't know how long you talked, right? Okay. So uh, I want to just make a, a couple of comments also about uh, difficulties in drug development. Uh, so what are the impediments to treatment? Well, you know, I already talked about the low effect size of the approved drugs. Uh, maybe the off-label drugs are a little bit stronger, but we need more data. Um, a big problem are, uh, that, that uh, clinical trialists talk about are the narrow uh, endpoints in, in randomized clinical trials as required by the FDA. And I'll talk about that. Also, AUD is a heterogeneous diagnosis, and, and Kenny really mentioned that, that the, uh, the, the DSM-5 criteria, are, you know, you can have people who fit two or three of different criteria and they still have the same diagnosis. Uh, very, uh, only a minority of people are treated. That's in part because people think it's a small effect size, in part because primary care providers that see many of these people don't know that much about the drugs. Uh, it's definitely because there's a social stigma. People don't even want to talk about it or they don't want to deal with it. And uh, there's this notion out there that the relapse rates are high anyway, so why bother? And I would just venture to say that those kind of relapse rates for a chronic dis relapsing disorder are not that much different than diabetes or asthma or anything else, okay? So that, to me, is not an excuse. Now, something that, uh, as scientists, we might be able to handle are, are these two up here, and I just want to talk to you about it. Uh, first is uh, the FDA endpoints of abstinence or no heavy drinking days. They're very limiting and they're very dichotomous variables, in a, in a sense. They don't give you any kind of graded uh, 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 gradation. There's no there's no room for the gray in here. And I'm, uh, like most of us scientists, we love the gray. Everything's a probability, a likelihood. So they're, in Europe, uh, they've adopted this uh, World Health Organization reduction in drink risk level. So uh, the WHO has defined four levels of, of drinking risk based on how much is drunk, both in men and in women. And the idea is if you go one or two levels of drink risk uh, in response to a drug that's considered a positive event. 
And so people have gone back and looked at topiramate, branicline, and naltrexone. And it looks like uh, going one risk level down is kind of noisy, but going two risk levels down from very high to medium or high to low uh, is actually quite robust. And you get a little bit more, you can capture more people as being positively affected. The numbers needed to treat to have a response are less, and you don't get that much increase in the placebo effect. So I think that th there's a group uh, of clinical trial experts in the country who are trying to get the FDA to adopt this. This would become kind of an international uh, benchmark. The other thing is uh, personalizing treatment. So there's been a lot of talk about using genetics to do that, but the problem is the effect size of any single gene is small, and it's not, to me, much of a surprise to think that it's kind of failed for alcohol use disorder. The biggest uh, push was for this variant of the new opioid receptor gene, and there were some initial papers that said it looked very promising, at least for predicting response to naltrexone, the opioid antagonist. But uh, more recent studies and larger numbers of people, that hasn't panned out. Um, and there was a pro prospective study, which I think is this one, that actually didn't see any signal. Um, there's been neuroimaging done in one study. So this is the PREDICT trial. It was a big treatment trial of naltrexone and acamprosate done in Europe and in four sites. And in one site, they also did um, uh, pre- and post-treatment uh, uh, functional MRI imaging. And they showed that there was that high Q-induced activation in the ventral striatum, which is the area of the nucleus accumbens, uh, predicted uh, uh, a better response to naltrexone. So that's sort of promising. So maybe there's a way to use imaging to stratify people. The, um, the, it, but, you know, it's this expensive, and primary care people can't necessarily do this. So what about behavioral phenotypes? And I talked about reward drinkers and relief drinkers. People have gone back and analyzed the PREDICT trial, the European trial, and the combined trial that was done in the U.S. many years ago and found that in this trial that naltrexone uh, had a better response in reward drinkers. This was a huge effect, an 83% reduction in heavy drinking. And in the combined trial, it appears that relief drinkers on acamprosate had reduced drinking days. So there may be a way to behaviorally phenotype people and stratify them. And so in summary, there's a need for better medications. It's a complex disorder. It probably would benefit from a systems pharmacology approach uh, with genomics. Drug repurposing may be the most cost-effective uh, uh, method or approach for now. Um, there's a move to expand uh, outcome measures in clinical trials, which I think is a positive thing. Um, it's important to remember it's a complex disorder with gene and environment interactions. And right now, with the, uh, the small and to modest effect size of the current therapies, it really has to be used, drug treatment has to be used as an adjunct to behavioral therapy and, uh, and also recovery interventions, which I think recovery interventions um, that have a, a, a social component to it, getting people involved in other groups, really help with this environmental interaction. And so these are just some people that I've had in my lab over the years who have participated in some of this work. And then I've, I, I'd like to thank funding from the Gallus Center, the State of California, UT Austin Startup Funds, the DOD, the Harrington Institute, the NIAAA, and also uh, my colleagues in the Wagner Center and the Neuroscience Graduate Program. And of course, rodents. All right, thanks. We'll take sure. Questions? Sure. We can take a few questions while we're transitioning here. Yes. I think it, I think the use of MDMA and other psychedelics. I think. It, the temptation is to get involved in it because of hypothesis and anecdotal evidence. Uh, I think it would need a real trial. I mean, you know, things have fallen out in trials. Um, but I think there's enough of an of a interesting signal to think it might work. Uh, one of the biggest ones that's, you know, historically is Ibogaine, where people have gone to the Caribbean to use it. Uh, it's a little bit toxic. There's some uh, basic science evidence to, to say why it, how, how it might work. Um, it's worth a try. I don't. I, I think it's a hard sell to get to get that pass, though. You know. 
I wouldn't as a, uh, you know, you can't prescribe most of them anyway. So I'm not sure I would, I would recommend people doing that, but it's worth studying. Hi, I'm wondering how you uh, differentiate chemically or genetically the relief drinkers and the reward drinkers, how you identify um, them. That, that's certain. a phenotype. That's a behavioral phenotype. It's not distinguished um, uh, genetically or, what did you say, chemically? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know of any biomarkers that distinguish that. It's really just been a... a, a a, a behavioral phenotype. It would be worth, I guess, doing that because it's, it's a, a subjective assessment of sorts by the investigator or the examiner. But I don't know of the data. There might be, I just don't know it. Yes. I don't think it would pass safety measures or efficacy. The very, you know, it's it's by the criteria that the FDA required, you know, in a clinical trial. I don't think it would pass. It, you know, it was it was approved long ago. You know. I do as well. Oh, well, that's a good question. I don't know what the status is on that. Do you know, Kenny? Well, it, why is it, why is disulfuram still being used if it's not really uh, you know shown in a, in clinical trials to be effective? Yes, uh, it's not my area of expertise, but I could tell you how I've seen it used. You know, people believe it's very effective is when it's part of some kind of behavioral contract, and so. It's keeping a family together. The, the wife will stay with the husband if he agrees to pop a pill in front of her, you know, kind of a commitment to abstinence. And But in those kinds of cases, is it the drug that's being affected? Right, or is it or the is it the, the behavioral contract. contracting and the contingencies surrounding taking the drug? But at least the, in the situations I've seen it being used, you know, and people feel it's effective, it's not when it's somebody taking on its own it's part of a contract with a family member, with an employer, that sort of thing. Right, right, so yeah. Wait, one more question. <laughs> I would speak to that issue about when disulfiram is used. I think largely it's used by habit, that there's just not enough training with primary care doctors or psychiatrists about what else there is to use. Um, and so one of the things that I appreciated about your talk was at the beginning, you said, well, these things aren't that effective. But then you talked about how complicated it is, depending on what your goal is, what your end point is. And when you consider that alcohol use disorder very often does not occur alone, but actually occurs with other psychological disorders, mood disorders, bipolar disorder, um, anxiety disorders, sometimes moving people from um, high risk <laughs> to low risk, high risk to moderate risk, four drinks when you drink, two drinks when you drink, can make a huge impact on those other disorders that people have at the same time. So for those of us in the treatment community, one of the things we struggle with is not being able to find the people to prescribe the naltrexone when we've seen it work with the, with the clients that do get it um, in these multiple multiple ways other than just establishing abstinence. Right, yeah, it, um, education of primary care providers is really a key thing, I think, and an organized effort towards that would be very helpful. Okay, all right, well with that we'll move on. Let's thank our speaker one more time, please. Okay, so I'm uh, happy to move on to the next session. My name is Chris Peers. I'm the Associate Dean of Research in the College of Arts and Science, and I also have a lab in this building um, on the third floor. Um, we're really happy to move on to the session on basic translational research. 
And the format will be similar to this morning. We're gonna have three 20 minute talks and then we're just gonna move from one to the other and then there'll be 15 minutes of questions at the end as a panel. Um, since I'm in this building, I know that there's a secret door. If I press a button, if people go over, so I'll just be sitting over here and I'll have three, two, one, and then when we run out of time, I'll press my secret button and introduce the next speaker. So, all right, well, without any further ado, um, our first um, set of talks is actually by two people, by Ian Geyser and Wendy Slutsky from our own um, Division of Psychological Sciences. Okay, all right, well, thank you, um, everybody, for coming. Um, and I am a statistical geneticist studying uh, the molecular genetics of addiction. And so what that means is basically I am looking through the genome for genes and genetic variants that confer risk for alcohol use and other substance use disorders. And so I'm gonna start just talking a little bit about how we do that. This is of course DNA. Um, and you have the sugar phosphate backbone and then the nucleotide bases, thymine and adenine cytosine and guanine, and this, there are three billion of these base pairs in the human genome, okay? 99.8% of that doesn't differ between people. But if we look at 0.1% of three billion, that's three, still three million differences between any two individuals. And when we look at like the population level, that translates to about 10 million differences that we can see in a population. Um, and my job is basically to go through those and figure out which ones might increase ever so slightly, as Dr. Messing nicely pointed out multiple times, um, risk for addiction. Um, <clears throat> because we think these differences combined with the environment is what makes us all unique, right? So how do we do that? Genome-wide association studies tend to be the, the standard at this point in time. Um, we start with a saliva sample. Uh, we extract the DNA, apply it to a micro, uh, micro array that looks just like this, um, and within a day we can generate genotypes at about seven and a half to as many as 10 million variants spaced all across the genome, okay? And <clears throat> we, uh, we do a very simple test. We basically ask if we look at one variant, um, is a certain allele uh, occurring at a higher frequency? In my case population, individuals with alcohol use disorder uh, contrasted with our control population, those without a disorder. And we do this one at a time for every seven and a half million of them, okay? <coughs> because of this, to claim that anything is significant, we have to do a huge correction for multiple testing. People have determined that there's about a, a million independent tests, given that markers close by one another are correlated. So we have a p-value of five times 10 to the minus eight, um, which is required to claim genome-wide significance, which means, uh, which is a very, very small number. <laughs> okay, um, and <clears throat> that by itself is problematic, and as Dr. Messing pointed out in his talk, uh, alcohol and other substance use disorders are highly complex in terms of their genetic architecture. There is no addiction gene. There's not even a small pool of, you know, like 20 addiction genes. There are literally hundreds, if not a thousand genes in the, out of the 20,000 that make up the human genome that are going to be relevant to a complex trait like uh, uh, alcohol use disorder. And if we look at any one of those individual differences, it's gonna explain less than half a percent, uh, half a percent um, typically 0.2 to 0.3 percent of the variation in the trait we're looking at. So this is a really tiny effect and really has no, you know, has no meaningful uh, impact on how anyone would lead their life um, when we look at it by itself. Now we combine these tiny effects with the number of variants that we're looking at and to find anything that has a genome-wide significant effect on the trait that we're looking at we honestly need sample sizes of upwards of 100,000 people, um, sometimes even larger than that, okay? <clears throat> and that's the, that's the approach we've taken. Okay, now obviously no one person could collect that many samples by themselves, so these are huge consortia-driven efforts um, in the United States and around the world, um, but this kind of collaborative science has made, led to significant progress in identifying novel genes related to psychological traits. Um, 
So uh, one of the biggest success stories is uh, with schizophrenia, um, led by the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, where they've, they've um, actually more recently, like somewhere around 160 different genes related to, or genetic loci related to schizophrenia. They've managed to do similar things to look at educational attainment, simply the highest grade you achieve um, in, in your educational history, um, and, and also depression and, and neuroticism. So where are we with addiction? Well, for alcohol use disorders, so this is a paper that I was involved in, this is what's called a Manhattan plot. On the x-axis, you have the chromosome, and on the y-axis, you have the negative log 10 of the p-values. So now, higher values are more significant. Um, and we had, in this paper, one significant hit. This is ADH1B, which Dr. Messing also talked about in terms of alcohol metabolism. It's not at all exciting, because this was first reported 25 years ago just in the Canada gene literature. But what is exciting is if we look now at larger samples. Now, this, isn't, this is disordered alcohol use. Down here, we just have daily alcohol consumption. And this is a, a, a large study that had 500,000 participants. And now you're getting something that actually starts to look like the Manhattan skyline, which is where the name comes from with these different towers, this bar being genome-wide significance. And now we're actually starting to identify novel variants. So this big, giant peak over here is actually the MAP-T gene, the tau gene. Um, that's been related to multiple neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and on chromosome 11 here, you got DRD2. Um, it's like the Robert Downey Jr. in terms of like redemption stories for Canada genes. Um, so I was pretty excited to see it there. Um, and ADH1B over here. Okay, so we're making progress. And, you know, <clears throat> as Dr. Messing pointed out, these have tiny effect sizes. So in terms of intervention, drug targeting, um, you know, it's hard to know which ones to go after, but I would also point out like DRD2 here also pops up for schizophrenia, tiny effect size, two tenths of a percent. But it has a huge, you know, antipsychotics target directly the DRD2 receptor and have huge effects in terms of their uh, clinical implications. So the, the small effect sizes don't necessarily translate into the impact, the potential impact in terms of a drug. All right, so this is one half of the story and how we're using GWAS data to identify novel genetic, uh, novel genes that can for risk for these disorders. Now, I'm a psychologist by training, so I'm also kind of interested in other ways we can use genetic data. And so one way we're doing this is through the use of what we call polygenic risk scores. So I can take those data from that alcohol consumption GWAS that I just showed you, and then I can collect your saliva sample, okay? And I can pick out the, vari the very first variant, and I can say, like, Check how many alleles do you have that are associated with increased drinking. I multiply that by the correlation with the trait, and I put that in a little, you know, in a little box. And then I do that for the second variant and the third variant. I add these all together, and I can get a measure of your aggregate risk for heavy drinking <laughs> in this way. And then I can see how much does that predict in an independent population your, how much you're going to be drinking. And actually, from that study that I showed you, they were able to predict 7% of the variation in al daily alcohol consumption in a completely independent sample, which is a lot more than two-tenths of a percent. And we can use that in really interesting ways. And in fact, in other fields, people are already arguing that we need to start using polygenic risk factors, risk scores, to make clinical and, uh, treatment decisions. And so this, was paper, uh, paper, this news story was inspired by a paper from the Broad Institute looking at cardiac disease, diabetes, um, and breast cancer, but as we collect these bigger samples and apply that to substance use disorders, we will be able to do the same thing for addiction, okay? Now, <clears throat> we could collect these, you know, we could create these scores for alcohol use dependence disorder. I'd say that's kind of only one of the interesting ways we can use that, right? We've heard a lot that um, uh, substance use disorders are multifactorial in ter terms of their causal factors, right? Um, and so, you know, we can maybe parse and find more refined phenotypes and then use that in a treatment and prevention setting. So we could look at substance metabolism or sensitivity to alcohol, executive functioning or imperson uh, you know, aspects of personality. The other thing I would point out is that, you know, addiction is a process, right? And so when we're looking at prevention, and genetic you know, the genetic risk factors for prevention may be very different from those in terms of treatment. And so we can develop risk scores that could be useful and inform treatment at different stages of addiction 
and substance use. Okay. Um, in my lab, I'm particularly interested in sensitivity to alcohol. Um, and um, we are kind of in the early stages of, of, of conducting these types of GWAS. Um, we have around 10,000 participants in our samples at this point with, um, and are in the process of, of uh, cleaning data where we'll be able to get our numbers up to around 30 to 40,000 individuals. So we're on the road to this, you know, um, on this path. And, you know, my, my kind of my hope is at some point what we'll be able to do is develop a risk score in terms of someone's sensitivity to alcohol and use that in prevention efforts, right? And tell people, you know, this is, this is how sensitive you might be to alcohol. And, you, and then also tell them how that relates to the onset of addiction, right? So most of us probably think being able to drink is a good thing, right? I drink a lot is a good thing. And in fact, a lot of people particularly um, younger individuals pride themselves on how much they can drink in countries like Australia. And so, um, you know, we can educate them that that's not necessarily always a positive and that that specific risk could, you know, be something that they should pay attention to. Okay. Um, so I'll sum up there um, that, you know, like we've said before, genetic variants um, are of small effect by themselves. That being said, identifying what the genes are that are in, you know, critical and involved in the etiology of addiction-related phenotypes will help inform novel drug development um, or drug repositioning. Uh, and <clears throat> the use of polygenic risk scores can be, you know, has great potential in terms of both prevention and, and treatment efforts going forward. So I only had 10 minutes, so I think I made it. Um, I want to thank all of my um, collaborators, and there's actually some on there, including Bruce Bartholo, um, that I should acknowledge um, that have made all this work possible. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to the next presenter, Dr. Slutsky. Today I'm going to talk about the importance of the environment in genetically informed research on addictions. And I kind of feel like Dr. Messingly kind of set the stage really nicely for this talk. And Ian as well. So I teach a class in behavioral genetics. And usually when I introduce a new disorder like schizophrenia or depression or alcohol use disorder, I like to talk about the epidemiology or the geographic distribution of the prevalence of the disorder around the world. And it turns out that for addictive disorders, for all addictions actually, you see much more geographic variation than pretty much any other kind of disorder like schizophrenia or depression. And that's a major clue that genes can't tell the whole story and that the environment is very important. So this is a map of uh, alcohol consumption around the world. Uh, darker countries are countries where more, more people, a greater proportion of people in that country consume alcohol. Lighter countries, fewer people consume alcohol. And so if you look at Australia, it's funny you mentioned Australia. <laughs> if you look at Australia, it, this is a country where most people, maybe 90% of people consume alcohol. But nearby, a short flight away, is Indonesia, where, where most people do not consume alcohol. So there's huge differences around the world in terms of who consumes alcohol, who consumes alcohol to excess, and who is at risk for developing alcohol-related problems. And um, you can also see those differences even within the United States. So uh, Dr. Shukla showed, showed a picture of binge drinking in different states and showed that, that there's variability even across the United States in the prevalence of binge drinking in the different, in the different states. And so what I wanted to look at was if um, one could try to see whether maybe genetic risk for alcohol use disorder may be differentially expressed depending on what kind of environmental context you're living in. Like maybe what country, what state, and what neighborhood. So thinking about environmental moderation of and genetic influences on alcohol problems, you could think about drinking prohibitive environments where maybe the genes for alcohol problems may be relatively muted. So think maybe Indonesia. Or you could think of a, uh, maybe a drinking facilitated environment 
let's say, Australia, where the genetic risk factors for alcohol problems might be more amplified. So that's the idea, maybe, that things might differ depending on where you happen to live. So I looked at this within a twin study, where you compare the similarity of monozygotic twins who share 100% of their genes to dizygotic twins who share, on average, 50% of their genes. And if the monozygotic twins are more similar than the dizygotic twins, you can infer that there are some genetic influences at play. And the twin study is a nice complement to a molecular genetic study that Dr. Geiser talked about. In a molecular genetic study, you're directly measuring genes, individual genes. In a twin study, you're indirectly estimating the aggregate influence of genes. So in the study I did, I estimated the contribution of, or the proportion of variation in alcohol problems that was uh, attributed to genetic factors, shared environmental factors, things like social class, race, neighborhoods, and unique environmental factors, things that are specific to the individual. So I looked at the proportion of variation in alcohol problems attributed to those three things. The heritability is the proportion of variation in alcohol problems that can be explained by genetic factors. So that's mostly what I'm going to be focusing on here today, not the environmental factors. This is a map of the United States showing the density of alcohol outlets in each county in the United States. And so this is the environmental context I'm focusing on, is the density of alcohol outlets, not actually in the county, um, looking at a more fine-grained level. The, at the neighborhood level, the picture wasn't as pretty, but this kind of gives you an idea of, of the variation in the United States of the density of alcohol outlets in different counties. And I should say the darker counties are the ones that have a denser, a greater density of outlets, and the lighter ones are the, would have lower density of al alcohol outlets. And I want to show you a zoom in on uh, Missouri. Um, and so um, there's a county in the middle of Missouri that has a high density of outlets right here. <laughs> that happens to be Boone County, where we're, our university is. And so this is pretty typical of a college town that you have a greater density of alcohol outlets. And this is the density of alcohol outlets in a US a US national sample of twins and siblings that I looked at. So this is just to give you an idea of how, what kind of neighborhoods these twins and siblings were living in. So along the x-axis here is the number of outlets per square kilometer in the census tract that they were living. So again, the census tract is a smaller geographic unit, uh, smaller than a county, more like what you might think of as a neighborhood. Um, so ranging from zero outlets all the way up to uh, more than 10 outlets. And so I'm focusing mostly on uh, the on-premises outlets in blue here. So an on-premises alcohol outlet is one where you purchase alcohol to be consumed on, on the premises, like in a restaurant or in a bar. Off-premises outlets are where you purchase alcohol to be consumed elsewhere. So that would be a liquor store, a convenience store, a grocery store. And all outlets are just the two combined. So I'm mostly focusing on here now on the um, on-premises outlets in blue. Um, so most people live in, a, in places, neighborhoods with a few outlets. But some live in pretty outlet-dense neighborhoods. So you could think of these types of neighborhoods where there's maybe just where there are no outlets as maybe more prohibitive for the genetic influences on alcohol problems to be expressed, maybe muted gen gen muting genetic influences. And over here, this might be a more facilitated environment where, where the genetic influence on alcohol problems may be more amplified, more likely to be expressed. So here are the results. The layout is kind of similar to the previous slide. It, oh, down on the x-axis, we all still have the number of outlets per square kilometer in the census tract. But over here is the proportion of variance. And this is the proportion of variance in alcohol problems that's explained by genetic factors or the heritability. And that can range from 0 to 1. So the kind of neighborhood that you live in influences the heritability of alcohol problems, ranging from oh, down here, where in neighborhoods with zero outlets, the heritability is 11%. It's not even significant. Um, to here, if you live in a neighborhood with more than 10 outlets, the heritability is 78%. So the heritability is increasing from 11% up to 78%, depending on what environment you're living in. So that's a seven-fold increase in heritability, just based on the environmental context. So this is an example of gene environment interaction. Uh, so you could think of this as genetic control of sensitivity to the environment. You could also flip it around and say this could be environmental control of the expression of genes. I'm going to kind of skip past a lot of this, but just for time's sake. But um, I wanted to talk about this last point, which is that uh, most of you are probably thinking that alcohol outlets are preferentially located in worse, poorer neighborhoods. So I took that into account in all these models, and the neighborhood, the alcohol outlet density effects remained, um, even when you took into account 
actually taking into account state effects, neighborhood effects, it still remained. So these results suggest that individuals who are genetically predisposed to develop alcohol problems may be especially sensitive to the influence of many alcohol outlets in their community. And this has clear implications for prevention, intervention. That is, restricting the density of alcohol outlets may reduce alcohol-related harms by placing limits on the extent to which an individual an individual's genetic liability to develop alcohol problems can be actualized. That's really a mouthful, but what I'm trying to say here is that you can change the environment. The government can restrict how many outlets are in, an, in a state or in a neighborhood, and um, that kind of change will be most beneficial to those people who are genetically at risk to develop alcohol, alcohol problems. Um, I want to acknowledge the source of the data that I use, which, which comes from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health. Also, my collaborator is Tom Piasecki here at University of Missouri, former postdoc, um, Ariel Deutsch. And thank you for your attention. All right. Is this on? Yes. OK. Thanks, Ian and Wendy. Um, we'll move on to the next speaker. He's setting his watch here. <laughs> his clock. So we have uh, Anil Kumar, who's a distinguished professor at the, um, the D Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Yes, um, from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. So we're very happy to have all the participants from um, the four system campuses here today. So he's going to uh, give a presentation here. <laughs> okay, so I'm starting with thank you looks like, really. So how about you here? I am. Good afternoon, everyone. So what I'm going to do really, I'm going to change gear. You have heard a lot about alcohol really. So it's time to talk about something else really. And not too long ago, Missouri used to be meth capital. If you remember, we used to be meth capital in 2012. So before I talk about the work really, I'm going to talk about this was a graduate student in the lab, and then postdoc for two years, and he left almost two years ago, and now he has a GS-14 position after doing a short stint in, at NIS, now he's at FDA at GS-14, so pretty successful guy. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to convince you, and you all know that HIV is bad, drug abuse is bad, and our lab works on different kind of controlled and uh, illicit drugs, including alcohol, nicotine also, which are. But uh, today, I'm going to talk about methamphetamine for the reason that there are quite a few meth lab in the state. And I have been trying to talk at UMKC that we should have a drug addiction center. but. It was so happy to hear from Dr. McCarthy, really, that uh, you guys are organizing a symposium. And thank you very much for invitation. And thanks for the organizing team for making everything very smooth, really. So you can see here, this is 2017 data. My timer is running, yes, two minutes. So basically, we have approximately 36, 37 million of HIV positive cases in the world. And you see maximum number comes from Africa and Southeast Asia. How HIV progress? This cartoon depicts if person is not getting any treatment. So one gets virus, develop flu-like symptoms. Most of the time, it goes unnoticed. If you are not in high-risk group, it goes unnoticed. And within a few weeks, there is a high viral load. Viral is replicating massively. Immune system comes into play, controls the virus, but immune system is never able to get rid of the virus. And virus is replicating predominantly in CD4 T cell. And therefore, CD4 T cell number goes down. Immune system takes care, not eliminating. So CD4 goes little bit, there is little recovery, but over a period of time, virus is very smart, just next to flu virus in terms of mutation, really. So virus keeps mutating, and immune system is going down. There comes a time, three to 10 years, without treatment, that host immune system is totally compromised, 
and patient is going to succumb to some opportunistic infection. What happens in the brain? Today, I'm talking about the brain, really. So what happens in the brain? Virus goes in the brain, cross blood-brain barrier. There are three major cell types, astrocyte, microglia, and neurons. Virus does not replicate in neuron, but does replicate in microglia and astrocyte. Our lab is focused on astrocyte. So this slide gives you idea that what used to happen before we had combined treatment. These days we have great treatment. We cannot get rid of the virus, but we can keep virus in check. And it's more of management issue rather than, so HIV AIDS is not a death warrant anymore. So before HARD, we used to have approximately 30% people who will develop dementia severe brain disorders, really. But now that lifespan has increased, so we don't have, and we have good drugs, much better than 90s, so we don't develop dementia. We develop minor cognitive motor dysfunction, so our executive function, memory is, but we, since we are living, so in nutshell, if one is infected with HIV at the age of, let's say, 25, by the time that person reaches 40, his brain would be as old as 65, 70-year-old brain, really. So brain aging is much faster in case of HIV. So let's talk a little about HIV because I'm going to focus only on one protein of HIV today. There is one protein any virus has enveloped. So there is a protein on the envelope that is called GP120, this one. That binds with receptor on the CD4 T cell, and that's how virus gets in. So GP120 is ligand for the viral receptor CD4, and also very important over a period of time, it had been shown that it's extremely neurotoxic. One of the two protein, GP120 and TAD, they are neurotoxic, and the lab works on both, really. So it does all different kind of thing, really. And in the literature, it was known that uh, it is neurotoxic. And uh, that time, I was moving to Kansas City, and I didn't. I, I used to be a monkey researcher, really. But in University of Missouri, we don't have monkey facilities, so I tried to diversify became tissue culture and rodent researcher. So that's how the evolved evolution was. People go on positive side. I went from bigger to smaller, really. So that was the time this guy, Ankit, came to lab, and I gave him this project. And we had a R01 on, based on this project, really. So he was able, and I'm not going to show any data, just going to tell you the, what happens, really. So he published three papers. So what happens? How our neuron gets compromised? There are several mechanisms, direct, indirect. Something can go directly hit the neuron. Something can go activate astrocyte, make them do bad things. And those bad things will affect neuron. And one of the bad things is pro-inflammatory cytokine chemokine. So he was able to show that GP120 causes overexpression of IL-6, IL-8, and CCL-5. And all these three are bad. If they are being overproduced, it will compromise normal physiological function because there will be inflammation. And he was able to develop a signaling mechanism for overproduction of these three cytokines. And that is illustrated here. I'll not go into detail. But he was able to beautifully dissect the pathway that was involved in overproduction of these three cytokines. Now let's come to methamphetamine. So we know that HIV is doing bad thing. So we chose methamphetamine for a particular region. So while looking at methamphetamine, I was, there is one comprehensive study in 2006 when SAMHSA in collaboration with NIDA, they had big, they found that almost 
2 million high schoolers admitted using methamphetamine at least once. So this is countrywide data, and it causes different, uh, I mean, amphetamines are good also for ADHD, narcolepsy, and all that, but uh, if one becomes addicted, then there are bad things that happens, memory impairment and all those, and we, are not, we have a lot of data on that, but we are not going to talk about that. How does it work in context with HIV? So methamphetamine affects dopamine and dopamine transporter. And on the other hand, dopamine metabolites are known to affect HIV, AIDS, disease course. So that is kind of thing, and there was a study that dopaminergic drug could affect the SIB neuropathology that they were able to control severe pathology to milder level. Coming back to Missouri, like 2012, we were meth capital. This data is from 2013, when we were overtaken in a good, good for us, mm -hmm. overtaken by some other states, really. But look at this data. This is from Missouri State Highway Patrol. If you look at from 2010 through 17, and there are data on that side, data is there from 2004, but I didn't take that. So you see approximately 10% of the methamphetamine-associated seizures are reported in the state. So it's still a big problem for the state, really. So we started work, we were working, so on one hand, we were able to show that HIV protein, GP120, causes inflammation in the brain. On the other hand, Ankit went ahead and tested methamphetamine, and he was able to show that IL-6 and IL-8 were overexpressed when astrocytes in one of the brain cells were exposed to methamphetamine. And he, does, he did all those by classical biochemical studies and uh, was able to identify the complete pathway. So since I started working with HIV, substance abuse was the second phase in the life, really. So we always study substance abuse in context with HIV. So methamphetamine, you know, is still there is no single study clearly depicting that methamphetamine causes increased HIV AIDS. So there is no study. But there are two classical studies, and NIDA has awarded a lot of R01 based on that study, really. They were conducted in 2006, where people from UCS have found out that incidence of HIV is two to threefold higher in those people who use methamphetamine versus who don't use. So HIV incidence is higher. So that was kind of, and since then, people have shown that HIV replication in vitro is increased. We had a monkey project, and uh, there we are not seeing increased HIV replication. We are seeing accelerated disease, not for today, but. Uh, we are not seeing increased HIV replication. So what he did, Ankit, what he did, he mixed now GP120 and methamphetamine. And he was able to show that at least for one cytokine, IL-6, there was synergy. That 2 plus 2 became 11, not 4. So if cells were exposed to GP120 and methamphetamine, there was synergistic effect in terms of IL-6 production, and that's what we have shown now in mouse also, that there is increased memory deficit. So that was inflammatory part. There are two other mechanisms by which brain cells are affected, or any cells are affected, or cells would die. ER stress, endoplasmic reticulum stress, I'm not going to go into detail. This paper was published in uh, OncoTarget. And what he was able to show that if you expose the cell to methamphetamine 
and also expose the mice to methamphetamine, they will involve three pathways, ATF6, IRE1-alpha, and PERC pathways, and cause increased ER stress that will lead to increased cell death and compromise in brain function in mouse. So both tissue culture and uh, mouse study. Another thing is oxidative stress. We all know that means one of the common when we are 20, 25, our skin is so smooth. And when I'm teaching and I put my hand under overhead projector, first thing I tell a student, say, look at this is the aging old person really talking. So that is because of increased oxidative stress that as we age, we make more oxygen, reactive oxygen, and that will cause all the abnormalities. You guys are lucky sitting there, but just wait for two decades, really you'll be here. So, so that is classical aging, okay? But if a reactive oxygen is produced for some reason, balance is impaired, then that will cause death. And eventually, one of the reasons for death is Aging, death, oxidative stress is major player, really. So means there was a time I used to be very smooth, really, not like this today, what you see me. So we so oxidative stress is one mechanism, and that's what we did. We published only one paper on that. We took HIV protein and methamphetamine. We showed that there was increased oxidative stress. Nothing big. It was already known before we came and performed this study. What was new in our study, that we discovered a new pathway that cytochrome P452E1 is involved in GP120 and methamphetamine mediated oxidative stress. So this new pathway was published in Cell Death and Disease a couple of few years ago now, yeah, 13 or 14, something like that. And we were able to show that these things cause oxidative stress that leads to cell death. And if you mix those two together, there is synergy between these two. There will be increased cell death. And we have not pursued GP120 in the mice, but we have pursued HIV, another neurotoxic protein, HIV1 TAD, and have shown that's exactly what's happening in the mice. And that is leading to compromise, down regulation of neuroplasticity genes, leading to memory deficit. And if you block this, then you can recover memory deficit. Our lab is also working on natural products. So basically, we are fan of broccoli extract, really, sulforaphane. So we test sulforaphane, really. Uh, we have few reservatrol analog also, reservatrol, the wine thing I was talking about, reservatrol is wine thing. So that has its own problem in terms of half-life and bioavailability. So we have designed few analogs, those are better, but sulforaphane is working much better in terms of restoration of executive function and memory deficit. So I think that's where kind of we are really, and methamphetamine, I chose methamphetamine, <laughs> I'm sorry, I chose methamphetamine simply because of our problem in the state, but we are pursuing different things like opioid, morphine, heroin, cocaine, alcohol, and cigarette nicotine, and trying to work out what are the mechanisms, how the cells are dying, how you can restore the memory or any executive function. So that's kind of, and like I told you that there were other people also involved in this project, but uh, Ankit, this was Ankit's PhD thesis and postdoctoral work and funding came from NIDA and AAA, NIAAA. Thank you very much.
All right, our uh, third and final speaker for this session on basic translational research is Elizabeth Parks. Hi, Dr. Parks, this is for you and uh, Dr. Bartholow. So the question of food addiction, that what you were able to briefly describe there, that's really interesting. And um, because my brain goes to opiate substitution therapy, no matter what, um, what is out there in terms of a continued consumption of food that may or may not be triggering for people or quote addictive? For example, if someone describes themselves as addicted to sugar, are they ever able to you know, sustain a recovery by eating small amounts of sugar throughout the day, like analogous to buprenorphine? Yeah, no, there, there have been five studies right now. We finished one last year. It is opposite of what you would think. Um, patients think that when they remove a target food, they will crave it, and the opposite happens. When you, if you feed someone a very low-carb diet, their cravings for sugars just plummet. If you take the fat out of their diet, they don't crave fat anymore. Um, and so it's after about the fifth day, the cravings go away. And I think patients need to hear that uh, with respect to food because it's very hopeful. They're, they think they're going to fail because the thing they want the most, their craving will go up and it doesn't. Thank you. More questions? Could I just ask uh, for the same two uh, it looked like your study included only men. Uh, and That's correct. And yet women uh, drink alcohol and they eat food also. Uh, and, really? And uh, uh, I'm particularly interested in anything you have to say about chocolate. <laughs> I had... I had a great mentor in my life, Sirka Kasim Karakas. She used to say, men don't understand chocolate. They think it's candy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, we, we included men. We anticipated there was going to be a big variance. And we, this was on a shoestring budget. And we, didn't, we thought we better, this is the first time we've provided the, the alcohol and the food together. And we wanted to see what would happen. So yeah, and women... Um, are sensitive to alcohol, but their triglycerides don't go up as high as men's do in terms of cardiovascular risk and lip, blood lipids, men are at, at greater risk. Just I'll follow that by saying that if you also noticed some of the studies on the bariatric surgery, those are almost exclusively on women. And so we've kind of got this disconnect, right, between the laboratory work on metabolism and so on, and then the real world consequences of people having these surgeries to uh, overcome or, or you know, at least limit their uh, risk for obesity. Uh, and so I think we do need a lot more research on these two topics together, and obviously with both men and women in our samples. Uh, and as Elizabeth said, this, and this is, she's far too gracious. This was her study. I was barely involved. but. Um, as Elizabeth said, this was, this was a, a pilot study, really kind of a you know, shoestring budget sort of a thing. But as we move forward with MoCare, uh, this is going to be an area of focus for us for sure. And we're going to be seeking larger funding to do more of these kind of studies and to do them more comprehensively. Can you comment about the thinking about um, I, I surprised a lot of people after bariatric surgery became such, so much more popular, and it makes diabetes go away, and people go off their hypertension meds and everything. Uh, it caught people uh, at, by surprise that all of the sudden uh, other behaviors came up, were uncovered. Can you, do you have any thoughts on why, why that might be? No. No. <laughs> no, I mean, were you surprised to see? I mean, a little bit, sure. Um, this is uh, sort of new territory for me and my lab. Uh, we've been studying uh, alcohol sensitivity and differences in sensitivity to alcohol's effects for many years. Um, but starting to look at it from a really uh, metabolic standpoint is, is new for us. And so whether we can make this leap and make it meaningful, I think, is, is still to be, to be determined. But else in the room comment on when someone has a, a, an addiction and they go into abstinence, do other addictive behaviors flare up as they do in the bariatric surgery patients? No. Well, there's, there's maybe 
there's yeah. transitions. I mean, <laughs> sounds like yes. I mean, you can't. I don't think you can. And infer for yeah, for everybody, I think uh, there's there's smart people who argue both sides. I'd say there's certainly other drug use pops up um, and co-use and this and that, but there are people who find themselves more successful by eliminating all substances at the same time. Alcoholics and candy, is that what you're saying? Yeah, sure. Okay, so once you stop drinking, if you've been a long-term chronic drinker, you might start eating more candy, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. I have a question, actually. So we're, um, for MoCare, and as some of you noticed, we're building this Translation Precision Medicine Center here that's supposed to be not just for MU, but for the whole system. Um, what are you thinking about in terms of integrating these large omic scale data sets? So I work on plants, and we have, you know, every graduate student experiment I have is a couple hundred thousand dollars because they have genomes, transcriptomes, metabolomes, proteomes, and um, so I'm curious how you're thinking about the next few steps and or several steps as MoCare gets developed or where you guys think things are going. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an exciting time actually to be involved in this kind of research because at least for human data, there are more and more publicly available data sets. And so, um, you know, there's there's this UK Biobank project that's 500,000 people in the United States. They, there's this All of Us project that um, is getting started. And, um, you know, these are data just like the ABCD study that, that Dr. Brown talked about. Um, you know, a main... Uh, tenant of these studies is that it will be, you know, you will have access and, and shared data. Um, and so there's opportunities to interface with computer science uh, departments um, and, you know, um, interface with animal researchers, between animal researchers and human researchers to combine these data sets to try and improve prediction, um, at least on the, you know, on the genetic uh, side of things. And the, and with other types of omics data. Um, and then I think, you know, a, a strength of this is that then that also helps facilitate investigations into environmental influences as well down the road. Is that? Other questions? Or does everybody want to run out and grab food and look at posters? We can eat? Yes. Maybe we need food. Is that what we need? Okay. Well, great. So we'll meet here at uh, 3.15. Is that right? And um, please look at the posters while you're enjoying your break. So let's thank all our speakers one more time. remarks and then overall question and answer. Uh, this final session uh, we, we transition into some more direct discussions of uh, intervention uh, both in terms of intervening and treating directly with uh, clients as well as uh, some discussion and presentations on training providers and effective ways to do so for many of the challenges that, that we've been discussing today. Uh, I, I should say, I'm Matthew Martins. I'm a uh, professor in the Department of Educational School and Counseling Psychology here at MU, and I'm also uh, in the provost office and work on her staff. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker uh, for this afternoon's session. This is uh, Dr. Lee Tenku Leper, Associate Research Professor of Social Work uh, at MU. And Dr. Leper is going to talk about her work in terms of healthcare provider training and fetal alcohol, alcohol spectrum disorders. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here at 3.15 in the afternoon after a very long day. Can you all hear me? Okay, very good. I'm gonna read a little bit of an excerpt here from one of my favorite books. This is the 1931 book by Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. The story begins in the hatchery, where the production of human beings takes place. 
No longer are babies created within the mother's womb and delivered when the baby decides to be born. In this story, surgically removed ovas are incubated in specialized containers, and there is a clear predestination for each human being produced. After fertilization, the embryos travel along a conveyor belt that mimics womb-like experiences, such as being shaken in order to get used to movement. The embryos are given different treatments depending upon whether they are predestined to be in the upper, middle, or lower classes. Oxygen deprivation and alcohol treatment, flooded with alcohol in a test tube, are part of the treatment for the three lower classes in the caste system. The bottom class is exposed to alcohol during the entire gestational period, thus ensuring that they will be small for developmental age and will be the least intelligent of all of the classes in the society. Aldous Huxley has defined and described fetal alcohol spectrum disorders in 1931, 40 years before it was identified and defined here in the US and in France. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Lee Tenku Leper, and my work is um, focused primarily on fetal alcohol spectrum disorders for the last uh, 17, 18 years. Uh, the last four years have been focused on prevention of having an alcohol exposed pregnancy, and so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Wrong one. Here we go. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to review screening and brief intervention, referral and treatment, and what we already know in the field. Uh, I'll discuss the scope of this problem, how much do people drink anyway, although you've heard some of that already today, the impact of alcohol use on women of childbearing age. I'll describe the development of our online alcohol SBI training module for healthcare professionals, and I'll present the final results of our three-year, four-year development and implementation study. So what is ESPERT? ESPERT stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, Referral to Treatment. It includes a brief questionnaire to identify unhealthy substance use, typically assessment with questions to determine the severity of unhealthy substance use. It includes a brief intervention, typically about five to 10 minutes, uh, which is a conversation to raise awareness of risks and build motivation to change. Uh, this is all based on the stages of change theory uh, that we're all probably very familiar with. And then finally, it's the referral to treatment uh, which is a referral to treatment program for uh, dependent uh, substance use. Been around for a while. Uh, who came out with a program in the 1980s, Managing Hazardous and Harmful Alcohol Use in Primary Care? Uh, then in, in the 1990s came the development of many screening tools, the audit, uh, the assist, and others some of you may be familiar with, and a very um, big growth in intervention, brief intervention research. In the 2000s, the uh, idea of ESPERT was introduced, and then that was followed uh, in the next decade with national demonstration programs in the US and in other countries. Don't need to spend a lot of time on this because you've already heard about this today, but it's based upon CBT and motivational interviewing or motivational enhancement therapy. And so that is a counseling approach that helps the individual to resolve their ambivalence about engaging in treatment and potentially stopping their substance use. So far, uh, ESPERT has been demonstrated uh, with great efficacy and effectiveness and uh, feasibility for alcohol and tobacco, possibly drugs, although there isn't uh, a whole lot of positive uh, results so far, and the mechanisms uh, for using ESPERT for uh, drugs remains unknown. The RT part is the kind of the neglected component of ESPERT. Systematic review came out in 2015, basically saying that while people may be referring physicians, providers may be referring people to treatment, nobody's following up. So um, that's under uh, some investigation now. And what we've learned is heavy drinkers respond as much to the anticipation of talk and, of course, pharmacotherapy as much as they do to specific elements of an intervention. Today, I'm going to talk about alcohol screening and brief intervention. It's a comprehensive, evidence-based approach for helping to facilitate the conversation between a patient or a provider regarding alcohol use. 
Uh, it's uh, done in order to promote practice change for universal screening and follow-up. Um, and we are trying to make it in a practical and accessible format. Uh, the one that we've created uh, is with an interactive practice, uh, allowing for all members of an interprofessional practice to build key skills. This is a really important part of this intervention uh, because people can read about it, they can go online and take a course, but unless they actually go through the process of hearing themselves say the words in a conversation, they are not going to get 100% uh, even an increased confidence level in having these conversations. I would be remiss in not mentioning a bit about fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, some of you may know the term FAS, fetal alcohol syndrome, which is the most severe condition on a spectrum of disorders. Uh, underneath here, we have fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, which includes partial FAS, alcohol-related <clears throat> neurodevelopmental disorders, alcohol-related birth disorders, and then a new term that came out in the DSM-5, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder with uh, prenatal alcohol exposure, all of which are showing a range of neurocognitive and neurobehavioral aspects on this spectrum. What causes fetal alcohol syndrome is fetal exposure to alcohol during the pregnancy. It is a teratogen, we're all familiar with this, capable of interfering with the development of the fetus, causing long-lasting uh, birth defects. IOM came out in 1996, stating that of all the substances of abuse, including cocaine, heroin, marijuana, alcohol produces by far the most serious neurobehavioral effects to the fetus. Current facts that we know about fetal alcohol syndrome are that it is estimated to occur in as many as 2 to 10 percent of school-age children. Uh, and it is a, the leading preventable cause of birth defects, developmental disabilities, and learning disabilities. Many in our field define this uh, disorder as a brain-based disability, and of course it is a long life, lifelong condition. Philip May came out uh, in early this year, 2018, February, with a JAMA article, uh, basically supporting evidence to show that it is um, prevalent in about 1 in 20 U.S. school children. And the effects are um, multifactorial. We have physical issues, uh, low birth weight and growth, problem with the hearts, kidneys, and organs, damage to parts of the brain, behavioral and intellectual disabilities, uh, learning disabilities can be as low as, uh, the IQ can be as low as 70 or more. It can also be higher than uh, 70. Many of them are quite uh, intelligent and do in impressive things. Hyperactivity, difficulty with attention, poor ability to communicate, tons of studies on social skills of those who have fetal alcohol syndrome, and poor reasoning and judgment skills. So. Um, great day to spend here with you all listening to people doing research, uh, particularly Dr. Brown's work on uh, the, de the developing brain of the adolescent and uh, listening and thinking about how that uh, impacts those uh, young people who have fetal alcohol syndrome. And you'll see that here in some slides. Um, and then, then if these things are not addressed, we talk about these impacting secondary disabilities such as school and social skills, uh, living independently, many of them never will, uh, cannot keep a job, have mental health issues, substance use issues, and trouble with the law. And of course, $5.5 billion in 2010 uh, is what it's costing to, uh, in terms of uh, drinking while pregnancy. So how much do women drink? And you've heard some of that today. Uh, one in 10 pregnant women report alcohol use. And this is fairly recent, 2011-2013 um, data. Uh, according to the CDC, about half of non-pregnant women report any alcohol use, and about one in five report binge drinking in the past 30 days. Among pregnant women, one in 10 are reporting any alcohol use, and one in 33 report binge drinking in the past 30 days. Among the population of pregnant women, studies so far are showing that the highest prevalence of any alcohol use is among those 35 to 44 years of age, college graduates, and not married. So risky alcohol use is common. More than 3 million women uh, in the U.S. are at risk of exposing a developing baby to alcohol. 
three in four women want to get pregnant as soon as possible, and they are reporting drinking alcohol. That's an important factor for us because most women don't find out they're pregnant till four, five, six, seven weeks. So um, if they are wanting to become pregnant, not only is our message for those who are pregnant to not drink during pregnancy, but don't drink when you're conceiving uh, or wanting to uh, have a child. That's a tough story uh, to sell all by itself. Uh, I always say, you know, when I was having kids in the 70s, um, I didn't drink. I was a Baptist. We didn't drink. Um, and, and so, you know, it was not a big deal for me to think about getting pregnant. I didn't have to change my behaviors, all right? Nowadays, my 30-something kids who, and their friends, who all are now starting to have children, they're all in their professional jobs. They have, um, you know, uh, friends over on the weekend. They go out every weekend. Drinking is part of their everyday, well, certainly weekend life. So if they're going to think about becoming pregnant, they have to think about what they're going to do in changing uh, their behavioral uh, uh, ways of life. Some of them don't like hearing that. Uh, and then finally, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, disorders are completely preventable. You've already heard about the alcohol use, and I'm just going to add one more piece of information. This is a pretty recent study done in JAMA 2017, that the alcohol use disorder rate, prevalency rate in the US has gone up considerably. In fact, by 49%, this is alcohol use disorder, has gone up by 49% in the first decade of the 2000s. So clearly, um, we are having, we we're becoming a society that drinks more and more. This is a simplistic uh, diagram of what it looks like in terms of the alcohol or the ethanol uh, being consumed, uh, and then crossing the placental uh, wall and enters into the fetal sac. Uh, and so the baby is not able to metabolize that alcohol. And so that alcohol may be sitting there for a while until the mom's body is able to metabolize uh, that alcohol out of the system. So this is an important fact for us to, to be aware of. What does alcohol do to the developing brain? So on the left here, you have an unaffected brain. And you can see these parts that we've identified, the corpus callosum, the cerebellum. The corpus callosum, for those of you who don't know, are, is the mechanism that helps you process information between the right and left sides of your brain. And for most of us sitting here today, because I don't know, maybe some of you may have been exposed to alcohol in the, uh, in the womb, but for most of us, we can sit here and we can listen to this talk and we can be thinking about what we're going to have for supper, we can think about what we're going to be doing over the weekend, we can be processing emails. We're doing multiple things at once. If you look on the right, what happens is the, the corpus callosum can be seriously affected by alcohol. And I'm going to show you an MRI here in a minute, uh, where these children, uh, young adults, do not have that ability to process information back and forth across our uh, hemispheres. So this is an MRI showing a child's brain uh, on the left unexposed to alcohol and a child's brain on the right uh, exposed to prenatal alcohol exposure. And you can see, again, on the left, a nicely formed brain with a nicely formed corpus callosum. And on the right, uh, the corpus callosum is actually missing. And so these are taken from Children's Research Triangle in Chicago. And what you can see here is that the brain on the right has fewer folds in the brain smaller head size, smoother surfaces of the brain, a flattened face, and an overall underdeveloped inner structure of the brain. I actually know the mother and the child, I don't know the child, but I know the mother of this uh, child who is now 34. Um, the young, she's uh, happy, she's a young woman, but she's not independent. She's living in a group home close to her mom and her stepfather. And her mother, who is the biological mother, now is telling her personal story on the impact of her drinking and drug use as a young woman, and then discovering that she became pregnant. And this is uh, her daughter. NOFAS, which is the National Organization of Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, came out with this fetal developmental chart to basically show the impact of alcohol on the developing fetus. The purple here is a period of development when major uh, defects occur in the bodily structure. Uh, with alcohol exposure, and then 
the, the pink ones are uh, other major functional defects and minor structural effects. So the bottom line is, all through the course of pregnancy, alcohol exposure can affect the development of the child. So uh, our work has really focused on alcohol, SBI, and the healthcare professional, um, helping them get to a place of being comfortable asking about alcohol use with their clients, either in a mental or behavioral health clinic or a regular medical clinic. Some of the people in our field would like to see alcohol use questions asked at every single visit uh, and make it part of the standard of care, and maybe one day that will happen. So why don't providers feel comfortable about asking their patients and clients about alcohol use? Well, tons of studies have been done with all different disciplines. And bottom line is, they say it takes too long to discuss alcohol use, substance use, they don't believe their patients will give true answers. They don't have resources to hand them off to a treatment facility. Some don't believe they have any patients who have alcohol or substance use problems. And most feel that they are not properly trained. Um, so we really uh, spent a lot of time thinking about this uh, issue and coming up with a online module that was engaging um, and that would help them get to the point of feeling confident about asking their patients and their clients about alcohol use. Just a quick note, a uh, JAMA article came out last month basically saying um, that it isn't going to be a recommendation that we screen all adults for unhealthy alcohol use. Not just alcohol dependency, unhealthy alcohol use. So there's, um, is this water for, okay, all right, very good. So lots of screening instruments. It's really important that we have screening instruments that are validated um, and that are more than, you don't drink alcohol, do you? OK? Because that's the kind of question that's been asked, all right? Or do you drink alcohol? Yes, no, and then moving on, all right? So there's been lots of tools out here. The cage has been around for a while. And it's okay for general population uh, men, but not sensitive for women or minorities. The T ACE uh, came out in 1989. I'll describe these in a minute. The T ACE combined with the NIAAA quantity and frequency questions provide um, a set of a good validated tool for use in both pregnant and non pregnant women. Uh oh, I've been given the three minute warning. So I'm not going to go through all of these. All right, but you can see what the questions are, tolerance, angry, cut down, eye opener, and so on. Here's the NIAAA. This is the audit by WHO, and this is the one that we're using in our particular uh, training. Somebody's already mentioned about drinks. If you're going to ask questions about alcohol use and you don't have a card that shows what one drink is, you're not going to get good um, information. I have gone out and, and gone to Crate and Barrel and, and found a 26 ounce glass of wine to demonstrate to people that when I got married, I had the five and a half ounce, five and a half ounce glasses of wine. That's not the case anymore. And I recognize people don't fill it up, but it's not five and a half ounces. So when you say a glass of wine, you really have to understand what they are using for a glass. All right, so I need to get over to our study. Um, so uh, it was to be interactive. We worked with uh, three, actually ended up with five uh, physician assistant programs here in the state and one in Tennessee. Our N ended up with 571. We have an online didactic training program, guided encounters with a simulated patient, and then in the grant funded years, a practice session uh, using video conferencing using Zoom. And these, this is the group of people that worked with us. This is uh, one of the screenshots for the uh, didactic portion. This is what the interactive guide part looks like. And then this is our Zoom encounter. And this is a guide that we created to have for, for the, um, uh, patient, uh, the providers and the mental health providers to use. So they've got this standard drink right here. All right, so here's a little short demo of the course. Welcome to the screening and brief intervention for alcohol use educational module. Before we get started, I just want to point out a few things. First, you can toggle the notes and menu tabs to Oh, 
Oh, you didn't see it, huh? Left. You can also pause and restart any interactions with the controls below. Finally, you also have access to several resources that you can open and print off in the resources section above. Okay, now that we have that settled, I need let's to begin hit the by arrow key. next. I have, to, I have to hit the arrow key to get it moved next. These are the commonly used categories that stratify alcohol and drug use. The largest number of people fall into the low-risk zone. We will look at how each category is defined. There are no low-risk limits for adolescent alcohol use. Even the first use of alcohol or another drug can result in tragic consequences with teens. I'm going to move us along. I'm getting the one minute. Three types of interventions, clinicians. Because I want you to see. Let's walk through a quick scenario. With we have a, a little scenario here. Max. As you can see with the information gathered through the alcohol pre-screen, Max showed a positive result. What we want to do in this scenario is pick the best way to talk to Max about his positive screen and the okay. steps he's willing to take because of that result. To get started, pick the best option from the two provided on how to kick off this conversation. So these are the options that come down for every part of this guided uh, uh, interactive brief encounter. And I have to move on. So this is the evaluation scores in the aggregate. Uh, increase in knowledge scores was statistically significant, increase in confidence scores, which is exactly what we wanted, hooray, and then um, not much interest, uh, change in attitude scores. When we've evaluated this and looking at uh, comparison between the physician assistants and the social workers, it's pretty clear that the physician assistants have already had some exposure to importance of uh, asking about alcohol use. So this is the more details, it was out on our poster. Bottom line is, um, we feel that this training has shown um, the ability to improve the um, adoption of a routine conversation about alcohol use in clinical practice. So we'll train some more physician assistant programs. We'll train some more professionals. Um, we have a promotional video on our website. Um, and this is my team. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. So next up, we have uh, Dr. Mary Beth Miller, who is a licensed clinical psychology, uh, <laughs> clinical psychology, it's getting late and there's been a lot of coffee, licensed clinical psychologist, uh, an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry in uh, the psychiatry department at MU, um, who will have a nice follow-up talk to one of our flash talks earlier today, where she's going to be discussing issues of insomnia and sleep uh, in terms of alcohol prevention and treatment. Yes. Okay. Can you all hear me? Okay. This might move around a little while I'm going. Um, yes. Yeah, so thank you guys for sticking around um, for the afternoon sessions. And as um, Dr. Martins was mentioning, I am going to, I don't know if Dr. Thacker is still here. I think maybe he wasn't able to stay. But um, my, my talk will be a really nice compliment to what he was talking about earlier, um, doing research on sleep and alcohol use in humans. So um, I'm not actually going to tell you. I, I was trying to um, target this, gear this for providers mostly, because I'm in the intervention and training uh, section. Um, so I'm not going to tell you really uh, so much how to intervene on sleep, though, more um, about that we should care about uh, sleep in alcohol prevention and alcohol treatment. Treatment. So I'm going to talk mostly today about insomnia instead of like sleep apnea, um, periodic living movement types of disorders, which are also highly prevalent in individuals with alcohol use disorder. I'm going to talk about insomnia and insomnia symptoms, though, because that is the most prevalent um, sleep disorder, both in the general population. You'll see about half of adults in the United States report clinically significant symptoms of insomnia, at least in some point of their lives. When you look at individuals who are heavy drinkers or who have alcohol use disorder, that jumps up to three out of four. Um, when you look at actual prevalence rates of the disorder, it's closer to 10% in the general population and 18% in 
alcohol use disorder. I'm not going to worry too much about the insomnia disorder, though, because a lot of the research I'm going to present today, they didn't have to have insomnia disorder where they've had this three times a week for three months. It's more just the symptoms and how um, subjectively distressing they are to the person. So, um, Also important to note, these uh, subjective complaints and sleep abnormalities as documented using polysomnography, they persist in individuals with alcohol use disorder long after those individuals have been sober, so up to three years through sobriety, um, into sobriety. So it's not just that they're drinking a lot and then having sleep problems and then continuing to have sleep problems. These sleep problems tend to persist. Um, in terms of public health costs, we've already talked about this. Alcohol costs the United States a bunch of money. Um, sleep disorders, we would estimate at about $100 billion on sleep disorders, but that's not really taking into account, um, well, so, so I don't really know, but this, I don't know that this is accounting for the disability of someone who has both of these disorders. We're running a trial right now where we're recruiting heavy drinking young adults who also have insomnia. And um, I can tell you, it is, so I made my, you know, you design your study and you um, have your inclusion and exclusion criteria, and I've had to adjust it multiple times. Lindsay is um, a research assistant, and she can attest. We've had to adjust our criteria a couple times just because it was too uh, stringent. Rates of, um, everyone has at least subclinical anxiety, depression. Rates of suicide in this population are incredibly high. Rates of psychosis are so much higher than I thought they would be. I didn't think I would even find people with psychosis, and I've had more than one. So um, I just think the disability in this population when you have both of these disorders might be higher than, than you might expect. So um, why do we care about sleep? Of course, I just mentioned it is highly comorbid with alcohol use disorders. It's also a symptom of multiple mental health disorders that are also prevalent in alcohol use disorders, so anxiety, depression. Um, and so it might be a transdiagnostic indicator of alcohol-related risk. It's, uh, this was a big one for me. It tends to be less stigmatized than other mental health problems. And so this came up clinically while I was working um, with young adults and in my work mostly with veterans, where they come in, they complain a lot about their sleep problems, and to them, their sleep problems is much more important than their substance use problem. And so if nothing else, it might be kind of a gateway to mental health treatment in this highly stigmatized substance use population. And then the last one that's really big, we can treat it. We actually have really effective treatments for insomnia. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is the first line of treatment for insomnia above pharmacotherapy. If you're giving a pharmacotherapy, then the American Academy of Sleep Medicine recommends you also offer them CBTI because it is the first line of treatment. Um, 70 to 80% of CBTI patients improve. In people with comorbid disorders, those improvements have been um, documented up to six months. In people who don't have as many comorbid disorders, effects have been documented up to two years especially coming from a substance use background where we give them everything we can and rates of relapse are so high and it's so hard, this is an amazing treatment, <laughs> right? It's like, that's really effective. Um, so it's really effective. Um, okay, so before, my, the goal of this talk is really to tell you more about the influence of sleep on alcohol use, but of course I have to acknowledge there is a bi-directional association between sleep and alcohol, as Dr. Thacker was mentioning earlier. Um, and so <laughs> this gets overly simplified, so I'm going kind of, to try not to talk too much about this. Um, so what you're looking at here is a histogram of typical sleep in a, an otherwise healthy adult. On the x-axis, we have hours of sleep throughout the night. On y-axis, this is relative wakefulness, where the top is more awake and the bottom is um, your deepest form of sleep. And so when you do, oh, this is just to point out those little bars are periods of normal wakefulness throughout the night. Healthy adult, you're gonna wake up three to four times a night, you just probably won't remember it because you fall back asleep so quickly. If you have kids, it's also total no, totally normal for them to wake up three to four times a night. Um, so what, we, what people will tell you, if you Google this, um, from acute alcohol administration studies in adults, they're gonna talk about three effects. A decrease in sleep onset latency, an increase in wakefulness, particularly in the second half of the night, and a suppression of REM sleep, so rapid eye movement sleep, that's your dreaming sleep in the first half of the night. A lot of people will also talk about REM sleep rebound, where 
um, your dreams are suppressed in the first half of the night, but then they increase in the second half of the night. Okay, it's not this simple. <laughs> and this isn't actually the case all the time. Um, actually, the single most consistent effect you see across all um, polysomnography studies is that uh, suppression of REM sleep in the first half of the night. That's like the one that is consistent across studies. Everything else, it just depends. And so these effects, most of them, are more evident at uh, moderate to high doses of alcohol. Sleep onset latency is one that's gotten a lot of press and everyone thinks that their glass of wine will help them fall asleep. We talked about this earlier. It really depends. If you have that glass of wine and you try to fall asleep while your BAC is still rising, if anything, it's probably gonna take you longer to fall asleep. Um, so there are just a lot of variables that affect this um, that you wanna be aware of. Um, and then, as Dr. Thacker mentioned earlier, tolerance to all of these effects develops really quickly, usually within three days, when you do repeated alcohol administration studies in humans and young adults, older adults. Um, this is from like a clinical perspective. The one thing you should be aware of when you're treating people with uh, alcohol use disorder is that one of the findings that has come up is that we think that for people who have below average levels of um, slow wave, that deep slow wave sleep at baseline. So that would be um, individuals with insomnia tend to have lower baseline levels of slow wave sleep. Individuals with alcohol use disorder, usually in your old, older adult population. For those particular populations, we do see an increase in slow wave sleep in the first half of the night as a result of alcohol use. And you don't always get a rebound effect. So they sleep better in the first half of the night. And then they might also sleep just as well in the second half of the night. So imagine how reinforcing that is for someone who's not used to sleeping well. The thing is, you still get the tolerance effect after three or so nights. And so when your patients come to you and they're complaining and they, they think that that alcohol is helping them fall asleep, even if it's not, or they sleep better, in this case it wouldn't necessarily be falling asleep, but help them sleep better, they're not lying to you. The problem is, it actually only helps them once, and then, and then it's problematic. And so that can be really reinforcing and it can be really hard kind of placebo effect after a while to, to deal with in your clinic. Um, okay, so switching gears though and looking at the influence of sleep on subsequent substance use, I'm gonna walk you through this, kind of through this spectrum of um, alcohol use disorder in particular. So starting with individuals who've never tried substances moving to individuals who are drinkers but may not meet criteria for alcohol use disorder yet, or at least maybe are not your relief drinkers yet, and then moving to people who actually seem to meet criteria or in treatment for alcohol use disorder. So among adolescents who are substance naive at baseline, um, we find that insomnia symptoms predict um, the onset, and this is, these are longitudinal studies, predict the subsequent onset of alcohol use, that's consistent, heavy drinking is consistent, um, cigarette use, marijuana use, and alcohol-related problems. And in these studies, these particular studies, controlled for age, sex, race, parental history of alcohol use disorder, and um, adolescent internalizing and externalizing behaviors. Um, there aren't that many studies that look at this prospectively in samples who are substance naive. So these are just, these are the three research groups, including my own, um, who have looked at this prospectively in individuals who are substance naive at baseline. The one we haven't controlled for in this studies that I would have really liked to is socioeconomic status. And so there are a couple other studies that looked at this association prospectively with adolescents um, who found that sleep increases the likelihood of acceleration in some of these, in most of these substance use, um, controlling for SES. But so it seems like a very robust finding, but just a limitation of the way these data were designed. Among those who already drink, we also find that insomnia symptoms um, exacerbate the association between known risk factors for alcohol use and alcohol-related problems in particular. So sleep seems to have a stronger effect on alcohol-related problems as opposed to actual drinking quantity, if that makes sense. Um, but for example, Drinking quantity is associated with more alcohol-related problems in the context of insomnia symptoms versus no insomnia symptoms. Um, same thing for psychiatric symptoms. We see that um, psychiatric symptoms like uh, depression and anxiety are associated with more alcohol-related problems 
among those who have insomnia symptoms versus no insomnia symptoms. Same thing for impulsive personality traits. Impulsivity is more strongly associated with alcohol-related problems among those with insomnia symptoms versus none. So it seems to be compounding risk, particularly for alcohol-related problems. Most of these are young adult samples or like up to the 35 age range. Um, we also find, I'm actually gonna breeze through this just because based on some of the questions that Dr. Thacker got, I wanna like address some of them. So I'm gonna skip this a little bit. But we also see that insomnia symptoms might help actually explain the association between psychiatric symptoms and alcohol-related problems. So if you have questions about this, you can find me later. Um, okay, and then in terms of those who actually have alcohol use disorder, um, it's hard to tease apart the temporal precedence of these things, especially in an adult population where they are currently using both. We talked about the limitations of retrospective recall earlier. You will, in the studies that have done this, individuals with alcohol use disorder, about half of them will tell you that their insomnia started before their alcohol use disorder, how easy that or reliable that is, how much they actually know about that um, is unclear. But among those with alcohol use disorder, insomnia symptoms do have been linked not only to relapse to drinking, but also to greater psychosocial problems um, like interpersonal conflict, employment issues, decreased quality of life. And then one of the big ones is suicidal ideation and insomnia across populations, across the age range has actually been found to be a very robust predictor of suicidal ideation in particular. Um, and so something just to keep in mind if you're being working with these individuals in your clinic. So altogether, these data suggest a robust association between sleep, sleep and alcohol-related problems kind of across the spectrum of alcohol use disorder from people who haven't started using to people who may be in treatment. Um, I'm not meaning to imply that sleep is the only predictor of alcohol use disorder, of course. It's probably not even the strongest predictor of alcohol use disorder, but it is one of the few for which we have really strong behavioral treatments. And that's important um, for a lot of reasons, one being that behavioral treatments are going to have few, if any, side effects. The only potential negative iatrogenic effect of CBTI is that you might feel a little sleepier than normal in the first couple of weeks of treatment. Usually goes away in a week or two, and you're already sleepy to begin with, so, you know, it's probably worth the risk. Um, and then the other one that we mentioned before, that insomnia tends to be less stigmatized than other mental health disorders, and especially I, I work a lot, I've worked a lot with veterans, that's a big deal. Um, if you can go into treatment, you're going to the mental health treatment, but I don't have to tell anyone that I'm working with that I'm going in for a substance use disorder, I can tell them I'm going in for sleep. That's a, that's a big barrier to treatment that we might not have to deal with. So in terms of implications for treatment, in my mind, this kind of goes to the question, I don't actually know who asked the question about have we looked to see if CBTI is effective um, in reducing alcohol risk. But that is the question that comes to mind, right? If insomnia symptoms increase risk for alcohol-related problems, then treatment of insomnia should decrease risk for alcohol-related problems. Um, and it implies we should be targeting insomnia and alcohol use prevention and treatment, which is exactly what I'm doing right now. <laughs> so um, I have three studies going on right now that I've been lucky enough to get uh, pilot funding for, looking to see if improvements in insomnia lead to improvements in alcohol-related outcomes. Um, this first one is an internally funded uh, grant through the University of Missouri Research Board where we're looking at this in heavy drinking young adults. This is the one we're doing right now. Um, I just last week got funding from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Foundation to do a little pilot trial, yeah, <laughs> um, with heavy drinking returning veterans. This is also what I proposed as my career development award to NIAAA. And then I, at some point in my life, I did receive the notice of grant award and no money yet, but <laughs> apparently I'm getting an R21 to do this, also looking in veterans who are in treatment for alcohol use disorder. And so for all of these studies, we're going to randomize individuals to either receive cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, the gold standard treatment of insomnia, versus a sleep hygiene only control. And then we're going to look um, pre, post, before treatment, after treatment, and then at one to three month follow-ups. And our goals here are looking at feasibility in this population, effects on alcohol use, and in particular alcohol related problems is where we're supposed to see, I expect to see the strongest effects. And then we're also looking at um, all of these uh, proximal outcomes that we think might mediate intervention effects on alcohol use. So we think that improving insomnia might decrease 
alcohol problems because your executive functioning improves, because your negative emotionality uh, decreases, craving decreases. Um, and for those in treatment, we think it'll improve their ability to um, encode and then retain what they're actually learning in treatment. Um, and then I also wanted to mention, so I want to acknowledge all of these people, and especially Lindsay's here somewhere. I don't actually know where she is. Um, but she's one of my research assistants and junior collaborators working on these studies with me. Um, but I also, since we talked, someone asked earlier about um, have this, has this been done? And so I just want to acknowledge that I am, I'm not the first person to look at this. Um, there have been three studies, three trials, previous trials, looking at the effects of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia on alcohol use in individuals with alcohol use disorder. And basically, none of them have found an effect. They're all, it's very effective in reducing insomnia. So CBTI is effective even among individuals with alcohol use disorder. They have not found significant effects on relapse, but one of the limitations, all three studies had a sample size of no more than 20 per group. Two of the three had 10 per group. One of them had 20 in each group. And then um, only like 8% of their sample relapsed by the time they did the follow-up. And the only outcome that they reported, I don't know if it's the only one they measured, was relapse. So they didn't collect data. No one reported anything on craving. Um, they didn't report anything on like drinking quantity for people who did relapse. And so I think part of what you might be seeing here is, a, well, I hope what we're seeing maybe is a floor effect where you just didn't have, you didn't have the sample size to get an effect on your alcohol use outcomes. So I guess we'll see. Um, and yeah, I guess we'll take questions at the end. Thank you, Mary Beth. And our final speaker, uh, before we move into the closing discussion, uh, is Pat Stylin, clinical social worker and program director for the Collaborative to Advance Health, Stud Health Services at the School of Nursing and Health Studies at UMKC. And she's going to be talking about ECHO clinics, which are wonderful uh, clinics that provide training and support to providers for uh, a variety of uh, medical issues. Um, and she'll be speaking about those relative to addictive behaviors treatment. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Okay, so um, I, first of all, I want to say I'm very honored to be here. I am not a scientist, and I know many of you in this room, you are um, from the provider community. Uh, I, too, was a provider of substance use disorders before I came to the ATTC 20 years ago. Uh, and I want to say that I've been to a lot of conferences, and this is a great value to have all of these great esteemed scientists here at, for such a low cost. I think it was free. Um, most of the time you pay three to six hundred dollars a day to be in these kind of scientific things. So um, I just want to say it, it's a great honor to be part of that company. So we are, um, we have uh, uh, the I'm here as an ATTC director, but we have a group of uh, PIs at the University of Missouri, Kansas City in the School of Nursing, and we have formed what we call the Collaborative to Advance Health Services. I want to make note that there are four current PIs in this group. Uh, Holly Hagel, who is here in the audience, uh, Lori Crom, uh, and Jackie Witt. Uh, a few months ago, we lost Heather Gotham, um, and Heather Gotham is an uh, alumni of MU. Uh, she was um, invited originally to this, and um, she elected to have me um, present some of her results from a, an evaluation that she conducted. So I don't know if you're all familiar with the Addiction Technology Transfer Centers. Um, I do want to note that the Addiction Technology Transfer Centers are in their 25th year. Uh, there is um, now, starting in 1998, there was a network coordinating center that uh, coordinates the efforts of all the regional ATTCs. That is at UMKC. Holly Hagel and Lori Crom are co-directors of that center. Uh, there are 10 U.S.-based regional centers who cover the states and ter U.S. territories. I am the regional director of the Mid-America ATTC. 
Uh, there is also a U.S.-based uh, National American Indian and Alaska Native ATTC, Hispanic uh, Latino ATTC, and actually the ATTC network has become more international. It has really um, become a favorite model of our um, assistant secretary at SAMHSA. The technology transfer centers have actually grown exponentially this year. There are now um, uh, comparative TT or technology transfer centers in prevention and in mental health. So in, your, in this particular region, your, um, there's a prevention technology transfer center was funded in October. They are ACT Missouri. They'll serve the region, region 7. Uh, and there is a mental health technology transfer center at the University of Nebraska um, Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. So those three, and our, I'm with the Addiction Technology Transfer Center, so the three entities will be doing a lot of the TA and training in this um, region. So I'm here to talk about two pilot, these are not studies, pilot evaluations of Project ECHO, adapting uh, a model that was developed in, uh, at the University of New Mexico. Uh, the, the purpose of Project ECHO is really to, they say, democratize, democratize uh, medical knowledge uh, and really um, um, make use of a hub and spoke model where the hub members are the experts or the seasoned clinicians and the spoke folks are more generalist or generalist practitioners uh, and learning from each other. So it's not just a one-way thing where the experts talk and do the consultation, it's a conversation. So we wanted to see um, how this uh, model might work with behavioral health folks in particular. Um, the National Coordinating Center, as I mentioned before, is at UMKC. Lori Crom and I both um, decided that we wanted to uh, we like more kind of early adopters, we call ourselves, we like to kind of stick our neck out, and we wanted to see how this might work with behavioral health folks. And then we also learned that MU has a super hub uh, for Project ECHO, and we did a lot of training, a lot of consultation with MU around setting the, uh, establishing these. So the first um, Project ECHO I want to talk about, I was not personally involved in, but it was um, really coordinated by the national office. Uh, it was really um, looking at um, providing Project ECHO to clinical supervisors across the country. So this was a national Project ECHO. Um, here are, there was an email blast. The ATTC listserv is pretty robust. We have lots of people we can send uh, emails to very quickly. Uh, and you can see here that our stamp, this is not a study, this is uh, only uh, 20 folks completed the follow-up survey and went through the whole process. There were 12 sessions of the Clinical Supervision Project ECHO. I believe that there were three hub team members uh, and people were um, uh, not, they did not receive training specific to clinical supervision prior to in, um, uh, entering into this uh, Project ECHO. Here's just an example of what some of the topics were. And the baseline and post-intervention surveys. I want to say it's important to know, too, that one of the reasons clinical supervision was chosen is because um, the ATTC's uh, mission is really to promote evidence-based practice, and we see clinical supervisors being essential in helping counselors um, be prepared to uh, deliver evidence-based practices, maintain fidelity to those practices, and in the literature we find that people who are, feel supported in their job uh, and have clinical supervisors who can give them um, adequate feedback remain in the field longer. We know that we have a workforce shortage and a number of people are uh, kind of in my age range um, retiring these days. So we have a, a huge workforce challenge to uh, keep people connected to their programs. The results were primarily, you can see the, uh, it was uh, uh, Caucasian women age 53 were the um, folks that were participated. 80% had a master's degree and 70% uh, were licensed as substance use counselors. Um, uh, all of the people that participated um, pro uh, provided clinical supervision. I want to say that the majority of the folks doing the clinical supervision were either in L.A., um, in, uh, let's see, in, uh, on the East Coast, 
and some were kind of in the middle, but there was there was certainly clusters of folks that were participating in this. Um, so the um, uh, what they looked at in this survey is how do you provide, what are your methods of uh, supervision? And 100% said they review charts and progress notes. Some also mentioned doing, or 75% use role playing, uh, and 70% do live observation. So they did, um, looked at, um, really they were trying, one of the things we look at with, um, Clinical supervision is we do a lot of training and we hope people get it. But with Project ECHO, we were also looking at um, this is sustained help in case consultation of difficult maybe clinical supervision cases. So um, here's some of the results from that uh, group. Um, the thing that was most popular is that uh, participants felt like they applied what they learned uh, at work in real life. Uh, and the one thing they said they um, didn't appreciate about Project ECHO is there wasn't enough time. So these were 60-minute sessions conducted twice a month, the same time of day, uh, 12 sessions. So the, um, uh, the uh, conclusions with this is they um, are well-liked by participants. Uh, it, can, it, it did enhance clinical supervision self-efficacy. Uh, and obviously there was a fairly, one of the limitations of this um, evaluation was there was fairly low response rate of follow-up. And folks involved in that, and that was a published study. So the next one I want to talk about is one that I was um, um, involved in with uh, Heather Gotham uh, and Sarah Nafamalong, the Anella Hulsa, um, uh, also is, was part of this project. Um, for a period of two years, the Mid-America ATTC received a supplement from um, SAMHSA to be the Center of Excellence for Pregnant Postpartum Women and Their Families. Uh, and we um, embarked on um, uh, really initially looking at developing curriculum. And in the second year, uh, I realized that just developing curriculum uh, has really short life, I believe curriculum has a short lifespan shelf. It can look really good, but people never pick it up. And I said, um, I'd really like to see um, something more um, action-oriented and working with the uh, provider. So what we decided to do is, because uh, Lori, um, the national office, and I were both looking for um, particular audiences for Project ECHO, um, I wanted to look at ways to really connect specialty care providers, which are women and children's programs, to each other. Because they are so isolated from each other, they often don't have opportunities to really share and learn from each other um, uh, and the like. And I also wanted um, to give them an opportunity to um, make use of the um, subject matter experts that we had recruited as part of the subject, or as part of our um, uh, Center of Excellence. So we um, started this project in February of 17 and completed it in August. You can see what some of the um, uh, topics were. Uh, the folks that were recruited for this were current grantees of SAMHSA's Pregnant Postpartum Women Grants. They were, range from across the country. Um, so it was a national project echo. Uh, we did this over a period of about uh, six months in uh, one-hour sessions twice a month. Uh, there were 16 subject matter experts. Lee, Lee was uh, one of our subject matter experts. And 58 um, PPW or pregnant postpartum women providers uh, across the country at least participated one time. So here is our hub team, and if, if any of you are familiar with um, women and children's treatment, this is a very um, astute group. It's not just researchers, but it's also um, what uh, we identified as exemplary providers. Uh, there are also educators in here, uh, and really we um, recruited our hub team first to, to Project ECHO because many of them had never they have never been participated in a Project ECHO, so we had to spend a considerable time just doing some orientation. We brought them to Kansas City, and they had some training and preparation in this process. So 
So our hub team consisted of these experts, and we divided them three to four people, or three to four experts per session. Uh, and we asked them to do a 12-minute didactic presentation on some topic uh, that you saw through the list. Um, and then we would um, recruit some of the uh, PPW providers across the country to submit a case presentation. And then there were uh, uh, questions, consultations, and recommendations made um, during those Project ECHO sessions. So uh, Heather, um, uh, unfortunately, was not able to publish on this because she is now the director of the National Coordinating Center for uh, Mental Health ETC at Stanford University. So this is just uh, this has not been published, but um, uh, we basically at least completed the report. Um, all this, uh, and we had we did uh, in evaluating this, we did both qualitative and quantitative um, methods in using a, a focus group. So here was our response: um, 18 spokes uh, completed the survey. Um, again, many of them were female, identifying as white, and at least half of being having a master's degree. And you can see that they really endorsed that they liked it, appreciated it, and learned something that they could um, apply in their work. And they felt more connected to their peers. <coughs> uh, one of some of the things they said they um, I uh, learned about was family-centered care model, and that was one of the. Uh, pr uh, primary things that we wanted to get across in this um, Project ECHO is really the idea of focusing more on engaging the extended family and fathers in particular into the treatment um, milieu for um, uh, treating women and children. And so we, we have a whole curriculum around how to engage fathers in treatment. And so we were using a lot of that material through this. Most of the people that participated in this was a first time for them to be in Project ECHO. Um, we um, have a website that continues today that um, is, includes a compendium of all of those 12-minute um, uh, didactic presentations. Uh, and one of the things we really were pleased about is that people seem to feel more connected to their peers and more of a sense of hope when talking about these very complex cases and getting really excellent feedback, not just from the hub team members, but also from their peers. <clears throat> the biggest challenge, schedule, you never make anybody happy when you schedule these. Um, we scheduled them at lunch hour during Eastern time and kind of went from there. So that, that's always a challenge when you're doing a national project echo. Um, I also want to say the hub team members really surprised us that they really endorsed Project ECHO after participating in this because it was their first time after they did this. Um, they felt more connected to the field. They had more sense of what was going on in the field. Um, and a couple of them said, uh, this is a great way for me to kind of recruit <laughs> some sites by um, uh, participating in this kind of activity. So I know that a few of our hub team members went on to develop their own uh, Project ECHO clinics in their own work. So the implications of all of this is that it's, we do believe that Project ECHO is a very effective platform or technology to use. We use Zoom technology, I bet you, three to four times a day now. Uh, it has really cut back on our um, travel. But more importantly, we're able to reach people in rural areas that we never reached before. The, the beauty of Project ECHO is you can get to people, no matter where they are, at their desk in the middle of their day. Um, and by the way, we do not charge um, any kind of fees or, or registration fees to participate in this. Um, so scheduling clinics should be carefully considered. Um, just want to note that this was um, funded by SAMHSA's um, Center of Excellence on Behavioral Health for Pregnant for Postpartum Women. Uh, and um, we welcome any questions from that. Right now, we are engaged in a Project ECHO for clinical supervision, but we preceded that um, by a 30-hour training. And now we're supporting that training through doing Project ECHO with the hope that um, those skills can be readily applied in a real-world kind of um, scenario. So we're about halfway through that now. So thank you.
right, thank you, Pat. So let's go ahead and have our three speakers uh, come down up onto the stage. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for question and answer uh, for this session. Um, so if you do have a question, you can uh, put your hand up and we have folks who will be bringing uh, microphones around uh, for you to, to be able to use to ask the question. I always feel like I'm asking questions here. Um, but uh, the, so to Pat, uh, on your presentation, it sounded, it sounded like you have good measures of uh, the supervisor's uh, personal responses to the training and the value for them personally. Um, is there any way to have uh, measures of an impact on uh, changes in the delivery of the services? We have, we have not. Thank you. We have not, um, this is not, was not a study per se, this was an evaluation. Um, and we hope that happens, that it's actually impacting what they do on the ground. All we have right now are people self-report that they feel like it's making a difference. Um, there's always a challenge getting people to attend consistently. Um, I think the people that wind up, or, or from my um, just subject, my um, observation is people who really present a case always tell, come back and report two weeks later about what happened. And um, I think it's important to ask them, follow up, what happened? What did you do with the feedback? Was it helpful? And over and over again, you hear, it was really helpful. It really made a change, um, that sort of thing. So I think this would be a great area of study. I don't know that it's been studied considerably, but um, I think uh, it's a great um, venue to get to p reach um, providers across um, any uh, region or um, rural area. So, Hi, Hi this is a question for Lee. So um, I don't know, I'm not involved in SBIRD very much, but whenever I hear people talk about screening, they always talk about primary care first. I wondered if you could talk a little bit, is there different screening training or methods across different medical specialties? And are there some medical specialties we can get better screening for? You know, I think about when I talk to my dentist about, you know, when you say you do alcohol and drug research, every person you go to wants to talk about that. And what my dentist always says is, I can always tell who uses cannabis, right? Because once she starts scraping things off their teeth, you, she gets a puff of cannabis in her face even if they haven't smoked for a few days, she's scraping the you know, cannabis residue. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry if that freaks anybody out. <laughs> <Interesting point. laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I just, I just think there's a lot of differences across medical specialties in terms of how alcohol and drug use affect the part of the body that they're dealing with. And you know they have different motivations. So an OBGYN might have different motivations for doing screening from a general practitioner. So one of the things that we did uh, in the um, Zoom face-to-face -face conferences uh, com conferencing is we created scenarios uh, for that particular discipline. So for example, uh, with the OBG, well, it wasn't with the OBGYN necessarily, but it was with. Um, just a regular general practice, maybe family medicine, the person came in with an injury, they fell. So how are you going to move them from this conversation about falling to, gee, did the fall occur because you were drinking? So we created individual scenarios for different disciplines to help them facilitate that transition from what they came in for to alcohol use. But to your point about screening, the field is really trying to come up with a standardized screening instrument um, because we've got so much out there now in, in terms of literature of how um, these screening instruments have been used and how effective they are, but there's a bunch of them out there. 
So there is a big movement to move towards the audit. Mm, yeah. A quick question for Mary Beth. Um, in your sleep studies, how do you assess how much sleep people are getting and the quality? I, I'm assuming that you don't put people in sleep labs, uh, and just anecdotally, that's the worst night of sleep I've ever had in my <laughs> life, is in a sleep lab. But how do you, is it all subjective, or do you have like devices on people where you can get a better sense of what, how much they're sleeping and the sweet sleep quality? So we're using actigraphy as the objective measure of sleep assessment, which is validated with polysomnography. We will use polysomnography if they screen positive for sleep apnea, but for us, it's, it's so expensive, and young adults, in particular, like to do an ambulatory polysomnography, you have to like come in, and we like tape it all up, and it's all yucky and in your hair, and then people come in and think they were going out for the night, and no, you're not going out for the night. Um, and so uh, we're trying to avoid the use of the polysomnography unless we absolutely have to. So we're using actigraphy and then the daily, daily surveys, which are self-report. I have uh, uh, two questions for Dr. Ray and one question for Dr. Miller. And uh, uh, for Dr. Uh, Dr. Ray, the, do you, is there any uh, Animal imaging study for the pregnant uh, uh, for the pregnant to women uh, to relate the alcoholism. I'm sorry. I don't uh, the, like uh, animal uh, uh, animal, uh, oh, animal model. I'm I'm sorry. I didn't understand. Uh, uh, I mean the uh, is there any uh, animal model imaging study to uh, models? Yes. Studies yes. around for the. Uh, fetal alcohol. Fetal alcohol. Yes. Oh, yeah. There's tons of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's been in the field for, uh, I, I couldn't even begin to describe how many uh, studies are done. Rats, mo uh, rat model, mice model. Uh, uh, there's a lot of research. Yeah. Okay, well, second question is, uh, uh, it, uh, is there any attempt to treat that kind of uh, uh, Ba uh, baby who ha had who had uh, under uh, who did not develop the brain uh, because of the, uh, uh -huh. yeah gym. there's there's some um, there's some work being done uh, by Anna Klintova out at Dartmouth um, she's looking at dendrite um, neuronal uh, dendrite uh, trying to bring them back she's got an animal study where she's exposing I think it's rats to um, a very stimulating environment. The cage is filled with toys and all kinds of interesting things to try and um, bring, uh, return some of the, the damage to the dendrites and the neurons. Um, so there is some of that. There's all kinds of other things that are trying to be done as far as the damage to the child is what you're referring to. But the bottom line is, is that the alcohol kills off the brain cells and you can't bring them back. Dr. Miller, uh, 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 my question is, uh, uh, have you ever relate uh, uh, insomnia and uh, uh, alcohol, uh, alcoholic, uh, ever relate with uh, alcoholism with, uh, with uh, uh, melatonin receptor to, co uh, to study the insomnia? Have we looked at melatonin in the association between alcohol and sleep? Is that what you're asking? Um, that is not my primary area, um, but yes, we know that melatonin is involved. Um, did you have a specific like, question about it? So as a treatment, melatonin as a treatment, or like melatonin, delayed melatonin onset as, a, as an indicator of sleep problems? As a biomarker. Um, so we do know that there is an association. That's actually one of the things um, that will impact the association between alcohol use and whether or not it delays or um, shortens the sleep onset latency is where you are in your circadian phase, and which they look at using um, melatonin onset. So I don't know a whole lot about that other than, yes, they use it, and yes, it's important. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 
we have time for one more question. Okay, if not, let's give a final round of applause to our speakers. And now for our closing remarks, I'd like to um, <clears throat> introduce our Vice Chancellor for Extension and Engagement, Marshall Stewart. Marshall's also the Chief Engagement Officer for the University of Missouri System. I believe the first person to uh, hold that title. Uh, Dr. Stewart's been here for what, about a year and a half? Two and a half, time really, really flies. Um, and has done some amazing work in terms of really um, engaging, no pun intended, and transforming our efforts across the state. So we're thrilled to have him here to deliver a few closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And Matt's actually been with me a little bit. He went with me to one night to an event. And uh, so and if any of you ever want to get in the white pickup truck and go, let's go. We can go somewhere in Missouri. I have been uh, in places that Missourians don't know exist. And so uh, this is a very big state. It's a diverse state. And it has been my honor for two and a half years to travel the state and to really see wonderful things across the state. And good to see some Extension colleagues here today, too. Uh, but uh, let me say, uh, first of all, thank you for what you've done today. I know the crowd is obviously thinned some, and uh, that's the beauty of being the last here, is I, I get to kind of wrap this thing up, and uh, I think earlier you heard from the provost and from Mark McIntosh, great colleagues that I have, and people that are really interested in this work, and I think what you're seeing here is a commitment to this kind of work of interdisciplinary, bringing this, together the best minds on this campus and across the system to work on what we think are sort of grand challenges or great challenges for the state of Missouri and beyond. You know, if it, the, the thing is, I, I believe that there are many challenges in Missouri that if we get it right here, it's going to have national and international implications. So I think, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's all. Uh, but obviously, as an institution we, and, and as a system, we want to really think about what matters here because we think about our taxpayers and our stakeholders here and they want to see value, but obviously that value will have ripple effect around the globe. And so it was exciting to me to, to learn about all the things I've learned about here. Um, in fact, right now in my work, I'm doing something I did about 14 months ago. I went around and met with all the deans and spent time in each college. I'm doing that again right now. I've learned that you do that about every 14, 15 months. They've got new stuff to tell you, and there's lots built up. And we've got a few new deans who didn't get on the last round, so they're really excited that I'm coming around. And I tell them it's the time for them to brag and tell me all the stuff going on because as I travel the state, I get to talk about the wonderful richness of the colleges. And I'm getting ready to soon do that on the other campuses of the system as well. So uh, I talk about overload of knowledge. It, it's, it's amazing what goes on that we do across the state and in communities that people don't even know about. And that's one of the things I've learned about the addiction area is we've got some wonderful faculty here and at our, our sister campuses that are working really hard on some of these things, and they're doing stuff in community oftentimes, but we're not telling that story. We're not creating a narrative around that to show the impact. So it's important that we bring people together like this so you know what each other's doing. You know about ECHO and, and those kind of things that are going on, which is wonderful, by the way, because I had the opportunity to see some of that. I've actually, I've actually sat in on ECHO uh, a couple times. So there's been a wonderful opportunities to learn about that. And when you learn about it, and then you can begin to have opportunities for faculty to get together, then they figure out new and different ways to deliver. And one of the things I'm excited about is obviously part of my role is really focused in the work of extension. And I think most people have historically thought of extension as a funding line, that if you were extension funded, you did certain things. And if you weren't extension funded, well, you're not extension. You're something else, but you're not really extension. But I would say in some ways we all do extension work. Extension is truly extending the university. Now, we call that engagement, we call that outreach, we call that all public service in some institutions, but it's really about trying to figure out how you take knowledge out to those six million people in the state of Missouri and beyond who will never get a chance to come on this campus and really don't need to. It's not, not part of their journey. And so th that's what we're about, is how do you figure that out? So this addiction area is really becoming more and more important. Obviously, it's been important for many years because of alcohol addiction and other uh, th types of things that could certainly have addictive uh, uh, behavioral uh, influence on it. But today we think about opioids, we think about that because of all the national and international, quite frankly, in, uh, emphasis it gets. But it's again a trying to figure out how do we bring together intellectual greatness 
of, of faculty and uh, graduate students and all the others we have to really make a difference in the state and beyond. So this is exciting to me. Uh, I think you might find it interesting for some of you that haven't been around me at, at all. Um, when I came in, we did a really deep dive of what are the needs of the state. And some folks refer to that as a needs assessment. And um, we spent time looking at a lot of data. I had a team of folks that went through deep data dives and we found all kinds of interesting things about Missouri, um, and good and bad. Some things really good and some things not so proud of. We also did qualitatively uh, a, a series of conversations around the state, dug deep into communities, and, and really got a, a, a sense of what people were feeling in their communities. Because sometimes data says one thing, and people feel something different. And so you want to bring that together and figure out where those gaps are. We also did a third party review, had people come in and look at us and say, what could you be doing if you put all these, all these things together? And that was really helpful. And so all of that has really put us on point to focus on three big, what I, what I would call, you know, sort of grand ideas that we want to really focus on. And we think about these in terms of what the institutions can do. One is we think we can really do more things in the economy because obviously economic development comes from education, it comes from research driven heavily by that. We also think there's a secondary workforce development and education that we can really make a dent in. And there's an opportunity here to really up the game there. And there's a lot of opportunity in Missouri and around that area. And then the last one though, and not to be last, but the third area, not really last, but third area is this whole area of health. And certainly addictive behaviors, et cetera, fall in that bucket. And there's a lot of things in that. It's everything from helping people with obesity and chronic illness all the way across the spectrum treatment on the treatment side, all the way back to helping them in education on the front end side. How do you keep people from getting into those situations? So there's a lot we can do there. And those have become sort of the mantra. If you listen to Alex Cartwright talk, you'll hear him interject words like education. You'll hear him interject words like trying to d deal with the economy. You'll hear him talk about health. If you listen to our president of the system, Moon Choi, and our chancellors on the various campuses, you'll hear them interject those words. And that really comes out of that process we went through to really lift that up and say, this is what we're about. Interestingly enough, this morning, uh, my assistant was telling me yesterday, she said, you've got a call coming in in the morning. You need to know about this. And I said, what is it? Because I get a lot of calls, and normally I get maybe three minutes of warning who's calling in. She says, you need to pay attention to this one. And I said, well, who is it? And she said, it's the governor's office. And I said, oh, I do need to pay attention to that one. That would be a good one to listen to. What's interesting is a person on his staff has become very aware of what we're doing and trying to figure out how to extend the university out in all these different ways. And the interesting thing about the call was, we want to know, and this is a quote, what can we do to help you? That's a very good call. Folks, those calls don't happen. Usually it's us calling and saying, here's what I need you to do to help me. When that call comes back, now it may not ever go anywhere, but the point is, they called us. And what that says is that we have begun to change the narrative a little bit about how we're here to help how we can be helpful to folks, how we can figure out to, to partner with folks. We can't solve every issue. We can't solve every problem. But we definitely can make a difference in some areas. And that's what we're trying to do is gather those things together where we can really move the needle for Missourians and beyond. And let's do that. So I give you that as sort of an evidence even today of something that happens in my life pretty regularly. Uh, people calling wanting to know how they can help and what can we do. And that's a different tone than say was here Two or three years ago, I think you would agree. So we've come a long way. He's got a long ways to go, but it's, it's a good thing. And it's, again, because I think we have changed that narrative across the state and efforts like uh, working in addictive behavior and putting together a center and really trying to ramp this up is, is, are the kinds of things that really, I think, resonate well with our stakeholders and our citizenry across the state that are so interested in that. So uh, I, I want to back, back up again and just say thank you for what you've done today. Uh, I don't want to belabor this. I certainly will take questions if you have any, uh, but I think you probably are exhausted uh, having heard from lots of different presenters, and I know how that can be. Uh, I did not bring a PowerPoint, so I knew better than that. That's not going to happen. Uh, but, uh, but if there are any questions, I'll be glad to take those about what we're doing, and you know, our support of this is obvious. Uh, this is the kind of work we get really excited about because we think we can tie this directly to our faculty and our, our, our teams that are in counties. If you don't know much about Extension, we do have employees across the state, 232 faculty positions, master's degrees and above. 
Uh, in our new model, we will have a county engagement specialist in every single county, and that'll be pretty much effective January 1, 2019. We're hiring in a big hiring spree right now, doing a lot of hiring. Uh, those faculty in those communities at that county level will be engagement specialists, and over time, we're going to help them really understand what the universities can bring out broadly. And then they'll also specialize in those three grand challenges. A third of that faculty in, in the counties will be focused on the economy. A third of them will be focused on education. A focus, third focused on health, a sort, a sort uh, this type of work you're talking about here. So we think there's some real opportunities now that we are restructuring to bring the community of, of academia, of looking at researchers and everybody together so that we're truly driving in a similar direction, trying to solve those kind of issues for people in their everyday lives. So, I'm going to stop there and see if you have any questions or anything that you want to shoot back at me today. I have just exhausted you. It's obvious. So um, I, will, I will close by um, saying something that I've said many times. I know why I get to speak a lot of places. Uh, a couple of reasons. One is people are really more interested in how I talk than what I say because I'm not from around here, and y'all got the strangest accent I've ever heard. So it's, it's not me, it's y'all. Uh, another thing, though, I've learned in my, in my journey is that uh, you get to speak at these things for a couple of primary reasons. One is you're mildly entertaining, which doesn't hurt, especially late in the day. And then the second thing is you're free. So if you're free, you get invited a lot, and I'm free. So uh, everybody wants, uh, wants a free speaker. But um, again, I'm glad to be here, uh, glad to work with you. As faculty and uh, regardless of role and where you sit in, in the institution or the institutions, if you see things that, that we need to know about that you're doing, we want to know that. Um, we have the opportunity to talk to lots of groups across the state and as I'm doing with these deans right now. They're giving me all their bragging points and that gives me fodder to use because so many people don't know what we do in, in higher education and I think we at, in the University of Missouri system and Mizzou and all the constituent campuses have a chance to change that narrative. And if we change that narrative, good things will happen, not just, not just for us. It's not really self-serving, but it's about the people we serve in a public higher education institution. And that's exciting to me. So I'll stop there and give it back to our moderator, Matt. Uh, thank you for having me today. It's been a pleasure. All right, so initially we were going to wrap up by having uh, the speakers come down and kind of Face the, face the stage for a, a final round of questioning. But I think what we can do, the, the, the herd is thinned a little bit, and that includes some of our speakers, um, which is expected at the end of the day. So we can take, though, any final questions that uh, folks have um, for any of the speakers, and we can just, uh, we can just pass the, the mic around. So if there's any final questions, final comments, um, final thoughts, uh, we are happy to uh, to take them now. And if not, we can proceed to the reception, which I probably should not have said <laughs> if we're trying to get questions and comments. And then I'm realizing I'm saying this out loud as we speak, so I'm going to stop now. Understand more, understand the connection between insomnia and and addiction. Mary Beth, explain your line of research. Go. I don't know, is there like any part of it in particular that is? Like how much of the causation has been elucidated? Well, so that's part of what is hard to tease apart, really, um, because they're so comorbid, it's really hard to do this with confidence and say that it's causing one thing or the other, but that's part of why in the trial that we're doing, um, it's going to be a randomized controlled design so that we can say more about potential causation as opposed to just correlations between the things. So we're going to, you know, treat the insomnia, change it. And that's why I'm using CBTI as opposed to any other treatment. They actually, I, I didn't mention, they have done in young adults where they treat sleep and then create a control condition, but they don't use an effective evidence-based sleep treatment. And so then you don't know if it didn't work because their treatment wasn't better or, you know, and so that's why I, I chose the, you know, the first line treatment of insomnia and we're going to compare it to a relatively weak comparator to give us the best possible um, 
chance to see a significant improvement, and then we'll we'll be able to say with a little more confidence if it's potentially, you know, more of a causal association or just an association. So. So I, it's really hard. So that's why I presented the data on individuals, on adolescents who were substance naive at baseline. We know that that association can't be, like that has to be sleep because sleep came first, right? They weren't using yet. Um, but other than that, like in individuals who've already started both, you can't, it's really hard to tease it apart, especially since part of the reason we think those two are associated would be due to executive cognitive function. And it's not like, you binged once and, I mean, we just heard about how that has long-term effects. So even if they have not been drinking in the past 30 days, like, who knows what earlier drinking did to their cognitive function, so. Any other questions, comments? So I, I have a question, if that's okay, Matt. So I would just like to ask any of the um, treatment providers in the room that are left with us, and thank you for spending the day with us, um, if you have any thoughts on uh, what a center centered at the University of Missouri um, on addictions would mean for you in your daily work, and if no one wants to speak up, I would love to hear that from Mimu, or if Dennis maybe uh, could say a few words about what we envision that would look like and see if that would meet a need that is out there in the communities that, things that we've been talking about over the last six months. Yeah, thanks, Jill. So that, that's a good point. If there are treatment providers here, we're talking about a lot of different things that a center on this campus and through the system can do. We'd also like to hear what people want it to do. Um, we're talking about starting new programs to train people in different disciplines, whether it's nursing or social work, for specific expertise in different types of substance use treatment, or do we need more frontline addiction counselors or things like that? I'd like to hear from people that are in the field today about what they see. We don't want to train people for needs that we think are there that aren't there, so we'd like to hear from them. Thank you. From what I've heard, I'm not, I was saying I'm not a treatment provider, but I work with many, um, we have a real workforce shortage, especially licensed clinicians um, and that our community-based SUD treatment programs. They have job postings open for months and months and they just can't find people to fill them. So we have a huge need uh, and we're asking clinics to do a lot, but uh, they can't hire the people they need to do the job. Right. Any other final comments? If not, um, in, you know, in closing, I, I guess I'd just like to say, well, first of all, I'd like to um, thank our sponsors again, thank all of our speakers. Thanks to Jill and her team for, uh, for organizing this, this wonderful event. Um, I hope that um, you all, trying to ch channel my inner marshal here, um, had a um, had a good experience today. It was really inspiring for me um, to hear about uh, all the great work that's going on. <clears throat> Certainly knew about uh, some of this that's going on on our campus, but to hear about how it's um, also going on with the other universities in the system, and it's it's really exciting to think about uh, this MoCare uh, Center, which you know has has been a concept for for a while. And you know, feel like it's been kind of moving, moving down the tracks, and now we're just going to start to move it into, you know, into a, a reality. Um, and and I think as as Marshall um, said, for this to be successful, you know, it's it's going to have to be something that um, that really has a strong impact throughout the state and really kind of meets uh, meets the needs of uh, Missourians in addition to being uh, a world class research center. And so that's going to be the goal, and that's going to be uh, what we are going to be. Uh, Striving for both on both on this campus um, and throughout the other universities in the system. So again, want to thank everybody for um, for being here, even though it costs a zero. Um, time is valuable, and for you to spend uh, spend your day with us has has been wonderful. Uh, we have a reception 
out in the lobby so we can continue conversation uh, out there and have a nice refreshment after a long day. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the reception.